Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. Audiobook presented by the Learner's Library. Contents. Preface. Why Egyptians filled Tahrir Square to bring down Hosni Mubarak and what it means for our understanding of the causes of prosperity and poverty. Chapter 1. So close and yet so different. Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, have the same people, culture, and geography. Why is one rich and one poor? Chapter 2. Theories that don't work. Poor countries are poor not because of their geographies or cultures, or because their leaders do not know which policies will enrich their citizens. Chapter 3. The Making of Prosperity and Poverty. How prosperity and poverty are determined by the incentives created by institutions, and how politics determines what institutions a nation has. Chapter 4. Small Differences and Critical Junctures, The Weight of History How Institutions Change Through Political Conflict and How the Past Shapes the Present Chapter 5 I've Seen the Future, and It Works Growth Under Extractive Institutions What Stalin, King Shyam, the Neolithic Revolution and the Maya city-states all had in common and how this explains why China's current economic growth cannot last. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson Preface Why Egyptians filled Tahrir Square to bring down Hosni Mubarak and what it means for our understanding of the causes of prosperity and poverty. This book is about the huge differences in incomes and standards of living that separate the rich countries of the world, such as the United States, Great Britain, and Germany, from the poor, such as those in Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, and South Asia. As we write this preface, North Africa and the Middle East have been shaken by the Arab Spring, started by the so-called Jasmine Revolution which was initially ignited by public outrage over the self-immolation of a street vendor, Mohamed Bouazizi, on December 17, 2010. By January 14, 2011, President Zine El Abidine Ben Ali, who had ruled Tunisia since 1987, had stepped down, but far from abating. The revolutionary fervor against the rule of privileged elites in Tunisia was getting stronger and had already spread to the rest of the Middle East. Hosni Mubarak, who had ruled Egypt with a tight grip for almost 30 years, was ousted on February 11, 2011. The fates of the regimes in Bahrain, Libya, Syria, and Yemen are unknown as we complete this preface. The roots of discontent in these countries lie in their poverty. The average Egyptian has an income level of around 12% of the average citizen of the United States, and can expect to live 10 fewer years, 20% of the population is in dire poverty. Though these differences are significant, they are actually quite small compared with those between the United States and the poorest countries in the world, such as North Korea, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe where well over half the population lives in poverty. Why is Egypt so much poorer than the United States? What are the constraints that keep Egyptians from becoming more prosperous? Is the poverty of Egypt immutable, or can it be eradicated? A natural way to start. Thinking about this is to look at what the Egyptians themselves are saying about the problems they face and why they rose up against the Mubarak regime. Noha Hamed, 24, a worker at an advertising agency in Cairo, made her views clear as she demonstrated in Tahrir Square, we are suffering from corruption, oppression, and bad education. We are living amid a corrupt system which has to change. Another in the square, Mozab El Shami, 20, 
a pharmacy student, concurred. I hope that by the end of this year we will have an elected government and that universal freedoms are applied, and that we put an end to the corruption that has taken over this country. The protesters in Tahrir Square spoke with one voice about the corruption of the government, its inability to deliver public services, and the lack of equality of opportunity in their country. They particularly complained about repression and the absence of political rights. As Mohammed El Baradai, former director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, wrote on Twitter on January 13, 2011, Tunisia. Repression plus absence of social justice plus denial of channels for peaceful change equals a ticking bomb. Egyptians and Tunisians both saw their economic problems as being fundamentally caused by their lack of political rights. When the protesters started to formulate their demands more systematically, the first 12 immediate demands posted by Woyal Khalil, the software engineer and blogger who emerged as one of the leaders of the Egyptian protest movement, were all focused on political change. Issues such as raising the minimum wage appeared only among the transitional demands that were to be implemented later. To Egyptians, the things that have held them back include an ineffective and corrupt state and a society where they cannot use their talent, ambition, ingenuity, and what education they can get. But they also recognize that the roots of these problems are political. All the economic impediments they face stem from the way political power in Egypt is exercised and monopolized by a narrow elite. This, they understand, is the first thing that has to change. Yet, in believing this, the protesters of Tahrir Square have sharply diverged from the conventional wisdom on this topic. When they reason about why a country such as Egypt is poor, most academics and commentators emphasize completely different factors. Some stress that Egypt's poverty is determined primarily by its geography, by the fact that the country is mostly a desert and lacks adequate rainfall, and that its soils and climate do not allow productive agriculture. Others instead point to cultural attributes of Egyptians that are supposedly inimical to economic development and prosperity. Egyptians, they argue, lack the same sort of work ethic and cultural traits that have allowed others to prosper, and instead have accepted Islamic beliefs that are inconsistent with economic success. A third approach, the one dominant among economists and policy pundits, is based on the notion that the rulers of Egypt simply don't know what is needed to make their country prosperous and have followed incorrect policies and strategies in the past. If these rulers would only get the right advice from the right advisors, the thinking goes, prosperity would follow. To these academics and pundits, the fact that Egypt has been ruled by narrow elites feathering their nests at the expense of society seems irrelevant to understanding the country's economic problems. In this book we'll argue that the Egyptians in Tahrir Square, not most academics and commentators, have the right idea. In fact, Egypt is poor precisely because it has been ruled by a narrow elite that have organized society, for their own benefit at the expense of the vast mass of people. Political power has been narrowly concentrated, and has been used to create great wealth for those who possess it, such as the $70 billion fortune, apparently accumulated by ex-President Mubarak. The losers have been the Egyptian people, as they only too well understand. We'll show that this interpretation of Egyptian poverty, the people's interpretation, turns out to provide a general explanation for why poor countries are poor. Whether it is North Korea, Sierra Leone, or Zimbabwe, will show that poor countries are poor for the same reason that Egypt is poor. Countries such as Great Britain and the United States became rich because their citizens overthrew the elites who controlled power, and created a society where political rights were much more broadly distributed, where the government was accountable and responsive to citizens, 
and where the great mass of people could take advantage of economic opportunities. We'll show that to understand why there is such inequality in the world today we have to delve into the past, and study the historical dynamics of societies. We'll see that the reason that Britain is richer than Egypt is because in 1688, Britain, or England, to be exact, had a revolution that transformed the politics and thus the economics of the nation. People fought for and won more political rights, and they used them to expand their economic opportunities. The result was a fundamentally different political and economic trajectory, culminating in the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution and the technologies it unleashed didn't spread to Egypt, as that country was under the control of the Ottoman Empire, which treated Egypt in rather the same way as the Mubarak family later did. Ottoman rule in Egypt was overthrown by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798, but the country then fell under the control of British colonialism, which had as little interest as the Ottomans in promoting Egypt's prosperity. Though the Egyptians shook off the Ottoman and British empires and, in 1952, overthrew their monarchy, these were not revolutions like that of 1688 in England, and rather than fundamentally transforming politics in Egypt, they brought to power another elite as disinterested in achieving prosperity for ordinary Egyptians as the Ottoman and British had been. In consequence, the basic structure of society did not change, and Egypt stayed poor. In this book we'll study how these patterns reproduce themselves over time and why sometimes they are altered as they were in England in 1688 and in France with the Revolution of 1789. This will help us to understand if the situation in Egypt has changed today and whether the revolution that overthrew Mubarak will lead to a new set of institutions capable of bringing prosperity to ordinary Egyptians. Egypt has had revolutions in the past that did not change things because those who mounted the revolutions simply took over the reins from those they deposed and recreated a similar system. It is indeed difficult for ordinary citizens to acquire real political power and change the way their society works. But it is possible, and we'll see how this happened in England, France, and the United States, and also in Japan, Botswana, and Brazil. Fundamentally it is a political transformation of this sort that is required for a poor society to become rich. There is evidence that this may be happening in Egypt. Rita Metwili, another protester in Tahrir Square, argued, Now you see Muslims and Christians together, now you see old and young together, all wanting the same thing. We'll see that such a broad movement in society was a key part of what happened in these other political transformations. If we understand when and why such transitions occur, we will be in a better position to evaluate when we expect such movements to fail as they have often done in the past, and when we may hope that they will succeed and improve the lives of millions. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and poverty. By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. Chapter 1. So close and yet so different. Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, have the same people, culture, and geography. Why is one rich and one poor? 1. So close and yet so different. The economics of the Rio Grande. The city of Nogales is cut in half by a fence. If you stand by it and look north, you'll see Nogales, Arizona, located in Santa Cruz County. The income of the average household there is about $30,000 a year. Most teenagers are in school, and the majority of the adults are high school graduates. Despite all the arguments people make about how deficient the U.S. healthcare system is, the population is relatively healthy, with high life expectancy by global standards. 
Many of the residents are above age 65 and have access to Medicare. It's just one of the many services the government provides that most take for granted, such as electricity, telephones, a sewage system, public health, a road network linking them to other cities in the area and to the rest of the United States, and, last but not least, law and order. The people of Nogales, Arizona, can go about their daily activities without fear for life or safety and not constantly afraid of theft, expropriation, or other things that might jeopardize their investments in their businesses and houses. Equally important, the residents of Nogales, Arizona, take it for granted that, with all its inefficiency and occasional corruption, the government is their agent. They can vote to replace their mayor, congressman, and senators. They vote in the presidential elections that determine who will lead their country. Democracy is second nature to them. Life south of the fence, just a few feet away, is rather different. While the residents of Nogales, Sonora, live in a relatively prosperous part of Mexico, the income of the average household there is about one-third that in Nogales, Arizona. Most adults in Nogales, Sonora, do not have a high school degree, and many teenagers are not in school. Mothers have to worry about high rates of infant mortality. Poor public health conditions mean it's no surprise that the residents of Nogales, Sonora, do not live as long as their northern neighbors. They also don't have access to many public amenities. Roads are in bad condition south of the fence. Law and order is in worse condition. Crime is high, and opening a business is a risky activity. Not only do you risk robbery, but getting all the permissions and greasing all the palms just to open is no easy endeavor. Residents of Nogales, Sonora, live with politicians' corruption and ineptitude every day. In contrast to their northern neighbors, democracy is a very recent experience for them. Until the political reforms of 2000, Nogales, Sonora, just like the rest of Mexico, was under the corrupt control of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or Partido Revolucionario Institucional, PRI. How could the two halves of what is essentially the same city be so different? There is no difference in geography, climate, or the types of diseases prevalent in the area, since germs do not face any restrictions crossing back and forth between the United States and Mexico. Of course, health conditions are very different, but this has nothing to do with the disease environment. It is because the people south of the border live with inferior sanitary conditions and lack decent health care. But perhaps the residents are very different. Could it be that the residents of Nogales, Arizona, are grandchildren of migrants from Europe, while those in the south are descendants of Aztecs? Not so. The backgrounds of people on both sides of the border are quite similar. After Mexico became independent from Spain in 1821, the area around Los Dos Nogales was part of the Mexican state of Vieja, California, and remained so even after the Mexican-American War of 1846-1848. Indeed, it was only after the Gadsden Purchase of 1853 that the U.S. border was extended into this area. It was Lt. N. Mickler who, while surveying the border, noted the presence of the pretty little valley of Los Nogales. Here, on either side of the border, the two cities rose up. The inhabitants of Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, share ancestors, enjoy the same food and the same music, and, we would hazard to say, have the same culture. Of course, there is a very simple and obvious explanation for the differences between the two halves of Nogales that you've probably long since guessed, the very border that defines the two halves. Nogales, Arizona, is in the United States. 
its inhabitants have access to the economic institutions of the United States, which enable them to choose their occupations freely, acquire schooling and skills, and encourage their employers to invest in the best technology, which leads to higher wages for them. They also have access to political institutions that allow them to take part in the democratic process, to elect their representatives, and replace them if they misbehave. In consequence, politicians provide the basic services, ranging from public health to roads to law and order, that the citizens demand. Those of Nogales, Sonora, are not so lucky. They live in a different world shaped by different institutions. These different institutions create very disparate incentives for the inhabitants of the two Nogaleses and for the entrepreneurs and businesses willing to invest there. These incentives created by the different institutions of the Nogaleses and the countries in which they are situated are the main reason for the differences in economic prosperity on the two sides of the border. Why are the institutions of the United States so much more conducive to economic success than those of Mexico or, for that matter, the rest of Latin America? The answer to this question lies in the way the different societies formed during the early colonial period. An institutional divergence took place then, with implications lasting into the present day. To understand this divergence we must begin right at the foundation of the colonies in North and Latin America. The Founding of Buenos Aires Early in 1516 the Spanish navigator Juan Díaz de Solís sailed into a wide estuary on the eastern seaboard of South America. Waiting ashore, de Solís claimed the land for Spain, naming the river the Rio de la Plata, River of Silver since the local people possessed silver. The indigenous peoples on either side of the estuary, the Chiruas in what is now Uruguay, and the Quarandi on the plains that were to be known as the Pampas in modern Argentina, regarded the newcomers with hostility. These locals were hunter-gatherers who lived in small groups without strong centralized political authorities. Indeed it was such a band of Chiruas who clubbed de Solis to death as he explored the new domains he had attempt to occupy for Spain. In 1534 the Spanish, still optimistic, sent out a first mission of settlers from Spain under the leadership of Pedro de Mendoza. They founded a town on the site of Buenos Aires in the same year. It should have been an ideal place for Europeans. Buenos Aires, literally meaning good airs, had a hospitable, temperate climate. Yet the first stay of the Spaniards there was short-lived. They were not after good airs, but resources to extract and labor to coerce. The Chiruas and the Quarandi were not obliging, however. They refused to provide food to the Spaniards, and refused to work when caught. They attacked the new settlement with their bows and arrows. The Spaniards grew hungry, since they had not anticipated having to provide food for themselves. Buenos Aires was not what they had dreamed of. The local people could not be forced into providing labor. The area had no silver or gold to exploit, and the silver that de Solis found had actually come all the way from the Inca state in the Andes, far to the west. The Spaniards, while trying to survive, started sending out expeditions to find a new place that would offer greater riches and populations easier to coerce. In 1537 one of these expeditions, under the leadership of Juan de Aeolas, penetrated up the Parana River, searching for a route to the Incas. On its way, it made contact with the Guarani, a sedentary people with an agricultural economy based on maize and cassava. De Aeolas immediately realized that the Guarani were a completely different proposition from the Chiruas and the Quarandi. After a brief conflict, the Spanish overcame Guarani resistance and founded a town, Nuestra Señora de Santa Maria de la Asuncion, which remains the capital of Paraguay today. 
the conquistadors married the Guarani princesses and quickly set themselves up as a new aristocracy. They adapted the existing systems of forced labor and tribute of the Guarani, with themselves at the helm. This was the kind of colony they wanted to set up and within four years Buenos Aires was abandoned as all the Spaniards who'd settled there moved to the new town. Buenos Aires, the Paris of South America, a city of wide European, style boulevards based on the great agricultural wealth of the Pampas, was not resettled until 1580. The abandonment of Buenos Aires and the conquest of the Guarani reveals the logic of European colonization of the Americas. Early Spanish and, as we will see, English colonists were not interested in tilling the soil themselves, they wanted others to do it for them, and they wanted riches, gold and silver, to plunder. From Cajamarca The expeditions of de Solis, de Mendoza, and de Aeolas came in the wake of more famous ones that followed Christopher Columbus's sighting of one of the islands of the Bahamas on October 12, 1492. Spanish expansion and colonization of the Americas began in earnest with the invasion of Mexico by Hernán Cortés. In 1519, the expedition of Francisco Pizarro to Peru a decade and a half later, and the expedition of Pedro de Mendoza to the Rio de la Plata just two years after that. Over the next century, Spain conquered and colonized most of Central, Western, and Southern South America, while Portugal claimed Brazil to the east. The Spanish strategy of colonization was highly effective. First perfected by Cortés in Mexico, it was based on the observation that the best way for the Spanish to subdue opposition was to capture the indigenous leader. This strategy enabled the Spanish to claim the accumulated wealth of the leader and coerce the indigenous peoples to give tribute and food. The next step was setting themselves up as the new elite of the indigenous society and taking control of the existing methods of taxation, tribute, and, particularly, forced labor. When Cortés and his men arrived at the great Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan on November 8, 1519, they were welcomed by Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor, who had decided, in the face of much advice from his counselors, to welcome the Spaniards peacefully. What happened next is well described by the account compiled after 1545 by the Franciscan priest Bernardino de Sahagan in his famous Florentine codices. At, once they, the Spanish, firmly seized Moctezuma, then each of the guns shot off. Fear prevailed. It was as if everyone had swallowed his heart. Even before it had grown dark, there was terror, there was astonishment, there was apprehension, there was a stunning of the people. And when it dawned thereupon were proclaimed all the things which, the Spaniards, required, white tortillas, roasted turkey hens, eggs, fresh water, wood, firewood, charcoal. This had Moctezuma indeed commanded. And when the Spaniards were well settled, they thereupon inquired of Moctezuma as to all the city's treasure. With great zeal they sought gold. And Moctezuma thereupon went leading the Spaniards. They went surrounding him, each holding him, each grasping him. And when they reached the storehouse, a place called Tiacalco, thereupon they brought forth all the brilliant things, the Quetzal feather head fan, the devices, the shields, the golden discs, the golden nose crescents, the golden leg bands, the golden arm bands, the golden forehead bands. Thereupon was detached the gold, at once they ignited, set fire to all the precious things they all burned. And the gold the Spaniards formed into separate bars. And the Spanish walked everywhere. They took all, all that they saw which they saw to be good. Thereupon they went to Moctezuma's own storehouse, at the place called Totocalco, they brought forth, Moctezuma's, own property. Precious things all, the necklaces with pendants, the armbands with tufts of quetzal feathers, 
the golden armbands, the bracelets, the golden bands with shells, and the turquoise diadem, the attribute of the ruler. They took it all. The military conquest of the Aztecs was completed by 1521. Cortés, as governor of the province of New Spain, then began dividing up the most valuable resource, the indigenous population, through the institution of the encomienda. The encomienda had first appeared in 15th century Spain as part of the reconquest of the south of the country from the Moors, Arabs who had settled during and after the 8th century. In the New World, it took on a much more pernicious form, it was a grant of indigenous peoples to a Spaniard known as the encomendero. The indigenous peoples had to give the encomendero tribute and labor services, in exchange for which the encomendero was charged with converting them to Christianity. A vivid early account of the workings of the encomienda has come down to us from Bartolomé de las Casas, a Dominican priest who formulated the earliest and one of the most devastating critiques of the Spanish colonial system. De Las Casas arrived on the Spanish island of Hispaniola in 1502 with a fleet of ships led by the new governor, Nicolas de Ovando. He became increasingly disillusioned and disturbed by the cruel and exploitative treatment of the indigenous peoples he witnessed every day. In 1513 he took part as a chaplain in the Spanish conquest of Cuba, even being granted an encomienda for his service. However, he renounced the grant and began a long campaign to reform Spanish colonial institutions. His efforts culminated in his book A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies, written in 1542, a withering attack on the barbarity of Spanish rule. On the encomienda he has this to say in the case of Nicaragua. Each of the settlers took up residence in the town allotted to him, or encommended to him, as the legal phrase has it, put the inhabitants to work for him, stole their already scarce foodstuffs for himself and took over the lands owned and worked by the natives and on which they traditionally grew. Their own produce. The settler would treat the whole of the native population, dignitaries, old men, women, and children, as members of his household and, as such, make them labor night and day in his own interests, without any rest whatsoever. For the conquest of New Granada, modern Colombia, de las Casas reports the whole Spanish strategy in action. To realize their long-term purpose of seizing all the available gold, the Spaniards employed their usual strategy of apportioning among themselves, or encommending, as they have it, the towns and their inhabitants, and then, as ever, treating them as common slaves. The man in overall command of the expedition seized the king of the whole territory for himself and held him prisoner, for six or seven months, quite illicitly demanding more and more gold and emeralds from him. This king, one Bogota, was so terrified that, in his anxiety to free himself from the clutches of his tormentors, he consented to the demand that he fill an entire house with gold and hand it over. To this end he sent his people off in search of gold, and bit by bit they brought it along with many precious stones. But still the house was not filled and the Spaniards eventually declared that they would put him to death for breaking his promise. The commander suggested they should bring the case before him, as a representative of the law, and when they did so, Entering formal accusations against the king, he sentenced him to torture should he persist in not honoring the bargain. They tortured him with the strapado, put burning tallow on his belly, pinned both his legs to poles with iron hoops and his neck with another and then, with two men holding his hands, proceeded to burn the soles of his feet. From time to time, the commander would look in and repeat that they would torture him to death slowly unless he produced more gold. And this is what they did, the king eventually succumbing to the agonies they inflicted on him. The strategy and institutions of conquest perfected in Mexico were eagerly adopted elsewhere in the Spanish Empire. 
nowhere was this done more effectively than in Pizarro's conquest of Peru. As de las Casas begins his account, in 1531 another great villain journeyed with a number of men to the kingdom of Peru. He set out with every intention of imitating the strategy and tactics of his fellow adventurers in other parts of the New World. Pizarro began on the coast near the Peruvian town of Tums and marched south. On November 15, 1532, he reached the mountain town of Cajamarca, where the Inca Emperor Atahualpa was encamped with his army. The next day, Atahualpa, who had just vanquished his brother Huáscar in a contest over who would succeed their deceased father, Huayna Capac, came with his retinue to where the Spanish were camped. Atahualpa was irritated because news of atrocities that the Spanish had already committed, such as violating a temple of the sun god Inti, had reached him. What transpired next is well known. The Spanish laid a trap and sprang it. They killed Atahualpa's guards and retainers, possibly as many as 2,000 people, and captured the king. To gain his freedom, Atahualpa had to promise to fill one room with gold and two more of the same size with silver. He did this, but the Spanish, reneging on their promises, strangled him in July 1533. That November, the Spanish captured the Inca capital of Cusco where the Incan aristocracy received the same treatment as Atahualpa, being imprisoned until they produced gold and silver. When they did not satisfy Spanish demands, they were burned alive. The great artistic treasures of Cusco, such as the Temple of the Sun, had their gold stripped from them and melted down into ingots. At this point the Spanish focused on the people of the Inca Empire. As in Mexico, citizens were divided into encomiendas, with one going to each of the conquistadors who had accompanied Pizarro. The encomienda was the main institution used for the control and organization of labor in the early colonial period, but it soon faced a vigorous contender. In 1545 a local named Diego Gualpa was searching for an indigenous shrine high in the Andes in what is today Bolivia. He was thrown to the ground by a sudden gust of wind and in front of him appeared a cache of silver ore. This was part of a vast mountain of silver, which the Spanish baptized El Cerro Rico, the rich hill. Around it grew the city of Potosí, which at its height in 1650 had a population of 160,000 people, larger than Lisbon or Venice in this period. To exploit the silver, the Spanish needed miners, a lot of miners. They sent a new viceroy, the chief Spanish colonial official, Francisco de Toledo, whose main mission was to solve the labor problem. De Toledo, arriving in Peru in 1569, first spent five years traveling around and investigating his new charge. He also commissioned a massive survey of the entire adult population. To find the labor he needed, de Toledo first moved almost the entire indigenous population, concentrating them in new towns called reductions, literally reductions, which would facilitate the exploitation of labor by the Spanish crown. Then he revived and adapted an Inca labor institution known as the Mita, which, in the Inca's language, Quechua, means a turn. Under their Mita system, the Incas had used forced labor to run plantations designed to provide food for temples, the aristocracy, and the army. In return, the Inca elite provided famine relief and security. In de Toledo's hands the Mita, especially the Potosí Mita, was to become the largest and most onerous scheme of labor exploitation in the Spanish colonial period. De Toledo defined a huge catchment area, running from the middle of modern-day Peru and encompassing most of modern Bolivia. It covered about 200,000 square miles. In this area, one-seventh of the male inhabitants, newly arrived in their reductions, were required to work in the mines at Potosí. 
The Potosi Mita endured throughout the entire colonial period and was abolished only in 1825. Map 1 shows the catchment area of the Mita superimposed on the extent of the Inca Empire at the time of the Spanish conquest. It illustrates the extent to which the Mita overlapped with the heartland of the empire, encompassing the capital Cusco. Remarkably, you still see the legacy of the Mita in Peru today. Take the differences between the provinces of Calca and nearby Acameo. There appears to be few differences among these provinces. Both are high in the mountains, and each is inhabited by the Quechua-speaking descendants of the Incas. Yet Acameo is much poorer, with its inhabitants consuming about one-third less than those in Calca. The people know this. In Acameo they ask intrepid foreigners, don't you know that the people here are poorer than the people over there in Calca? Why would you ever want to come here? Intrepid because it is much harder to get to Acameo from the regional capital of Cusco, ancient center of the Inca Empire, than it is to get to Calca. The road to Calca is surfaced, the one to Acameo is in a terrible state of disrepair. To get beyond Acameo, you need a horse or a mule. In Calca and Acameo, people grow the same crops, but in Calca they sell them on the market for money. In Acameo they grow food for their own subsistence. These inequalities, apparent to the eye and to the people who live there, can be understood in terms of the institutional differences between these departments institutional differences with historical roots going back to de Toledo and his plan for effective exploitation of indigenous labor. The major historical difference between Acameo and Calca is that Acameo was in the catchment area of the Potosi Mita. Calca was not. In addition to the concentration of labor and the Mita, de Toledo consolidated the encomienda into a head tax a fixed sum payable by each adult male every year in silver. This was another scheme designed to force people into the labor market and reduce wages for Spanish landowners. Another institution, the Repartimiento de Mercancias, also became widespread during de Toledo's tenure. Derived from the Spanish verb reparter, to distribute, this repartimiento, literally, the distribution of goods involved the forced sale of goods to locals at prices determined by Spaniards. Finally, de Toledo introduced the trajín, meaning, literally, the burden, which used the indigenous people to carry heavy loads of goods, such as wine or coca leaves or textiles, as a substitute for pack animals, for the business ventures of the Spanish elite. Throughout the Spanish colonial world in the Americas, Similar institutions and social structures emerged. After an initial phase of looting, and gold and silver lust, the Spanish created a web of institutions designed to exploit the indigenous peoples. The full gamut of encomienda, mita, repartimiento, and trajín was designed to force indigenous peoples' living standards down to a subsistence level and thus extract all income in excess of this for Spaniards. This was achieved by expropriating their land, forcing them to work, offering low wages for labor services, imposing high taxes, and charging high prices for goods that were not even voluntarily bought. Though these institutions generated a lot of wealth for the Spanish crown and made the conquistadors and their descendants very rich, they also turned Latin America into the most unequal continent in the world and sapped much of its economic potential. To Jamestown As the Spanish began their conquest of the Americas in the 1490s, England was a minor European power recovering from the devastating effects of a civil war, the Wars of the Roses. She was in no state to take advantage of the scramble for loot and gold and the opportunity to exploit the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Nearly 100 years later, in 1588, the lucky rout of the Spanish Armada, 
an attempt by King Philip II of Spain to invade England, sent political shockwaves around Europe. Fortunate though England's victory was, it was also a sign of growing English assertiveness on the seas, that would enable them to finally take part in the quest for colonial empire. It is thus no coincidence that the English began their colonization of North America at exactly the same time. But they were already latecomers. They chose North America not because it was attractive, but because it was all that was available. The undesirable parts of the Americas, where the indigenous population to exploit was plentiful and where the gold and silver mines were located, had already been occupied. The English got the leftovers. When the 18th century English writer and agriculturalist, Arthur Young discussed where profitable, staple products, by which he meant exportable agricultural goods, were produced, he noted. It appears upon the whole, that the staple productions of our colonies decrease in value in proportion to their distance from the sun. In the West Indies, which are the hottest of all, they make to the amount of 8 L. 12s, 1 D. Per head. In the southern continental ones, to the amount of 5 L. 10s, in the central ones, to the amount of 9s. 6 1 slash 2 D. In the northern settlements, to that of twos. 6d, this scale surely suggests a most important lesson, to avoid colonizing in northern latitudes. The first English attempt to plant a colony, at Roanoke, in North Carolina, between 1585 and 1587, was a complete failure. In 1607 they tried again. Shortly before the end of 1606, three vessels, Susan Constant, Godspeed, and Discovery, under the command of Captain Christopher Newport, set off for Virginia. The colonists, under the auspices of the Virginia Company, sailed into Chesapeake Bay and up a river they named the James, after the ruling English monarch, James I. On May 14, 1607, they founded the settlement of Jamestown. Though the settlers on board the ships owned by the Virginia Company were English, they had a model of colonization heavily influenced by the template set up by Cortez, Pizarro, and de Toledo. Their first plan was to capture the local chief and use him as a way to get provisions and to coerce the population into producing food and wealth for them. When they first landed in Jamestown, the English colonists did not know that they were within the territory claimed by the Powhatan Confederacy, a coalition of some thirty polities owing allegiance to a king called Wahunsinakok. Wahunsinakok's capital was at the town of Werewokamoko, a mere twenty miles from Jamestown. The plan of the colonists was to learn more about the lay of the land. If the locals could not be induced to provide food and labor, the colonists might at least be able to trade with them. The notion that the settlers themselves would work and grow their own food seems not to have crossed their minds. That is not what conquerors of the New World did. Wahunsinakok quickly became aware of the colonists' presence and viewed their intentions with great suspicion. He was in charge of what for North America was quite a large empire. But he had many enemies and lacked the overwhelming centralized political control of the Incas. Wahunsinakok decided to see what the intentions of the English were, initially sending messengers saying that he desired friendly relations with them. As the winter of 1607 closed in, the settlers in Jamestown began to run low on food and the appointed leader of the colony's ruling council, Edward Marie Wingfield, dithered indecisively. The situation was rescued by Captain John Smith. Smith, whose writings provide one of our main sources of information about the early development of the colony, was a larger-than-life character. Born in England, in rural Lincolnshire, 
he disregarded his father's desires for him to go into business and instead became a soldier of fortune. He first fought with English armies in the Netherlands, after which he joined Austrian forces serving in Hungary fighting against the armies of the Ottoman Empire. Captured in Romania, he was sold as a slave and put to work as a field hand. He managed one day to overcome his master and, stealing his clothes and his horse, escaped back into Austrian territory. Smith had got himself into trouble on the voyage to Virginia and was imprisoned on the Susan Constant for mutiny after. Defying the orders of Wingfield. When the ships reached the New World, the plan was to put him on trial. To the immense horror of Wingfield, Newport, and other elite colonists, however, when they opened their sealed orders, they discovered that the Virginia Company had nominated Smith to be a member of the ruling council that was to govern Jamestown. With Newport sailing back to England for supplies and more colonists, and Wingfield uncertain about what to do, it was Smith who saved the colony. He initiated a series of trading missions that secured vital food supplies. On one of these he was captured by Opakankanoff, one of Wahunsinakok's younger brothers, and was brought before the king at Werowokamoko. He was the first Englishman to meet Wahunsinakok, and it was at this initial meeting that according to some accounts Smith's life was saved only at the intervention of Wahunsinakok's young daughter Pocahontas. Freed on January 2, 1608, Smith returned to Jamestown, which was still perilously low on food, until the timely return of Newport from England later on the same day. The colonists of Jamestown learned little from this initial experience. As 1608 proceeded, they continued their quest for gold and precious metals. They still did not seem to understand that to survive, they could not rely on the locals to feed them through either coercion or trade. It was Smith who was the first to realize that the model of colonization that had worked so well for Cortez and Pizarro simply would not work in North America. The underlying circumstances were just too different. Smith noted that, unlike the Aztecs and Incas, the peoples of Virginia did not have gold. Indeed, he noted in his diary, Vittles you must know is all their wealth. Honest Todd Kill one of the early settlers who left an extensive diary, expressed well the frustrations of Smith and the few others on which this recognition dawned. There was no taka, no hope, no work, but dig gold, refine gold, load gold. When Newport sailed for England in April 1608 he took a cargo of pyrite, fool's gold. He returned at the end of September with orders from the Virginia Company to take firmer control over the locals. Their plan was to crown Wahunsinakok, hoping this would render him subservient to the English King James I. They invited him to Jamestown, but Wahunsinakok, still deeply suspicious of the colonists, had no intention of risking capture. John Smith recorded Wahunsinakok's reply. If your king have sent me presents, I also am a king, and this is my land. Your father is to come to me, not I to him, nor yet to your fort, neither will I bite at such a bait. If Wahunsinakok would not bite at such a bait, Newport and Smith would have to go to Werowokamoko to undertake the coronation. The whole event appears to have been a complete fiasco with the only thing coming out of it a resolve on the part of Wahunsinakok that it was time to get rid of the colony. He imposed a trade embargo. Jamestown could no longer trade for supplies. Wahunsinakok would starve them out. Newport set sail once more for England, in December 1608. He took with him a letter written by Smith pleading with the directors of the Virginia Company to change the way they thought about the colony. There was no possibility of a get-rich-quick exploitation of Virginia along the lines of Mexico and Peru. There were no gold or precious metals, and the indigenous people could not be forced to work or provide food. 
Smith realized that if there were going to be a viable colony, it was the colonists who would have to work. He therefore pleaded with the directors to send the right sort of people. When you send again I entreat you rather to send some thirty carpenters, husbandmen, gardeners, fishermen, blacksmiths, masons, and diggers up of trees, roots, well provided, than a thousand of such as we have. Smith did not want any more useless goldsmiths. Once more Jamestown survived only because of his resourcefulness. He managed to cajole and bully local indigenous groups to trade with him, and when they wouldn't, he took what he could. Back in the settlement, Smith was completely in charge and imposed the rule that, he that will not work shall not eat. Jamestown survived a second winter. The Virginia Company was intended to be a money-making enterprise, and after two disastrous years, there was no whiff of profit. The directors of the company decided that they needed a new model of governance, replacing the ruling council with a single governor. The first man appointed to this position was Sir Thomas Gates. Heeding some aspects of Smith's warning, the company realized that they had to try something new. This realization was driven home by the events of the winter of 1609-1610, the so-called A Starving Time. The new mode of governance left no room for Smith, who, disgruntled, returned to England in the autumn of 1609. Without his resourcefulness, and with Wahunsinacock throttling the food supply, the colonists in Jamestown perished. Of the 500 who entered the winter, only 60 were alive by March. The situation was so desperate that they resorted to cannibalism. The was something new that was imposed on the colony by Gates and his deputy, Sir Thomas Dale, was a work regime of draconian severity for English settlers, though not of course for the elite running the colony. It was Dale who propagated the laws divine, moral, and martial. This included the clauses. No man or woman shall run away from the colony to the Indians, upon pain of death. Anyone who robs a garden, public or private, or a vineyard, or who steals ears of corn shall be punished with death. No member of the colony will sell or give any commodity of this country to a captain, mariner, master or sailor to transport out of the colony, for his own private uses, upon pain of death. If the indigenous peoples could not be exploited, reasoned the Virginia Company, perhaps the colonists could. The new model of colonial development entailed the Virginia Company owning all the land. Men were housed in barracks, and given company-determined rations. Work gangs were chosen, each one overseen by an agent of the company. It was close to martial law, with execution as the punishment of first resort. As part of the new institutions for the colony, the first clause just given is significant. The company threatened with death those who ran away. Given the new work regime, running away to live with the locals became more and more of an attractive option for the colonists who had to do the work. Also available, given the low density of even indigenous populations in Virginia at that time, was the prospect of going it alone on the frontier beyond the control of the Virginia Company. The power of the company in the face of these options was limited. It could not coerce the English settlers into hard work at subsistence rations. Map 2, opposite shows an estimate of the population density of different regions of the Americas at the time on the Spanish conquest. The population density of the United States, outside of a few pockets, was at most three-quarters of a person per square mile. In central Mexico or Andean Peru, the population density was as high as 400 people per square mile, more than 500 times higher. What was possible in Mexico or Peru was not feasible in Virginia. It took the Virginia Company some time to recognize that its initial model of colonization did not work in Virginia, 
and it took a while, too, for the failure of the laws divine, moral, and martial to sink in. Starting in 1618, a dramatically new strategy was adopted. Since it was possible to coerce neither the locals nor the settlers, the only alternative was to give the settlers incentives. In 1618 the company began the headright system, which gave each male settler 50 acres of land and 50 more acres for each member of his family and for all servants that a family could bring to Virginia. Settlers were given their houses and freed from their contracts, and in 1619 a general assembly was introduced that effectively gave all adult men a say in the laws and institutions governing the colony. It was the start of democracy in the United States. It took the Virginia Company 12 years to learn its first lesson that what had worked for the Spanish in Mexico and in Central and South America would not work in the North. The rest of the 17th century saw a long series of struggles over the second lesson, that the only option for an economically viable colony was to create institutions that gave the colonists incentives to invest, and to work hard. As North America developed, English elites tried time and time again to set up institutions that would heavily restrict the economic and political rights for all but a privileged few of the inhabitants of the colony, just as the Spanish did. Yet in each case this model broke down, as it had in Virginia. One of the most ambitious attempts began soon after the change in strategy of the Virginia Company. In 1632 10 million acres of land on the upper Chesapeake Bay were granted by the English King Charles I, to Cecilius Calvert, Lord Baltimore. The Charter of Maryland gave Lord Baltimore complete freedom to create a government along any lines he wished, with Clause 7 noting that Baltimore had, for the good and happy government of the said province, free, full, and absolute power, by the tenor of these presents, to ordain, make, and enact laws, of what kind soever. Baltimore drew up a detailed plan for creating a manorial society a North American variant of an idealized version of 17th-century rural England. It entailed dividing the land into plots of thousands of acres, which would be run by lords. The lords would recruit tenants, who would work the lands and pay rents to the privileged elite controlling the land. Another similar attempt was made later in 1663, with the founding of Carolina by eight proprietors including Sir Anthony Ashley Cooper. Ashley Cooper, along with his secretary, the great English philosopher John Locke, formulated the fundamental constitutions of Carolina. This document, like the Charter of Maryland before it, provided a blueprint for an elitist, hierarchical society based on control by a landed elite. The preamble noted that, the government of this province may be made most agreeable to the monarchy under which we live and of which this province is a part, and that we may avoid erecting a numerous democracy. The clauses of the fundamental constitutions laid out a rigid social structure. At the bottom were the elite men, with clause 23 noting, all the children of elite men shall be elite men, and so to all generations. Above the elite men, who had no political power, were the landgraves and caziques, who were to form the aristocracy. Landgraves were to be allocated 40, 8,000 acres of land each, and caziques 24,000 acres. There was to be a parliament, in which landgraves and caziques were represented, but it would be permitted to debate only those measures that had previously been approved by the eight proprietors. Just as the attempt to impose draconian rule in Virginia failed, so did the plans for the same type of institutions in Maryland and Carolina. The reasons were similar. In all cases it proved to be impossible to force settlers into a rigid hierarchical society, because there were simply too many options open to them in the New World. Instead, they had to be provided with incentives for them to want to work. 
and soon they were demanding more economic freedom and further political rights. In Maryland, too, settlers insisted on getting their own land, and they forced Lord Baltimore into creating an assembly. In 1691 the assembly induced the king to declare Maryland a crown colony, thus removing the political privileges of Baltimore and his great lords. A similar protracted struggle took place in the Carolinas, again with the proprietors losing. South Carolina became a royal colony in 1729. By the 1720s, all the thirteen colonies of what was to become the United States had similar structures of government. In all cases there was a governor, and an assembly based on a franchise of male property holders. They were not democracies, women, slaves, and the propertyless could not vote. But political rights were very broad compared with contemporary societies elsewhere. It was these assemblies and their leaders that coalesced to form the First Continental Congress in 1774, the prelude to the independence of the United States. The assemblies believed they had the right to determine both their own membership and the right to taxation. This, as we know, created problems for the English colonial government. A Tale of Two Constitutions it should now be apparent that it is not a coincidence that the United States, and not Mexico, adopted and enforced a constitution that espoused democratic principles, created limitations on the use of political power, and distributed that power broadly in society. The document that the delegates sat down to write in Philadelphia in May 1787 was the outcome of a long process initiated by the formation of the General Assembly in Jamestown in 1619. The contrast between the constitutional process that took place at the time of the independence of the United States, and the one that took place a little afterward in Mexico is stark. In February 1808, Napoleon Bonaparte's French armies invaded Spain. By May they had taken Madrid, the Spanish capital. By September the Spanish King Ferdinand had been captured and had abdicated. A national junta, the Junta Central, took his place, taking the torch in the fight against the French. The junta met first at Aranjuez, but retreated south in the face of the French armies. Finally it reached the port of Cadiz, which, though besieged by Napoleonic forces, held out. Here the junta formed a parliament, called the Cortes. In 1812 the Cortes produced what became known as the Cadiz Constitution, which called for the introduction of a constitutional monarchy based on notions of popular sovereignty. It also called for the end of special privileges and the introduction of equality before the law. These demands were all anathema to the elites of South America who were still ruling an institutional environment shaped by the encomienda, forced labor, and absolute power vested in them and the colonial state. The collapse of the Spanish state with the Napoleonic invasion created a constitutional crisis throughout colonial Latin America. There was much dispute about whether to recognize the authority of the Junta Central, and in response, many Latin Americans began to form their own juntas. It was only a matter of time before they began to sense the possibility of becoming truly independent from Spain. The first declaration of independence took place in La Paz, Bolivia, in 1809, though it was quickly crushed by Spanish troops sent from Peru. In Mexico the political attitudes of the elite had been shaped by the 1810 Hidalgo Revolt, led by a priest, Father Miguel Hidalgo. When Hidalgo's army sacked Guanajuato on September 23, they killed the intendant, the senior colonial official, and then started indiscriminately to kill white people. It was more like class or even ethnic warfare than an independence movement, and it united all the elites in opposition. If independence allowed popular participation in politics, 
the local elites, not just Spaniards, were against it. Consequentially, Mexican elites viewed the Cádiz Constitution, which opened the way to popular participation, with extreme skepticism, they would never recognize its legitimacy. In 1815, as Napoleon's European empire collapsed, King Ferdinand VII returned to power and the Cádiz Constitution was abrogated. As the Spanish crown began trying to reclaim its American colonies, it did not face a problem with loyalist Mexico. Yet, in 1820, a Spanish army that had assembled in Cádiz to sail to the Americas to help restore Spanish authority mutinied against Ferdinand VII. They were soon joined by army units throughout the country, and Ferdinand was forced to restore the Cádiz constitution and recall the Cortés. This Cortés was even more radical than the one that had written the Cádiz constitution, and it proposed abolishing all forms of labor coercion. It also attacked special privileges, for example, the right of the military to be tried for crimes in their own courts. Faced finally with the imposition of this document in Mexico, the elites there decided that it was better to go it alone and declare independence. This independence movement was led by Agustín de Iturbide, who had been an officer in the Spanish army. On February 24, 1821, he published the Plan de Iguala, his vision for an independent Mexico. The plan featured a constitutional monarchy with a Mexican emperor, and removed the provisions of the Cádiz Constitution that Mexican elites found so threatening to their status and privileges. It received instantaneous support. And Spain quickly realized that it could not stop the inevitable. But Iturbide did not just organize Mexican secession. Recognizing the power vacuum, he quickly took advantage of his military backing to have himself declared emperor, a position that the great leader of South American independence Simon Bolivar described as, by the grace of God and of bayonets. Iturbide was not constrained by the same political institutions that constrained presidents of the United States. He quickly made himself a dictator, and by October 1822 he had dismissed the constitutionally sanctioned Congress and replaced it with a junta of his choosing. Though Iturbide did not last long, this pattern of events was to be repeated time and time again in 19th century Mexico. The Constitution of the United States did not create a democracy by modern standards. Who could vote in elections was left up to the individual states to determine. While northern states quickly conceded the vote to all white men irrespective of how much income they earned or property they owned, southern states did so only gradually. No state enfranchised women or slaves, and as property and wealth restrictions were lifted on white men, racial franchises explicitly disenfranchising black men were introduced. Slavery, of course, was deemed constitutional when the Constitution of the United States was written in Philadelphia, and the most sordid negotiation concerned the division of the seats in the House of Representatives among the states. These were to be allocated on the basis of a state's population, but the congressional representatives of southern states then demanded that the slaves be counted. Northerners objected. The compromise was that in apportioning seats to the House of Representatives, a slave would count as three-fifths of a free person. The conflicts between the North and South of the United States were repressed during the constitutional process as the three-fifths rule, and other compromises were worked out. New fixes were added over time, for example, the Missouri Compromise, an arrangement where one pro-slavery and one anti-slavery state were always added to the Union together, to keep the balance in the Senate between those for and those against slavery. These fudges kept the political institutions of the United States working peacefully until the Civil War finally resolved the conflicts, in favor of the North. The Civil War was bloody and destructive. 
but both before and after it there were ample economic opportunities for a large fraction of the population, especially in the northern and western United States. The situation in Mexico was very different. If the United States experienced five years of political instability between 1860 and 1865, Mexico experienced almost non-stop instability for the first 50 years of independence. This is best illustrated via the career of Antonio López de Santa Ana. Santa Ana, son of a colonial official in Veracruz, came to prominence as a soldier fighting for the Spanish in the Independence Wars. In 1821 he switched sides with Iturbide and never looked back. He became president of Mexico for the first time in May of 1833, though he exercised power for less than a month, preferring to let Valentin Gómez Farias act as president. Gómez Farias's presidency lasted 15 days, after which Santa Ana retook power. This was as brief as his first spell, however, and he was again replaced by Gómez Farias, in early July. Santa Ana and Gómez Farias continued this dance until the middle of 1835, when Santa Ana was replaced by Miguel Barragan. But Santa Ana was not a quitter. He was back as president in 1839, 1841, 1844, 1847, and, finally, between 1853 and 1855. In all, he was president eleven times during which he presided over the loss of the Alamo and Texas and the disastrous Mexican-American War, which led to the loss of what became New Mexico and Arizona. Between 1824 and 1867 there were 52 presidents in Mexico, few of whom assumed power according to any constitutionally sanctioned procedure. The consequence of this unprecedented political instability for economic institutions and incentives should be obvious. Such instability led to highly insecure property rights. It also led to a severe weakening of the Mexican state, which now had little authority and little ability to raise taxes or provide public services. Indeed, even though Santa Ana was president in Mexico, large parts of the country were not under his control, which enabled the annexation of Texas by the United States. In addition, as we just saw, the motivation behind the Mexican Declaration of Independence was to protect the set of economic institutions developed during the colonial period, which had made Mexico, in the words of the great German explorer and geographer of Latin America Alexander von Humboldt, the country of inequality. These institutions, by basing the society on the exploitation of indigenous people and the creation of monopolies, blocked the economic incentives and initiatives of the great mass of the population. As the United States began to experience the Industrial Revolution in the first half of the 19th century, Mexico got poorer. Having an idea, starting a firm, and getting a loan. The Industrial Revolution started in England. Its first success was to revolutionize the production of cotton cloth using new machines powered by water wheels and later by steam engines. Mechanization of cotton production massively increased the productivity of workers in, first, textiles and, subsequently, other industries. The engine of technological breakthroughs throughout the economy was innovation, spearheaded by new entrepreneurs and businessmen eager to apply their new ideas. This initial flowering soon spread across the North Atlantic to the United States. People saw the great economic opportunities available in adopting the new technologies developed in England. They were also inspired to develop their own inventions. We can try to understand the nature of these inventions by looking at who was granted patents. The patent system, which protects property rights in ideas, was systematized in the statute of monopolies legislated by the English Parliament in 1623, 
partially as an attempt to stop the king from arbitrarily granting letters patent to whomever he wanted, effectively granting exclusive rights to undertake certain activities or businesses. The striking thing about the evidence on patenting in the United States is that people who were granted patents came from all sorts of backgrounds and all walks of life, not just the rich and the elite. Many made fortunes based on their patents. Take Thomas Edison, the inventor of the phonogram and the light bulb and the founder of General Electric, still one of the world's largest companies. Edison was the last of seven children. His father, Samuel Edison, followed many occupations, from splitting shingles for roofs to tailoring to keeping a tavern. Thomas had little formal schooling but was homeschooled by his mother. Between 1820 and 1845, only 19% of patentees in the United States had parents who were professionals, or were from recognizable major landowning families. During the same period, 40% of those who took out patents had only primary schooling or less, just like Edison. Moreover, they often exploited their patent by starting a firm, again like Edison. Just as the United States in the 19th century was more democratic politically than almost any other nation in the world at the time, it was also more democratic than others when it came to innovation. This was critical to its path to becoming the most economically innovative nation in the world. If you were poor with a good idea, it was one thing to take out a patent, which was not so expensive, after all. It was another thing entirely to use that patent to make money. One way, of course, was to sell the patent to someone else. This is what Edison did early on, to raise some capital, when he sold his quadruplex telegraph to Western Union for $10,000. But selling patents was a good idea only for someone like Edison, who had ideas faster than he could put them to practice. He had a world record 1,093 patents issued to him in the United States and 1,500 worldwide. The real way to make money from a patent was to start your own business. But to start a business, you need capital, and you need banks to lend the capital to you. Inventors in the United States were once again fortunate. During the 19th century there was a rapid expansion of financial intermediation and banking that was a crucial facilitator of the rapid growth and industrialization that the economy experienced. While in 1818 there were 338 banks in operation in the United States, with total assets of $160 million, by 1914 there were 27,864 banks, with total assets of $27.3 billion. Potential inventors in the United States had ready access to capital to start their businesses. Moreover, the intense competition among banks and financial institutions in the United States meant that this capital was available at fairly low interest rates. The same was not true in Mexico. In fact, in 1910, the year in which the Mexican Revolution started, there were only 42 banks in Mexico, and two of these controlled 60% of total banking assets. Unlike in the United States, where competition was fierce, there was practically no competition among Mexican banks. This lack of competition meant that the banks were able to charge their customers very high interest rates, and typically confined lending to the privileged and the already wealthy, who would then use their access to credit to increase their grip over the various sectors of the economy. The form that the Mexican banking industry took in the 19th and 20th centuries was a direct result of the post-independence political institutions of the country. The chaos of the Santa Ana era was followed by an abortive attempt by the French government of Emperor Napoleon II 
to create a colonial regime in Mexico under Emperor Maximilian between 1864 and 1867. The French were expelled, and a new constitution was written. But the government formed first by Benito Juárez and, after his death, by Sebastián Lerdo de Tejada was soon challenged by a young military man named Porfirio Díaz. Díaz had been a victorious general in the war against the French and had developed aspirations of power. He formed a rebel army and, in November of 1876, defeated the army of the government at the Battle of Ticoac. In May of the next year, he had himself elected president. He went on to rule Mexico in a more or less unbroken and increasingly authoritarian fashion, until his overthrow at the outbreak of the revolution 34 years later. Like Iturbide and Santa Ana before him, Diaz started life as a military commander. Such a career path into politics was certainly known in the United States. The first president of the United States, George Washington, was also a successful general in the War of Independence. Ulysses S. Grant, one of the victorious Union generals of the Civil War, became president in 1869, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, the supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe during the Second World War was President of the United States between 1953 and 1961. Unlike Iturbide, Santa Ana, and Diaz, however, none of these military men used force to get into power. Nor did they use force to avoid having to relinquish power. They abided by the Constitution. Though Mexico had constitutions in the 19th century, they put few constraints on what Iturbide, Santa Ana, and Diaz could do. These men could be removed from power only the same way they had attained it, by the use of force. Diaz violated people's property rights, facilitating the expropriation of vast amounts of land, and he granted monopolies and favors to his supporters in all lines of business, including banking. There was nothing new about this behavior. This is exactly what Spanish conquistadors had done, and what Santa Ana did in their footsteps. The reason that the United States had a banking industry that was radically better for the economic prosperity of the country, had nothing to do with differences in the motivation of those who owned the banks. Indeed, the profit motive, which underpinned the monopolistic nature of the banking industry in Mexico, was present in the United States, too. But this profit motive was channeled differently because of the radically different U.S. institutions. The bankers faced different economic institutions, institutions that subjected them to much greater competition. And this was largely because the politicians who wrote the rules for the bankers faced very different incentives themselves forged by different political institutions. Indeed, in the late 18th century, shortly after the Constitution of the United States came into operation, a banking system looking similar to that which subsequently dominated Mexico began to emerge. Politicians tried to set up state banking monopolies, which they could give to their friends and partners in exchange for part of the monopoly profits. The banks also quickly got into the business of lending money to the politicians who regulated them, just as in Mexico. But this situation was not sustainable in the United States, because the politicians who attempted to create these banking monopolies, unlike their Mexican counterparts, were subject to election and re-election. Creating banking monopolies and giving loans to politicians is good business for politicians, if they can get away with it. It is not particularly good for the citizens, however. Unlike in Mexico, in the United States the citizens could keep politicians in check and get rid of ones who would use their offices to enrich themselves or create monopolies for their cronies. In consequence, the banking monopolies crumbled. 
the broad distribution of political rights in the United States, especially when compared to Mexico, guaranteed equal access to finance and loans. This in turn ensured that those with ideas and inventions could benefit from them. Path-dependent change The world was changing in the 1870s and 80s. Latin America was no exception. The institutions that Porfirio Diaz established were not identical to those of Santa Ana or the Spanish colonial state. The world economy boomed in the second half of the 19th century, and innovations in transportation such as the steamship and the railway led to a huge expansion of international trade. This wave of globalization meant that resource-rich countries such as Mexico, or, more appropriately, the elites in such countries, could enrich themselves by exporting raw materials and natural resources to industrializing North America or Western Europe. Diaz and his cronies thus found themselves in a different and rapidly evolving world. They realized that Mexico had to change, too. But this didn't mean uprooting the colonial institutions and replacing them with institutions similar to those in the United States. Instead, theirs was path-dependent, change leading only to the next stage of the institutions that had already made much of Latin America poor and unequal. Globalization made the large open spaces of the Americas, its open frontiers, valuable. Often these frontiers were only mythically open, since they were inhabited by indigenous peoples who were brutally dispossessed. All the same, the scramble for this newly valuable resource was one of the defining processes of the Americas in the second half of the 19th century. The sudden opening of this valuable frontier led not to parallel processes in the United States and Latin America, but to a further divergence, shaped by the existing institutional differences, especially those concerning who had access to the land. In the United States a long series of legislative acts, ranging from the Land Ordinance of 1785 to the Homestead Act of 1862, gave broad access to frontier lands. Though indigenous peoples had been sidelined, this created an egalitarian and economically dynamic frontier. In most Latin American countries, however, the political institutions there created a very different outcome. Frontier lands were allocated to the politically powerful and those with wealth and contacts, making such people even more powerful. Diaz also started to dismantle many of the specific colonial institutional legacies preventing international trade which he anticipated could greatly enrich him and his supporters. His model, however, continued to be not the type of economic development he saw north of the Rio Grande but that of Cortés, Pizarro, and de Toledo, where the elite would make huge fortunes while the rest were excluded. When the elite invested, the economy would grow a little, but such economic growth was always going to be disappointing. It also came at the expense of those lacking rights in this new order, such as the Yaqui people of Sonora, in the hinterland of Nogales. Between 1900 and 1910, possibly 30,000 Yaqui were deported, essentially enslaved, and sent to work in the Henequen plantations of Yucatan. The fibers of the Henequen plant were a valuable export, since they could be used to make rope and twine. The persistence into the 20th century of a specific institutional pattern inimical to growth in Mexico and Latin America is well illustrated by the fact that, just as in the 19th century, the pattern generated economic stagnation and political instability, civil wars and coups, as groups struggled for the benefits of power. Diaz finally lost power to revolutionary forces in 1910. The Mexican Revolution was followed by others in Bolivia in 1952, Cuba in 1959, and Nicaragua in 1979. Meanwhile, sustained civil wars raged in Colombia, El Salvador, 
Guatemala, and Peru. Expropriation or the threat of expropriation of assets continued apace, with mass agrarian reforms, or attempted reforms, in Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Peru, and Venezuela. Revolutions, expropriations, and political instability came along with military governments and various types of dictatorships. Though there was also a gradual drift toward greater political rights, it was only in the 1990s that most Latin American countries became democracies, and even then they remain mired in instability. This instability was accompanied by mass repression and murder. The 1991 National Commission for Truth and Reconciliation report in Chile determined that 2,279 persons were killed for political reasons during the Pinochet dictatorship, between 1973 and 1990. Possibly 50,000 were imprisoned and tortured, and hundreds of thousands of people were fired from their jobs. The Guatemalan Commission for Historical Clarification Report in 1999 identified a total of 42,275 named victims, though others have claimed that as many as 200,000 were murdered in Guatemala. Between 1962 and 1996, 70,000 during the regime of General Efren Rios Montt, who was able to commit these crimes with such impunity that he could run for president in 2003. Fortunately he did not win. The National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons in Argentina put the number of people murdered by the military there, at 9,000 persons from 1976 to 1983, although it noted that the actual number could be higher. Estimates by human rights organizations usually place it at 30,000, making a billion or two. The enduring implications of the organization of colonial society, and those societies' institutional legacies shape the modern differences between the United States and Mexico, and thus the two parts of Nogales. The contrast between how Bill Gates and Carlos Slim became the two richest men in the world, Warren Buffett is also a contender, illustrates the forces at work. The rise of Gates and Microsoft is well known, but Gates's status as the world's richest person and the founder of one of the most technologically innovative companies, did not stop the U.S. Department of Justice from filing civil actions against the Microsoft Corporation on May 8, 1998, claiming that Microsoft had abused monopoly power. Particularly at issue was the way that Microsoft had tied its web browser, Internet Explorer, to its Windows operating system. The government had been keeping an eye on Gates for quite some time, and as early as 1991, the Federal Trade Commission had launched an inquiry into whether Microsoft was abusing its monopoly on PC operating systems. In November 2001, Microsoft reached a deal with the Justice Department. It had its wings clipped, even if the penalties were less than many demanded. In Mexico, Carlos Slim did not make his money by innovation. Initially he excelled in stock market deals, and in buying and revamping unprofitable firms. His major coup was the acquisition of Telmex, the Mexican telecommunications monopoly that was privatized by President Carlos Salinas in 1990. The government announced its intention to sell 51% of the voting stock, 20.4% of total stock, in the company in September 1989 and received bids in November 1990. Even though Slim did not put in the highest bid, a consortium led by his Grupo Corso won the auction. Instead of paying for the shares right away, Slim managed to delay payment, using the dividends of Telmex itself to pay for the stock. What was once a public monopoly now became Slim's monopoly, and it was hugely profitable. The economic institutions that made Carlos Slim who he is are very different from those in the United States. 
If you're a Mexican entrepreneur, entry barriers will play a crucial role at every stage of your career. These barriers include expensive licenses you have to obtain, red tape you have to cut through, politicians and incumbents who will stand in your way, and the difficulty of getting funding from a financial sector often in cahoots with the incumbents you're trying to compete against. These barriers can be either insurmountable, keeping you out of lucrative areas, or your greatest friend, keeping your competitors at bay. The difference between the two scenarios is of course whom you know and whom you can influence, and yes, whom you can bribe. Carlos Slim, a talented, ambitious man from a relatively modest background of Lebanese immigrants, has been a master at obtaining exclusive contracts. He managed to monopolize the lucrative telecommunications market in Mexico, and then to extend his reach to the rest of Latin America. There have been challenges to Slim's Telmex monopoly, but they have not been successful. In 1996 Avantel, a long-distance phone provider, petitioned the Mexican Competition Commission to check whether Telmex had a dominant position in the telecommunications market. In 1997 the commission declared that Telmex had substantial monopoly power with respect to local telephony, national long-distance calls, and international long-distance calls, among other things. But attempts by the regulatory authorities in Mexico to limit these monopolies have come to nothing. One reason is that Slim and Telmex can use what is known as a recurso de amparo, literally an appeal for protection. An amparo is in effect a petition to argue that a particular law does not apply to you. The idea of the amparo dates back to the Mexican Constitution of 1857 and was originally intended as a safeguard of individual rights and freedoms. In the hands of Telmex and other Mexican monopolies, however, it has become a formidable tool for cementing monopoly power. Rather than protecting people's rights, the Amparo provides a loophole in equality before the law. Slim has made his money in the Mexican economy in large part thanks to his political connections. When he has ventured into the United States, he has not been successful. In 1999 his group Ocaso bought the computer retailer CompUSA. At the time, CompUSA had given a franchise to a firm called COC Services to sell its merchandise in Mexico. Slim immediately violated this contract with the intention of setting up his own chain of stores, without any competition from COC. But COC sued CompUSA in a Dallas court. There are no amparos in Dallas, so Slim lost, and was fined. $454 million. The lawyer for COC, Mark Werner, noted afterward that, the message of this verdict is that in this global economy, firms have to respect the rules of the United States if they want to come here. When Slim was subject to the institutions of the United States, his usual tactics for making money didn't work. Toward a theory of world inequality. We live in an unequal world. The differences among nations are similar to those between the two parts of Nogales, just on a larger scale. In rich countries, individuals are healthier, live longer, and are much better educated. They also have access to a range of amenities and options in life from vacations to career paths, that people in poor countries can only dream of. People in rich countries also drive on roads without potholes, and enjoy toilets, electricity, and running water in their houses. They also typically have governments that do not arbitrarily arrest or harass them, on the contrary, the governments provide services, including education, healthcare, roads, and law and order. Notable, too, is the fact that the citizens vote in elections and have some voice in the political direction their countries take. The great differences in world inequality are evident to everyone, even to those in poor countries, 
though many lack access to television or the internet. It is the perception and reality of these differences that drive people to cross the Rio Grande or the Mediterranean Sea, illegally to have the chance to experience rich country living standards and opportunities. This inequality doesn't just have consequences for the lives of individual people in poor countries, it also causes grievances and resentment, with huge political consequences in the United States and elsewhere. Understanding why these differences exist and what causes them is our focus in this book. Developing such an understanding is not just an end in itself, but also a first step toward generating better ideas about how to improve the lives of billions who still live in poverty. The disparities on the two sides of the fence in Nogales are just the tip of the iceberg. As in the rest of northern Mexico, which benefits from trade with the United States, even if not all of it is legal, the residents of Nogales are more prosperous than other Mexicans, whose average annual household income is around $5,000. This greater relative prosperity of Nogales, Sonora, comes from Maculadora manufacturing plants centered in industrial parks, the first of which was started by Richard Campbell, Jr., a California basket manufacturer. The first tenant was Coin Art, a musical instrument company owned by Richard Boss, owner of the Artley Flute and Saxophone Company in Nogales, Arizona. Coin Art was followed by Memorex, Computer Wiring, Avent, Hospital Clothing, Grant, Sunglasses, Chamberlain, a manufacturer of garage door openers for Sears, and Samsonite, Suitcases. Significantly, all are U.S.-based businesses and businessmen, using U.S. capital and know-how. The greater prosperity of Nogales, Sonora, relative to the rest of Mexico, therefore, comes from outside. The differences between the United States and Mexico are in turn small compared with those across the entire globe. The average citizen of the United States is seven times as prosperous as the average Mexican and more than ten times as the resident of Peru or Central America. She is about twenty times as prosperous as the average inhabitant of Sub-Saharan Africa, and almost forty times as those living in the poorest African countries such as Mali, Ethiopia, and Sierra Leone. And it's not just the United States. There is a small but growing group of rich countries, mostly in Europe and North America, joined by Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, whose citizens enjoy very different lives from those of the inhabitants of the rest of the globe. The reason that Nogales, Arizona, is much richer than Nogales, Sonora, is simple. It is because of the very different institutions on the two sides of the border, which create very different incentives for the inhabitants of Nogales, Arizona, versus Nogales, Sonora. The United States is also far richer today than either Mexico or Peru because of the way its institutions, both economic and political, shape the incentives of businesses, individuals, and politicians. Each society functions with a set of economic and political rules created and enforced by the state and the citizens collectively. Economic institutions shape economic incentives, the incentives to become educated, to save and invest, to innovate and adopt new technologies, and so on. It is the political process that determines what economic institutions people live under. And it is the political institutions that determine how this process works. For example, it is the political institutions of a nation that determine the ability of citizens to control politicians and influence how they behave. This in turn determines whether politicians are agents of the citizens, albeit imperfect, or are able to abuse the power entrusted to them, or that they have usurped to amass their own fortunes and to pursue their own agendas, ones detrimental to those of the citizens. Political Institutions 
include but are not limited to written constitutions and to whether the society is a democracy. They include the power and capacity of the state to regulate and govern society. It is also necessary to consider more broadly the factors that determine how political power is distributed in society, particularly the ability of different groups to act collectively to pursue their objectives, or to stop other people from pursuing theirs. As institutions influence behavior and incentives in real life, they forge the success or failure of nations. Individual talent matters at every level of society, but even that needs an institutional framework to transform it into a positive force. Bill Gates, like other legendary figures in the information technology industry, such as Paul Allen, Steve Ballmer, Steve Jobs, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, and Jeff Bezos, had immense talent and ambition. But he ultimately responded to incentives. The schooling system in the United States enabled Gates and others like him to acquire a unique set of skills to complement their talents. The economic institutions in the United States enabled these men to start companies with ease, without facing insurmountable barriers. Those institutions also made the financing of their projects feasible. The U.S. labor markets enabled them to hire qualified personnel and the relatively competitive market environment enabled them to expand their companies and market their products. These entrepreneurs were confident from the beginning that their dream projects could be implemented. They trusted the institutions and the rule of law that these generated and they did not worry about the security of their property rights. Finally, the political institutions ensured stability and continuity. For one thing, they made sure that there was no risk of a dictator taking power and changing the rules of the game, expropriating their wealth, imprisoning them, or threatening their lives and livelihoods. They also made sure that no particular interest in society could warp the government in an economically disastrous direction, because political power was both limited and distributed sufficiently broadly that a set of economic institutions that created the incentives for prosperity could emerge. This book will show that while economic institutions are critical for determining whether a country is poor or prosperous, it is politics and political institutions that determine what economic institutions a country has. Ultimately the good economic institutions of the United States resulted from the political institutions that gradually emerged, after 1619. Our theory for world inequality shows how political and economic institutions interact in causing poverty or prosperity, and how different parts of the world ended up with such different sets of institutions. Our brief review of the history of the Americas begins to give a sense of the forces that shape political and economic institutions. Different patterns of institutions today are deeply rooted in the past because once society gets organized in a particular way, this tends to persist. We'll show that this fact comes from the way that political and economic institutions interact. This persistence and the forces that create it also explain why it is so difficult to remove world inequality, and to make poor countries prosperous. Though institutions are the key to the differences between the two Nogaleses and between Mexico and the United States, that doesn't mean there will be a consensus in Mexico to change institutions. There is no necessity for a society to develop or adopt the institutions that are best for economic growth, or the welfare of its citizens, because other institutions may be even better for those who control politics and political institutions. The powerful and the rest of society will often disagree about which set of institutions should remain in place and which ones should be changed. Carlos Slim would not have been happy to see his political connections disappear and the entry barriers protecting his businesses fizzle, no matter that the entry of new businesses would enrich millions of Mexicans. 
because there is no such consensus, what rules society ends up with is determined by politics, who has power and how this power can be exercised. Carlos Slim has the power to get what he wants. Bill Gates's power is far more limited. That's why our theory is about not just economics but also politics. It is about the effects of institutions on the success and failure of nations, thus the economics of poverty and prosperity, it is also about how institutions are determined and change over time and how they fail to change even when they create poverty and misery for millions, thus the politics of poverty and prosperity. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson Chapter 2 Theories That Don't Work Poor countries are poor not because of their geographies or cultures, or because their leaders do not know which policies will enrich their citizens. 2. Theories that don't work. The lay of the land. The focus of our book is on explaining world inequality and also some of the easily visible broad patterns that nest within it. The first country to experience sustained economic growth was England, or Great Britain, usually just Britain as the Union of England, Wales, and Scotland after 1707 is known. Growth emerged slowly in the second half of the 18th century as the Industrial Revolution, based on major technological breakthroughs and their application in industry, took root. Industrialization in England was soon followed by industrialization in most of Western Europe and the United States. English prosperity also spread rapidly to Britain's settler colonies of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. A list of the 30 richest countries today would include them, plus Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. The prosperity of these latter three is in turn part of a broader pattern in which many East Asian nations, including Taiwan and subsequently China, have experienced recent rapid growth. The bottom of the world income distribution paints as sharp and as distinctive a picture as the top. If you instead make a list of the poorest 30 countries in the world today, you will find almost all of them in sub-Saharan Africa. They are joined by countries such as Afghanistan, Haiti, and Nepal, which, though not in Africa, all share something critical with African nations, as we'll explain. If you went back 50 years, the countries in the top and bottom 30 wouldn't be greatly different. Singapore and South Korea would not be among the richest countries, and there would be several different countries in the bottom 30, but the overall picture that emerged would be remarkably consistent with what we see today. Go back 100 years, or 150, and you'd find nearly the same countries in the same groups. Map 3, opposite, shows the lay of the land in 2008. The countries shaded in the darkest color are the poorest in the world, those where average per capita incomes, called by economists GDP, gross domestic product, are less than $2,000 annually. Most of Africa is in this color, as are Afghanistan, Haiti, and parts of Southeast Asia, for example, Cambodia and Laos. North Korea is also among this group of countries. The countries in white are the richest, those with annual income per capita of $20,000 or more. Here we find the usual suspects, North America, Western Europe, Australasia, and Japan. Another interesting pattern can be discerned in the Americas. Make a list of the nations in the Americas from richest to poorest. You will find that at the top are the United States and Canada, followed by Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and Uruguay, and maybe also Venezuela, depending on the price of oil. After that you have Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and Peru. At the bottom there is another distinct, much poorer group, comprising Bolivia, 
Guatemala, and Paraguay. Go back 50 years, and you'll find an identical ranking. 100 years, same thing. 150 years, again the same. So it is not just that the United States and Canada are richer than Latin America. There is also a definite and persistent divide between the rich and poor nations within Latin America. A final interesting pattern is in the Middle East. There we find oil-rich nations such as Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, which have income levels close to those of our top 30. Yet if the oil price fell, they would quickly fall back down the table. Middle Eastern countries with little or no oil, such as Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, all cluster around a level of income similar to that of Guatemala or Peru. Without oil, Middle Eastern countries are also all poor, though, like those in Central America and the Andes, not so poor as those in Sub-Saharan Africa. While there is a lot of persistence in the patterns of prosperity we see around us today, these patterns are not unchanging or immutable. First, as we have already emphasized, most of current world inequality emerged since the late 18th century, following on the tales of the Industrial Revolution. Not only were gaps in prosperity much smaller as late as the middle of the 18th century, but the rankings which have been so stable since then are not the same when we go further back in history. In the Americas, for example, the ranking we see for the last 150 years was completely different 500 years ago. Second, many nations have experienced several decades of rapid growth, such as much of East Asia since the Second World War and, more recently, China. Many of these subsequently saw that growth go into reverse. Argentina, for example, grew rapidly for five decades up until 1920, becoming one of the richest countries in the world, but then started a long slide. The Soviet Union is an even more noteworthy example, growing rapidly between 1930 and 1970, but subsequently experiencing a rapid collapse. What explains these major differences in poverty and prosperity and the patterns of growth? Why did Western European nations and their colonial offshoots filled with European settlers start growing in the 19th century, scarcely looking back? What explains the persistent ranking of inequality within the Americas? Why have Sub-Saharan African and Middle Eastern nations failed to achieve the type of economic growth seen in Western Europe, while much of East Asia has experienced breakneck rates of economic growth? One might think that the fact that world inequality is so huge and consequential, and has such sharply drawn patterns would mean that it would have a well-accepted explanation. Not so. Most hypotheses that social scientists have proposed for the origins of poverty and prosperity just don't work and fail to convincingly explain the lay of the land. The Geography Hypothesis One widely accepted theory of the causes of world inequality is the Geography Hypothesis, which claims that the great divide between rich and poor countries is created by geographical differences. Many poor countries, such as those of Africa, Central America, and South Asia, are between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Rich nations, in contrast, tend to be in temperate latitudes. This geographic concentration of poverty and prosperity gives a superficial appeal to the geography hypothesis, which is the starting point of the theories and views of many social scientists and pundits alike but this doesn't make it any less wrong. As early as the late 18th century, the great French political philosopher Montesquieu noted the geographic concentration of prosperity and poverty, and proposed an explanation for it. He argued that people in tropical climates tended to be lazy and to lack inquisitiveness. As a consequence, they didn't work hard and were not innovative, and this was the reason why they were poor. 
Montesquieu also speculated that lazy people tended to be ruled by despots, suggesting that a tropical location could explain not just poverty but also some of the political phenomena associated with economic failure, such as dictatorship. The theory that hot countries are intrinsically poor, though contradicted by the recent rapid economic advance of countries such as Singapore, Malaysia, and Botswana, is still forcefully advocated by some, such as the economist Jeffrey Sachs. The modern version of this view emphasizes not the direct effects of climate on work effort or thought processes, but two additional arguments, first, that tropical diseases, particularly malaria, have very adverse consequences for health and therefore labor productivity, and second, that tropical soils do not allow for productive agriculture. The conclusion, though, is the same. Temperate climates have a relative advantage over tropical and semi-tropical areas. World inequality, however, cannot be explained by climate or diseases, or any version of the geography hypothesis. Just think of Nogales. What separates the two parts is not climate, geography, or disease environment, but the U.S.-Mexico border. If the geography hypothesis cannot explain differences between the north and south of Nogales, or north and south Korea, or those between east and west Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall, could it still be a useful theory for explaining differences between North and South America? Between Europe and Africa? Simply, no. History illustrates that there is no simple or enduring connection between climate or geography and economic success. For instance, it is not true that the tropics have always been poorer than temperate latitudes. As we saw in the last chapter, at the time of the conquest of the Americas by Columbus, the areas south of the Tropic of Cancer and north of the Tropic of Capricorn, which today include Mexico, Central America, Peru, and Bolivia, held the great Aztec and Inca civilizations. These empires were politically centralized and complex, built roads, and provided famine relief. The Aztecs had both money and writing, and the Incas, even though they lacked both these two key technologies, recorded vast amounts of information on knotted ropes called quipus. In sharp contrast, at the time of the Aztecs and Incas, the north and south of the area inhabited by the Aztecs and Incas, which today includes the United States, Canada, Argentina, and Chile, were mostly inhabited by Stone Age civilizations lacking these technologies. The tropics in the Americas were thus much richer than the temperate zones, suggesting that the obvious fact of tropical poverty is neither obvious nor a fact. Instead, the greater riches in the United States and Canada represent a stark reversal of fortune relative to what was there when the Europeans arrived. This reversal clearly had nothing to do with geography and, as we have already seen, something to do with the way these areas were colonized. This reversal was not confined to the Americas. People in South Asia, especially the Indian subcontinent, and in China were more prosperous than those in many other parts of Asia and certainly more than the peoples inhabiting Australia and New Zealand. This, too, was reversed, with South Korea, Singapore, and Japan emerging as the richest nations in Asia, and Australia and New Zealand surpassing almost all of Asia in terms of prosperity. Even within Sub-Saharan Africa there was a similar reversal. More recently, before the start of intense European contact with Africa, the Southern Africa region was the most sparsely settled and the farthest from having developed states with any kind of control over their territories. Yet South Africa is now one of the most prosperous nations in Sub-Saharan Africa. Further back in history we again see much prosperity in the tropics, some of the great pre-modern civilizations, such as Angkor in modern Cambodia, Vijayanagara in southern India, 
and Aksum in Ethiopia, flourished in the tropics, as did the great Indus Valley civilizations of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa in modern Pakistan. History thus leaves little doubt that there is no simple connection between a tropical location and economic success. Tropical diseases obviously cause much suffering and high rates of infant mortality in Africa, but they are not the reason Africa is poor. Disease is largely a consequence of poverty and of governments being unable or unwilling to undertake the public health measures necessary to eradicate them. England in the 19th century was also a very unhealthy place. But the government gradually invested in clean water, in the proper treatment of sewage and effluent, and, eventually, in an effective health service. Improved health and life expectancy were not the cause of England's economic success, but one of the fruits of its previous political and economic changes. The same is true for Nogales, Arizona. The other part of the geography hypothesis is that the tropics are poor because tropical agriculture is intrinsically unproductive. Tropical soils are thin and unable to maintain nutrients, the argument goes, and emphasizes how quickly these soils are eroded by torrential rains. There certainly is some merit in this argument, but as we'll show, the prime determinant of why agricultural productivity Agricultural output per acre is so low in many poor countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, has little to do with soil quality. Rather, it is a consequence of the ownership structure of the land and the incentives that are created for farmers by the governments and institutions under which they live. We will also show that world inequality cannot be explained by differences in agricultural productivity. The great inequality of the modern world that emerged in the 19th century was caused by the uneven dissemination of industrial technologies and manufacturing production. It was not caused by divergence in agricultural performance. Another influential version of the geography hypothesis is advanced by the ecologist and evolutionary biologist, Jared Diamond. He argues that the origins of intercontinental inequality at the start of the modern period, 500 years ago, rested in different historical endowments of plant and animal species, which subsequently influenced agricultural productivity. In some places, such as the Fertile Crescent in the modern Middle East, there were a large number of species that could be domesticated by humans. Elsewhere, such as the Americas, there were not. Having many species capable of being domesticated made it very attractive for societies to make the transition from a hunter-gatherer to a farming lifestyle. As a consequence, Farming developed earlier in the Fertile Crescent than in the Americas. Population density grew, allowing specialization of labor, trade, urbanization, and political development. Crucially, in places where farming dominated, technological innovation took place much more rapidly than in other parts of the world. Thus, according to Diamond, the differential availability of animal and plant species created differential intensities of farming, which led to different paths of technological change and prosperity across different continents. Though Diamond's thesis is a powerful approach to the puzzle on which he focuses, it cannot be extended to explain modern world inequality. For example, Diamond argues that the Spanish were able to dominate the civilizations of the Americas because of their longer history of farming, and consequent superior technology. But we now need to explain why the Mexicans and Peruvians inhabiting the former lands of the Aztecs and Incas are poor. While having access to wheat, barley, and horses might have made the Spanish richer than the Incas, the gap in incomes between the two was not very large. The average income of a Spaniard was probably less than double that of a citizen of the Inca Empire. 
Diamond's thesis implies that once the Incas had been exposed to all the species and resulting technologies, that they had not been able to develop themselves, they ought quickly to have attained the living standards of the Spanish. Yet nothing of the sort happened. On the contrary, in the 19th and 20th centuries, a much larger gap in incomes between Spain and Peru emerged. Today the average Spaniard is more than six times richer than the average Peruvian. This gap in incomes is closely connected to the uneven dissemination of modern industrial technologies, but this has little to do either with the potential for animal and plant domestication or with intrinsic agricultural productivity differences between Spain and Peru. While Spain, albeit with a lag, adopted the technologies of steam power, railroads, electricity, mechanization, and factory production, Peru did not, or at best did so very slowly and imperfectly. This technological gap persists today and reproduces itself on a bigger scale as new technologies, in particular those related to information technology, fuel further growth in many developed and some rapidly developing nations. Diamond's thesis does not tell us why these crucial technologies are not diffusing and equalizing incomes across the world and does not explain why the northern half of Nogales is so much richer than its twin just to the south of the fence, even though both were part of the same civilization 500 years ago. The story of Nogales highlights another major problem in adapting Diamond's thesis, as we have already seen. Whatever the drawbacks of the Inca and Aztec empires were in 1532, Peru and Mexico were undoubtedly more prosperous than those parts of the Americas that went on to become the United States and Canada. North America became more prosperous precisely because it enthusiastically adopted the technologies and advances of the Industrial Revolution. The population became educated and railways spread out across the Great Plains in stark contrast to what happened in South America. This cannot be explained by pointing to differential geographic endowments of North and South America, which, if anything, favored South America. Inequality in the modern world largely results from the uneven dissemination and adoption of technologies, and Diamond's thesis does include important arguments about this. For instance, he argues, following the historian William McNeil, that the East, West orientation of Eurasia enabled crops, animals, and innovations to spread from the Fertile Crescent into Western Europe, while the North, South orientation of the Americas accounts for why writing systems, which were created in Mexico, did not spread to the Andes or North America. Yet the orientation of continents cannot provide an explanation for today's world inequality. Consider Africa. Though the Sahara Desert did present a significant barrier to the movement of goods and ideas from the north to sub-Saharan Africa, this was not insurmountable. The Portuguese, and then other Europeans, sailed around the coast and eliminated differences in knowledge at a time when gaps in incomes were very small, compared with what they are today. Since then, Africa has not caught up with Europe, on the contrary, there is now a much larger income gap between most African and European countries. It should also be clear that Diamond's argument, which is about continental inequality, is not well equipped to explain variation within continents, an essential part of modern world inequality. For example, while the orientation of the Eurasian landmass might explain how England managed to benefit from the innovations of the Middle East, without having to reinvent them, it doesn't explain why the Industrial Revolution happened in England rather than, say, Moldova. In addition, as Diamond himself points out, China and India benefited greatly from very rich suites of animals and plants, and from the orientation of Eurasia. But most of the poor people of the world today are in those two countries. In fact, 
The best way to see the scope of Diamond's thesis is in terms of his own explanatory variables. Map 4, opposite, shows data on the distribution of Sus scrofa, the ancestor of the modern pig, and the aurochs, ancestor of the modern cow. Both species were widely distributed throughout Eurasia and even North Africa. Map 5, page 56, shows the distribution of some of the wild ancestors of modern domesticated crops. Such as Ariza sativa, the ancestor of Asian cultivated rice, and the ancestors of modern wheat and barley. It demonstrates that the wild ancestor of rice was distributed widely across South and Southeast Asia, while the ancestors of barley and wheat were distributed along a long arc from the Levant reaching through Iran and into Afghanistan and the cluster of Istans, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. These ancestral species are present in much of Eurasia. But their wide distribution suggests that inequality within Eurasia cannot be explained by a theory based on the incidence of the species. The geography hypothesis is not only unhelpful for explaining the origins of prosperity throughout history, and mostly incorrect in its emphasis, but also unable to account for the lay of the land we started this chapter with. One might argue that any persistent pattern, such as the hierarchy of incomes within the Americas or the sharp and long-ranging differences between Europe and the Middle East, can be explained by unchanging geography. But this is not so. We have already seen that the patterns within the Americas are highly unlikely to have been driven by geographical factors. Before 1492 it was the civilizations in the Central Valley of Mexico, Central America, and the Andes that had superior technology and living standards to North America or places such as Argentina and Chile. While the geography stayed the same, the institutions imposed by European colonists created a reversal of fortune. Geography is also unlikely to explain the poverty of the Middle East for similar reasons. After all, the Middle East led the world in the Neolithic Revolution, and the first towns developed in modern Iraq. Iron was first smelted in Turkey, and as late as the Middle Ages the Middle East was technologically dynamic. It was not the geography of the Middle East that made the Neolithic Revolution flourish in that part of the world, as we will see in Chapter 5, and it was, again, not geography that made the Middle East poor. Instead, it was the expansion and consolidation of the Ottoman Empire, and it is the institutional legacy of this empire that keeps the Middle East poor today. Finally, geographic factors are unhelpful for explaining not only the differences we see across various parts of the world today, but also why many nations such as Japan or China stagnate for long periods and then start a rapid growth process. We need another better theory. The culture hypothesis. The second widely accepted theory, the culture hypothesis, relates prosperity to culture. The culture hypothesis, just like the geography hypothesis, has a distinguished lineage, going back at least to the great German sociologist Max Weber who argued that the Protestant Reformation and the Protestant ethic it spurred played a key role in facilitating the rise of modern industrial society in Western Europe. The culture hypothesis no longer relies solely on religion, but stresses other types of beliefs, values, and ethics as well. Though it is not politically correct to articulate in public, Many people still maintain that Africans are poor because they lack a good work ethic, still believe in witchcraft and magic, or resist new Western technologies. Many also believe that Latin America will never be rich because its people are intrinsically profligate and impecunious, and because they suffer from some Iberian, or Manana a culture. Of course, Many once believed that the Chinese culture and Confucian values were inimical to economic growth, 
Though now the importance of the Chinese work ethic as the engine of growth in China, Hong Kong, and Singapore is trumpeted. Is the culture hypothesis useful for understanding world inequality? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that social norms, which are related to culture, matter and can be hard to change, and they also sometimes support institutional differences, this book's explanation for world inequality. But mostly no, because those aspects of culture often emphasized, religion, national ethics, African or Latin values, are just not important for understanding how we got here and why the inequalities in the world persist. Other aspects, such as the extent to which people trust each other or are able to cooperate, are important but they are mostly an outcome of institutions, not an independent cause. Let us go back to Nogales. As we noted earlier, many aspects of culture are the same north and south of the fence. Nevertheless, there may be some marked differences in practices, norms, and values, though these are not causes but outcomes of the two places' divergent development paths. For example, in surveys Mexicans typically say they trust other people less than the citizens of the United States say they trust others. But it is not a surprise that Mexicans lack trust when their government cannot eliminate drug cartels or provide a functioning, unbiased legal system. The same is true with North and South Korea, as we discuss in the next chapter. The South is one of the richest countries in the world, while the North grapples with periodic famine and abject poverty. While a culture is very different between the South and the North today, it played no role in causing the diverging economic fortunes of these two half-nations. The Korean Peninsula has a long period of common history. Before the Korean War and the division at the 38th parallel, it had an unprecedented homogeneity in terms of language, ethnicity, and culture. Just as in Nogales, what matters is the border. To the north is a different regime, imposing different institutions, creating different incentives. Any difference in culture between south and north of the border cutting through the two parts of Nogales or the two parts of Korea, is thus not a cause of the differences in prosperity but, rather, a consequence. What about Africa and African culture? Historically, Sub-Saharan Africa was poorer than most other parts of the world, and its ancient civilizations did not develop the wheel, writing, with the exception of Ethiopia and Somalia, or the plow. Though these technologies were not widely used until the advent of formal European colonization in the late 19th and early 20th century, African societies knew about them much earlier. Europeans began sailing around the west coast in the late 15th century, and Asians were continually sailing to East Africa from much earlier times. We can understand why these technologies were not adopted from the history of the Kingdom of Congo at the mouth of the Congo River, which has given its name to the modern Democratic Republic of Congo. Map 6, Opposite shows where the Congo was along with another important Central African state, the Cuba Kingdom, which we discuss later in the book. Congo came into intense contact with the Portuguese after it was first visited by the mariner Diogo Chao in 1483. At the time, Congo was a highly centralized polity by African standards, whose capital, Banza, had a population of 60,000 which made it about the same size as the Portuguese capital of Lisbon and larger than London, which had a population of about 50,000 in 1500. The King of Congo, Nzinga Nkowu, converted to Catholicism and changed his name to João I. Later Mbanza's name was changed to São Salvador. Thanks to the Portuguese, the Congolese learned about the wheel and the plough and the Portuguese even encouraged their adoption with agricultural missions in 1491 and 1512. But all these initiatives failed. Still, 
the Congolese were far from averse to modern technologies in general. They were very quick to adopt one venerable Western innovation, the gun. They used this new and powerful tool to respond to market incentives, to capture and export slaves. There is no sign here that African values or culture prevented the adoption of new technologies and practices. As their contacts with Europeans deepened, the Congolese adopted other Western practices, literacy, dress styles, and house designs. In the 19th century, many African societies also took advantage of the rising economic opportunities created by the Industrial Revolution by changing their production patterns. In West Africa there was rapid economic development based on the export of palm oil and ground nuts. Throughout Southern Africa, Africans developed exports to the rapidly expanding industrial and mining areas of the Rand in South Africa. Yet these promising economic experiments were obliterated not by African culture or the inability of ordinary Africans to act in their own self-interest, but first by European colonialism and then by post-independence African governments. The real reason that the Congolese did not adopt superior technology was because they lacked any incentives to do so. They faced a high risk of all their output being expropriated and taxed by the all-powerful king, whether or not he had converted to Catholicism. In fact, it wasn't only their property that was insecure. Their continued existence was held by a thread. Many of them were captured and sold as slaves, hardly the environment to encourage investment to increase long-term productivity. Neither did the king have incentives to adopt the plow on a large scale or to make increasing agricultural productivity his main priority. Exporting slaves was so much more profitable. It might be true today that Africans trust each other less than people in other parts of the world. But this is an outcome of a long history of institutions which have undermined human and property rights in Africa. The potential to be captured and sold as a slave no doubt influenced the extent to which Africans trusted others historically. What about Max Weber's Protestant ethic? Though it may be true that predominantly Protestant countries, such as the Netherlands and England, were the first economic successes of the modern era, there is little relationship between religion and economic success. France, a predominantly Catholic country, quickly mimicked the economic performance of the Dutch and English in the 19th century, and Italy is as prosperous as any of these nations today. Looking farther east, you'll see that none of the economic successes of East Asia have anything to do with any form of Christian religion, so there is not much support for a special relationship between Protestantism and economic success there, either. Let's turn to a favorite area for the enthusiasts of the culture hypothesis, the Middle East. Middle Eastern countries are primarily Islamic and the non-oil producers among them are very poor, as we have already noted. Oil producers are richer, but this windfall of wealth has done little to create diversified modern economies in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. Don't these facts show convincingly that religion matters? Though plausible, this argument is not right, either. Yes, countries such as Syria and Egypt are poor and their populations are primarily Muslim. But these countries also systemically differ in other ways that are far more important for prosperity. For one, they were all provinces of the Ottoman Empire, which heavily, and adversely, shaped the way they developed. After Ottoman rule collapsed, the Middle East was absorbed into the English and French colonial empires, which, again, stunted their possibilities. After independence, they followed much of the former colonial world by developing hierarchical, authoritarian political regimes with few of the political and economic institutions that, we will argue, are crucial for generating economic success. 
This development path was forged largely by the history of Ottoman and European rule. The relationship between the Islamic religion and poverty in the Middle East is largely spurious. The role of these historical events, rather than cultural factors, in shaping the Middle East's economic trajectory is also seen in the fact that the parts of the Middle East that temporarily broke away from the hold of the Ottoman Empire and the European powers, such as Egypt between 1805 and 1848 under Muhammad Ali, could embark on a path of rapid economic change. Muhammad Ali usurped power following the withdrawal of the French forces that had occupied Egypt under Napoleon Bonaparte. Exploiting the weakness of the Ottoman hold over the Egyptian territory at the time, he was able to found his own dynasty, which would, in one form or another, rule until the Egyptian revolution under Nasser in 1952. Muhammad Ali's reforms, though coercive, did bring growth to Egypt as the state bureaucracy, the army, and the tax system were modernized and there was growth in agriculture and industry. Nevertheless, this process of modernization and growth came to an end after Ali's death, as Egypt fell under European influence. But perhaps this is the wrong way to think about culture. Maybe the cultural factors that matter are not tied to religion but rather to particular, national cultures. Perhaps it is the influence of English culture that is important and explains why countries such as the United States, Canada, and Australia are so prosperous? Though this idea sounds initially appealing, it doesn't work, either. Yes, Canada and the United States were English colonies, but so were Sierra Leone and Nigeria. The variation in prosperity within former English colonies is as great as that in the entire world. The English legacy is not the reason for the success of North America. There is yet one more version of the culture hypothesis, perhaps it is not English versus non-English that matters but, rather, European versus non-European. Could it be that Europeans are superior somehow because of their work ethic, outlook on life, Judeo-Christian values, or Roman heritage? It is true that Western Europe and North America, filled primarily by people of European descent, are the most prosperous parts of the world. Perhaps it is the superior European cultural legacy that is at the root of prosperity, and the last refuge of the culture hypothesis. Alas, this version of the culture hypothesis has as little explanatory potential as the others. A greater proportion of the population of Argentina and Uruguay, compared with the population of Canada and the United States, is of European descent, but Argentina's and Uruguay's economic performance leaves much to be desired. Japan and Singapore never had more than a sprinkling of inhabitants of European descent, yet they are as prosperous as many parts of Western Europe. China, despite many imperfections in its economic and political system, has been the most rapidly growing nation of the past three decades. Chinese poverty until Mao Zedong's death had nothing to do with Chinese culture. It was due to the disastrous way Mao organized the economy and conducted politics. In the 1950s, he promoted the Great Leap Forward, a drastic industrialization policy that led to mass starvation and famine. In the 1960s, he propagated the Cultural Revolution, which led to the mass persecution of intellectuals and educated people, anyone whose party loyalty might be doubted. This again led to terror and a huge waste of the society's talent and resources. In the same way, current Chinese growth has nothing to do with Chinese values or changes in Chinese culture. It results from a process of economic transformation unleashed by the reforms implemented by Deng Xiaoping and his allies, who, after Mao Zedong's death, gradually abandoned socialist economic policies and institutions first in agriculture and then in industry. 
Just like the geography hypothesis, the culture hypothesis is also unhelpful for explaining other aspects of the lay of the land around us today. There are of course differences in beliefs, cultural attitudes, and values between the United States and Latin America, but just like those that exist between Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, or those between South and North Korea. These differences are a consequence of the two places' different institutions and institutional histories. Cultural factors that emphasize how a Hispanic or a Latin culture molded the Spanish Empire can't explain the differences within Latin America, for example, why Argentina and Chile are more prosperous than Peru and Bolivia. Other types of cultural arguments, for instance, those that stress contemporary indigenous culture, fare equally badly. Argentina and Chile have few indigenous people compared with Peru and Bolivia. Though this is true, indigenous culture as an explanation does not work, either. Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru have similar income levels, but Colombia has very few indigenous people today, while Ecuador and Peru have many. Finally, cultural attitudes, which are in general slow to change, are unlikely to account by themselves for the growth miracles in East Asia and China. Though institutions are persistent, too, in certain circumstances they do change rapidly, as we'll see. The Ignorance Hypothesis The final popular theory for why some nations are poor and some are rich is the Ignorance Hypothesis which asserts that world inequality exists because we or our rulers do not know how to make poor countries rich. This idea is the one held by most economists, who take their cue from the famous definition proposed by the English economist Lionel Robbins in 1935 that Economics is a science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. It is then a small step to conclude that the science of economics should focus on the best use of scarce means to satisfy social ends. Indeed, the most famous theoretical result in economics, the so-called first welfare theorem, identifies the circumstances under which the allocation of resources in a market economy is socially desirable from an economic point of view. A market economy is an abstraction that is meant to capture a situation in which all individuals and firms can freely produce, buy, and sell any products or services that they wish. When these circumstances are not present there is a market failure. Such failures provide the basis for a theory of world inequality, since the more that market failures go unaddressed, the poorer a country is likely to be. The ignorance hypothesis maintains that poor countries are poor because they have a lot of market failures and because economists and policymakers do not know how to get rid of them and have heeded the wrong advice in the past. Rich countries are rich because they have figured out better policies and have successfully eliminated these failures. Could the ignorance hypothesis explain world inequality? Could it be that African countries are poorer than the rest of the world because their leaders tend to have the same mistaken views of how to run their countries, leading to the poverty there, while Western European leaders are better informed or better advised, which explains their relative success? While there are famous examples of leaders adopting disastrous policies because they were mistaken about those policies' consequences. Ignorance can explain at best a small part of world inequality. On the face of it, the sustained economic decline that soon set in in Ghana after independence from Britain was caused by ignorance. The British economist Tony Killick, then working as an advisor for the government of Kwame Krumah, recorded many of the problems in great detail. Krumah's policies focused on developing state industry, which turned out to be very inefficient. Killick recalled, The footwear factory, that would have linked the meat factory in the north through transportation of the hides to the south, for a distance of over 500 miles, 
to a tannery, now abandoned. The leather was to have been backhauled to the footwear factory in Kamasi, in the center of the country and about 200 miles north of the tannery. Since the major footwear market is in the Accra metropolitan area, the shoes would then have to be transported an additional 200 miles back to the south. Killick somewhat understatedly remarks that this was an enterprise whose viability was undermined by poor siding. The footwear factory was one of many such projects, joined by the mango canning plant situated in a part of Ghana which did not grow mangoes, and whose output was to be more than the entire world demand for the product. This endless stream of economically irrational developments was not caused by the fact that Krumah or his advisors were badly informed, or ignorant of the right economic policies. They had people like Killick and had even been advised by Nobel laureate Sir Arthur Lewis, who knew the policies were not good. What drove the form the economic policies took was the fact that Krumah needed to use them to buy political support and sustain his undemocratic regime. Neither Ghana's disappointing performance after independence nor the countless other cases of apparent economic mismanagement can simply be blamed on ignorance. After all, if ignorance were the problem, well, meaning leaders would quickly learn what types of policies increased their citizens' incomes and welfare, and would gravitate toward those policies. Consider the divergent paths of the United States and Mexico. Blaming this disparity on the ignorance of the leaders of the two nations is, at best, highly implausible. It wasn't differences in knowledge or intentions between John Smith and Cortez that laid the seeds of divergence during the colonial period, and it wasn't differences in knowledge between later U.S. presidents, such as Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson and Porfirio Diaz that made Mexico choose economic institutions that enriched elites at the expense of the rest of society. At the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries while Roosevelt and Wilson did the opposite. Rather, it was the differences in the institutional constraints the country's presidents and elites were facing. Similarly, Leaders of African nations that have languished over the last half-century under insecure property rights and economic institutions, impoverishing much of their populations, did not allow this to happen because they thought it was good economics. They did so because they could get away with it and enrich themselves at the expense of the rest, or because they thought it was good politics, a way of keeping themselves in power by buying the support of crucial groups or elites. The experience of Ghana's Prime Minister in 1971, Kofi Bija, illustrates how misleading the ignorance hypothesis can be. Bija faced a dangerous economic crisis. After coming to power in 1969, he, like Kruma before him, pursued unsustainable expansionary economic policies and maintained various price controls through marketing boards and an overvalued exchange rate. Though Bija had been an opponent of Kruma, and led a democratic government, he faced many of the same political constraints. As with Kruma, his economic policies were adopted not because he was ignorant, and believed that these policies were good economics or an ideal way to develop the country. The policies were chosen because they were good politics, enabling Bija to transfer resources to politically powerful groups, for example in urban areas, who needed to be kept contented. Price controls squeezed agriculture, delivering cheap food to the urban constituencies and generating revenues to finance government spending. But these controls were unsustainable. Ghana was soon suffering from a series of balance of payment crises and foreign exchange shortages. Faced with these dilemmas, on December 27, 1971, Bija signed an agreement with the International Monetary Fund that included a massive devaluation of the currency. The IMF, the World Bank, 
and the entire international community put pressure on Bija to implement the reforms contained in the agreement. Though the international institutions were blissfully unaware, Bija knew he was taking a huge political gamble. The immediate consequence of the currency's devaluation was rioting and discontent in Accra, Ghana's capital. That mounted uncontrollably until Bija was overthrown by the military, led by Lt. Col. Achempong, who immediately reversed the devaluation. The ignorance hypothesis differs from the geography and culture hypotheses in that it comes readily, with a suggestion about how to solve the problem of poverty, if ignorance got us here. Enlightened and informed rulers and policymakers can get us out and we should be able to engineer prosperity around the world by providing the right advice and by convincing politicians of what is good economics. Yet Bush's experience underscores the fact that the main obstacle to the adoption of policies that would reduce market failures and encourage economic growth is not the ignorance of politicians but the incentives and constraints they face from the political and economic institutions in their societies. Although the ignorance hypothesis still rules supreme among most economists and in Western policymaking circles, which, almost to the exclusion of anything else, focus on how to engineer prosperity, it is just another hypothesis that doesn't work. It explains neither the origins of prosperity around the world nor the lay of the land around us, for example, why some nations, such as Mexico and Peru, but not the United States or England, adopted institutions and policies that would impoverish the majority of their citizens, or why almost all sub-Saharan Africa and most of Central America are so much poorer than Western Europe or East Asia. When nations break out of institutional patterns condemning them to poverty and manage to embark on a path to economic growth, this is not because their ignorant leaders suddenly have become better informed or less self-interested or because they've received advice from better economists. China, for example, is one of the countries that made the switch from economic policies that caused poverty and the starvation of millions to those encouraging economic growth. But, as we will discuss in greater detail later, this did not happen because the Chinese Communist Party finally understood that the collective ownership of agricultural land and industry created terrible economic incentives. Instead, Deng Xiaoping and his allies, who were no less self-interested than their rivals but who had different interests and political objectives, defeated their powerful opponents in the Communist Party and masterminded a political revolution of sorts radically changing the leadership and direction of the party. Their economic reforms, which created market incentives in agriculture and then subsequently in industry, followed from this political revolution. It was politics that determined the switch from communism and toward market incentives in China, not better advice or a better understanding of how the economy worked. We will argue that to understand world inequality we have to understand why some societies are organized in very inefficient and socially undesirable ways. Nations sometimes do manage to adopt efficient institutions and achieve prosperity, but alas, these are the rare cases. Most economists and policymakers have focused on getting it right while what is really needed is an explanation for why poor nations get it wrong. Getting it wrong is mostly not about ignorance or culture. As we will show, poor countries are poor because those who have power make choices that create poverty. They get it wrong not by mistake or ignorance but on purpose. To understand this, you have to go beyond economics and expert advice on the best thing to do and, Instead, study how decisions actually get made, who gets to make them, and why those people decide to do what they do. This is the study of politics and political processes. Traditionally economics has ignored politics, 
but understanding politics is crucial for explaining world inequality. As the economist Abba Lerner noted in the 1970s, economics has gained the title queen of the social sciences by choosing solved political problems as its domain. We will argue that achieving prosperity depends on solving some basic political problems. It is precisely because economics has assumed that political problems are solved that it has not been able to come up with a convincing explanation for world inequality. Explaining world inequality still needs economics to understand how different types of policies and social arrangements affect economic incentives and behavior. But it also needs politics. Why Nations Fail the Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson Chapter 3 The Making of Prosperity and Poverty How Prosperity and Poverty Are Determined by the Incentives Created by Institutions and How Politics Determines What Institutions a Nation Has The Making of Prosperity and Poverty the Economics of the 38th Parallel In the summer of 1945, as the Second World War was drawing to a close, the Japanese colony in Korea began to collapse. Within a month of Japan's August 15 unconditional surrender, Korea was divided at the 38th Parallel into two spheres of influence. The South was administered by the United States. The North, by Russia. The uneasy peace of the Cold War was shattered in June 1950 when the North Korean army invaded the South. Though initially the North Koreans made large inroads, capturing the capital city, Seoul, by the autumn, they were in full retreat. It was then that Huang Pyongwan and his brother were separated. Huang Pyongwan managed to hide and avoid being drafted into the North Korean army. He stayed in the South and worked as a pharmacist. His brother, a doctor working in Seoul treating wounded soldiers from the South Korean Army, was taken north as the North Korean Army retreated. Dragged apart in 1950, they met again in 2000 in Seoul for the first time in 50 years, after the two governments finally agreed to initiate a limited program of family reunification. As a doctor, Huang Pyongwan's brother had ended up working for the Air Force, a good job in a military dictatorship. But even those with privileges in North Korea don't do that well. When the brothers met, Huang Pyongwan asked about how life was north of the 38th parallel. He had a car, but his brother didn't. Do you have a telephone? he asked his brother. No, said his brother. My daughter, who works at the foreign ministry, has a phone, but if you don't know the code you can't call. Huang Pyongwan recalled how all the people from the north at the reunion were asking for money, so he offered some to his brother. But his brother said, if I go back with money the government will say, give that money to us, so keep it. Huang Pyongwan noticed his brother's coat was threadbare take off that coat and leave it, and when you go back wear this one, he suggested. I can't do that, his brother replied. This is just borrowed from the government to come here. Huang Pyongwan recalled how when they parted, his brother was ill at ease and always nervous as though someone were listening. He was poorer than Huang Pyongwan imagined. His brother said he lived well, but Huang Pyong one thought he looked awful and was thin as a rake. The people of South Korea have living standards similar to those of Portugal and Spain. To the north, in the so-called Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea, living standards are akin to those of a sub-Saharan African country, about one-tenth of average living standards in South Korea. The health of North Koreans is in an even worse state, the average North Korean can expect to live 10 years less than his cousins south of the 38th parallel. Map 7, 
page 72, illustrates in a dramatic way the economic gap between the Koreas. It plots data on the intensity of light at night from satellite images. North Korea is almost completely dark due to lack of electricity, South Korea is blazing with light. These striking differences are not ancient. In fact, they did not exist prior to the end of the Second World War. But after 1945, the different governments in the North and the South adopted very different ways of organizing their economies. South Korea was led, and its early economic and political institutions were shaped, by the Harvard and Princeton, educated, staunchly anti-communist Syngman Rhee, with significant support from the United States. Rhee was elected president in 1948. Forged in the midst of the Korean War and against the threat of communism spreading to the south of the 38th parallel, South Korea was no democracy. Both Rhee and his equally famous successor, General Park Chung-hee, secured their places in history as authoritarian presidents. But both governed a market economy where private property was recognized, and after 1961, Park effectively threw the weight of the state behind rapid economic growth, channeling credit and subsidies to firms that were successful. The situation north of the 38th parallel was different. Kim Il-sung, a leader of anti-Japanese communist partisans during the Second World War, established himself as dictator by 1947 and, with the help of the Soviet Union, introduced a rigid form of centrally planned economy as part of the so-called Jewish system. Private property was outlawed, and markets were banned. Freedoms were curtailed not only in the marketplace, but in every sphere of North Koreans' lives, except for those who happened to be part of the very small ruling elite around Kim Il-sung and, later, his son and successor Kim Jong-il. It should not surprise us that the economic fortunes of South and North Korea diverged sharply. Kim Il-sung's command economy and the Jewish system soon proved to be a disaster. Detailed statistics are not available from North Korea, which is a secretive state, to say the least. Nonetheless, Available evidence confirms what we know from the all-too-often recurring famines. Not only did industrial production fail to take off, but North Korea in fact experienced a collapse in agricultural productivity. Lack of private property meant that few people had incentives to invest or to exert effort to increase or even maintain productivity. The stifling, repressive regime was inimical to innovation and the adoption of new technologies. But Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and their cronies had no intention of reforming the system, or introducing private property, markets, private contracts, or changing economic and political institutions. North Korea continues to stagnate economically. Meanwhile, in the South, economic institutions encouraged investment and trade. South Korean politicians invested in education, achieving high rates of literacy and schooling. South Korean companies were quick to take advantage of the relatively educated population. The policies encouraging investment and industrialization, exports, and the transfer of technology. South Korea quickly became one of East Asia's miracle economies, one of the most rapidly growing nations in the world. By the late 1990s, in just about half a century, South Korean growth and North Korean stagnation led to a tenfold gap between the two halves of this once united country. Imagine what a difference a couple of centuries could make. The economic disaster of North Korea which led to the starvation of millions, when placed against the South Korean economic success, is striking. Neither culture nor geography nor ignorance can explain the divergent paths of North and South Korea. We have to look at institutions for an answer. Extractive and Inclusive Economic Institutions 
Countries differ in their economic success because of their different institutions, the rules influencing how the economy works, and the incentives that motivate people. Imagine teenagers in North and South Korea and what they expect from life. Those in the North grow up in poverty, without entrepreneurial initiative, creativity, or adequate education to prepare them for skilled work. Much of the education they receive at school is pure propaganda, meant to shore up the legitimacy of the regime. There are few books, let alone computers. After finishing school, everyone has to go into the army for 10 years. These teenagers know that they will not be able to own property, start a business, or become more prosperous even if many people engage illegally in private economic activities to make a living. They also know that they will not have legal access to markets where they can use their skills or their earnings to purchase the goods they need and desire. They are even unsure about what kind of human rights they will have. Those in the South obtain a good education and face incentives that encourage them to exert effort and excel in their chosen vocation. South Korea is a market economy built on private property. South Korean teenagers know that, if successful as entrepreneurs or workers, they can one day enjoy the fruits of their investments and efforts, they can improve their standard of living and buy cars, houses, and health care. In the South the state supports economic activity. So it is possible for entrepreneurs to borrow money from banks and financial markets for foreign companies to enter into partnerships with South Korean firms, for individuals to take up mortgages to buy houses. In the South, by and large, you are free to open any business you like. In the North, you are not. In the South, you can hire workers, sell your products or services, and spend your money in the marketplace in whichever way you want. In the North, there are only black markets. These different rules are the institutions under which North and South Koreans live. Inclusive economic institutions, such as those in South Korea or in the United States, are those that allow and encourage participation by the great mass of people in economic activities that make best use of their talents and skills and that enable individuals to make the choices they wish. To be inclusive, economic institutions must feature secure private property, an unbiased system of law, and a provision of public services that provides a level playing field in which people can exchange and contract. It also must permit the entry of new businesses and allow people to choose their careers. The contrast of South and North Korea, and of the United States and Latin America, illustrates a general principle. Inclusive economic institutions foster economic activity, productivity growth, and economic prosperity. Secure private property rights are central, since only those with such rights will be willing to invest and increase productivity. A businessman who expects his output to be stolen, expropriated, or entirely taxed away will have little incentive to work let alone any incentive to undertake investments and innovations. But such rights must exist for the majority of people in society. In 1680 the English government conducted a census of the population of its West Indian colony of Barbados. The census revealed that of the total population on the island of around 60,000, Almost 39,000 were African slaves who were the property of the remaining one-third of the population. Indeed, they were mostly the property of the largest 175 sugar planters, who also owned most of the land. These large planters had secure and well-enforced property rights over their land and even over their slaves. If one planter wanted to sell slaves to another, he could do so and expect a court to enforce such a sale or any other contract he wrote. Why? Of the forty judges and justices of the peace on the island, twenty-nine of them were large planters. Also, 
the eight most senior military officials were all large planters. Despite well-defined, secure, and enforced property rights and contracts for the island's elite, Barbados did not have inclusive economic institutions, since two-thirds of the population were slaves with no access to education or economic opportunities, and no ability or incentive to use their talents or skills. Inclusive economic institutions require secure property rights and economic opportunities not just for the elite, but for a broad cross-section of society. Secure property rights, the law, public services, and the freedom to contract and exchange all rely on the state, the institution with the coercive capacity to impose order, prevent theft and fraud, and enforce contracts between private parties. To function well, society also needs other public services, roads and a transport network so that goods can be transported, a public infrastructure so that economic activity can flourish, and some type of basic regulation to prevent fraud and malfeasance. Though many of these public services can be provided by markets and private citizens, the degree of coordination necessary to do so on a large scale often eludes all but a central authority. The state is thus inexorably intertwined with economic institutions, as the enforcer of law and order, private property, and contracts, and often as a key provider of public services. Inclusive economic institutions need and use the state. The economic institutions of North Korea or of colonial Latin America. The Mita, Encomienda, or Repartimiento described earlier, do not have these properties. Private property is non existent in North Korea. In colonial Latin America, there was private property for Spaniards, but the property of the indigenous peoples was highly insecure. In neither type of society was the vast mass of people able to make the economic decisions they wanted to, they were subject to mass coercion. In neither type of society was the power of the state used to provide key public services that promoted prosperity. In North Korea, the state built an education system to inculcate propaganda, but was unable to prevent famine. In colonial Latin America, the state focused on coercing indigenous peoples. In neither type of society was there a level playing field or an unbiased legal system. In North Korea, the legal system is an arm of the ruling Communist Party, and in Latin America it was a tool of discrimination against the mass of people. We call such institutions, which have opposite properties to those we call inclusive, extractive economic institutions, extractive because such institutions are designed to extract incomes and wealth from one subset of society, to benefit a different subset. Engines of Prosperity Inclusive economic institutions create inclusive markets, which not only give people freedom to pursue the vocations in life that best suit their talents but also provide a level playing field that gives them the opportunity to do so. Those who have good ideas will be able to start businesses, workers will tend to go to activities where their productivity is greater, and less efficient firms can be replaced by more efficient ones. Contrast how people choose their occupations under inclusive markets to colonial Peru and Bolivia, where under the Mita, many were forced to work in silver and mercury mines, regardless of their skills or whether they wanted to. Inclusive markets are not just free markets. Barbados in the 17th century also had markets. But in the same way that it lacked property rights for all but the narrow planter elite, its markets were far from inclusive. Markets in slaves were in fact one part of the economic institutions systematically coercing the majority of the population and robbing them of the ability to choose their occupations and how they should utilize their talents. Inclusive economic institutions also pave the way for two other engines of prosperity, technology and education. 
Sustained economic growth is almost always accompanied by technological improvements that enable people, labor, land, and existing capital, buildings, existing machines, and so on, to become more productive. Think of our great-great-grandparents, just over a century ago, who did not have access to planes or automobiles or most of the drugs and healthcare we now take for granted, not to mention indoor plumbing, air conditioning, shopping malls, radio, or motion pictures, let alone information technology, robotics, or computer-controlled machinery. And going back a few more generations, the technological know-how and living standards were even more backward, so much so that we would find it hard to imagine how most people struggled through life. These improvements follow from science and from entrepreneurs such as Thomas Edison, who applied science to create profitable businesses. This process of innovation is made possible by economic institutions that encourage private property, uphold contracts, create a level playing field, and encourage and allow the entry of new businesses that can bring new technologies to life. It should therefore be no surprise that it was U.S. society, not Mexico or Peru, that produced Thomas Edison, and that it was South Korea, not North Korea, that today produces technologically innovative companies such as Samsung and Hyundai. Intimately linked to technology are the education, skills, competencies, and know-how of the workforce, acquired in schools, at home, and on the job. We are so much more productive than a century ago not just because of better technology embodied in machines, but also because of the greater know-how that workers possess. All the technology in the world would be of little use without workers who knew how to operate it. But there is more to skills and competencies than just the ability to run machines. It is the education and skills of the workforce that generate the scientific knowledge upon which our progress is built, and that enable the adaptation and adoption of these technologies in diverse lines of business. Though we saw in Chapter 1 that many of the innovators of the Industrial Revolution and afterward, like Thomas Edison, were not highly educated, these innovations were much simpler than modern technology. Today technological change requires education both for the innovator and the worker. And here we see the importance of economic institutions that create a level playing field. The United States could produce, or attract from foreign lands, the likes of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Sergey Brin, Larry Page and Jeff Bezos, and the hundreds of scientists who made fundamental discoveries in information technology, nuclear power, biotech, and other fields upon which these entrepreneurs built their businesses. The supply of talent was there to be harnessed because most teenagers in the United States have access to as much schooling as they wish, or are capable of attaining. Now imagine a different society for example the Congo or Haiti, where a large fraction of the population has no means of attending school, or where, if they manage to go to school, the quality of teaching is lamentable, where teachers do not show up for work, and even if they do, there may not be any books. The low education level of poor countries is caused by economic institutions that fail to create incentives for parents to educate their children and by political institutions that fail to induce the government to build, finance, and support schools and the wishes of parents and children. The price these nations pay for low education of their population and lack of inclusive markets is high. They fail to mobilize their nascent talent. They have many potential Bill Gateses and perhaps one or two Albert Einsteins who are now working as poor uneducated farmers, being coerced to do what they don't want to do or being drafted into the army, because they never had the opportunity to realize their vocation in life. The ability of economic institutions to harness the potential of inclusive markets, encourage technological innovation, invest in people, 
and mobilize the talents and skills of a large number of individuals is critical for economic growth. Explaining why so many economic institutions fail to meet these simple objectives is the central theme of this book. Extractive and Inclusive Political Institutions All economic institutions are created by society. Those of North Korea, for example, were forced on its citizens by the communists who took over the country in the 1940s, while those of colonial Latin America were imposed by Spanish conquistadors. South Korea ended up with very different economic institutions than the North because different people with different interests and objectives made the decisions about how to structure society. In other words, South Korea had different politics. Politics is the process by which a society chooses the rules that will govern it. Politics surrounds institutions for the simple reason that while inclusive institutions may be good for the economic prosperity of a nation, some people or groups, such as the elite of the Communist Party of North Korea or the sugar planters of colonial Barbados, will be much better off by setting up institutions that are extractive. When there is conflict over institutions, what happens depends on which people or group wins out in the game of politics, who can get more support, obtain additional resources, and form more effective alliances. In short, who wins depends on the distribution of political power in society. The political institutions of a society are a key determinant of the outcome of this game. They are the rules that govern incentives in politics. They determine how the government is chosen and which part of the government has the right to do what. Political institutions determine who has power in society and to what ends that power can be used. If the distribution of power is narrow and unconstrained, then the political institutions are absolutist as exemplified by the absolutist monarchies reigning throughout the world during much of history. Under absolutist political institutions such as those in North Korea and colonial Latin America, those who can wield this power will be able to set up economic institutions to enrich themselves and augment their power at the expense of society. In contrast, Political institutions that distribute power broadly in society and subject it to constraints are pluralistic. Instead of being vested in a single individual or a narrow group, political power rests with a broad coalition or a plurality of groups. There is obviously a close connection between pluralism and inclusive economic institutions. But the key to understanding why South Korea and the United States have inclusive economic institutions is not just their pluralistic political institutions but also their sufficiently centralized and powerful states. A telling contrast is with the East African nation of Somalia. As we will see later in the book, political power in Somalia has long been widely distributed, almost pluralistic. Indeed there is no real authority that can control or sanction what anyone does. Society is divided into deeply antagonistic clans that cannot dominate one another. The power of one clan is constrained only by the guns of another. This distribution of power leads not to inclusive institutions but to chaos, and at the root of it is the Somali state's lack of any kind of political centralization or state centralization, and its inability to enforce even the minimal amount of law and order to support economic activity, trade, or even the basic security of its citizens. Max Weber, who we met in the previous chapter, provided the most famous and widely accepted definition of the state, identifying it with the a monopoly of legitimate violence in society. Without such a monopoly and the degree of centralization that it entails, the state cannot play its role as enforcer of law and order, let alone provide public services and encourage and regulate economic activity. 
when the state fails to achieve almost any political centralization, society sooner or later descends into chaos, as did Somalia. We will refer to political institutions that are sufficiently centralized and pluralistic as inclusive political institutions. When either of these conditions fails, we will refer to the institutions as extractive political institutions. There is strong synergy between economic and political institutions. Extractive political institutions concentrate power in the hands of a narrow elite and place few constraints on the exercise of this power. Economic institutions are then often structured by this elite to extract resources from the rest of the society. Extractive economic institutions thus naturally accompany extractive political institutions. In fact, they must inherently depend on extractive political institutions for their survival. Inclusive political institutions, vesting power broadly, would tend to uproot economic institutions that expropriate the resources of the many, erect entry barriers, and suppress the functioning of markets so that only a few benefit. In Barbados, for example, the plantation system based on the exploitation of slaves could not have survived without political institutions that suppressed and completely excluded the slaves from the political process. The economic system impoverishing millions for the benefit of a narrow communist elite in North Korea would also be unthinkable without the total political domination of the Communist Party. This synergistic relationship between extractive economic and political institutions introduces a strong feedback loop. Political institutions enable the elites controlling political power to choose economic institutions with few constraints, or opposing forces. They also enable the elites to structure future political institutions and their evolution. Extractive economic institutions, in turn, enrich the same elites, and their economic wealth and power help consolidate their political dominance. In Barbados or in Latin America, for example, the colonists were able to use their political power to impose a set of economic institutions that made them huge fortunes, at the expense of the rest of the population. The resources these economic institutions generated enabled these elites to build armies and security forces, to defend their absolutist monopoly of political power. The implication of course is that extractive political and economic institutions support each other and tend to persist. There is in fact more to the synergy between extractive economic and political institutions. When existing elites are challenged under extractive political institutions and the newcomers break through, the newcomers are likewise subject to only a few constraints. They thus have incentives to maintain these political institutions and create a similar set of economic institutions, as Porfirio Diaz and the elite surrounding him did at the end of the 19th century in Mexico. Inclusive economic institutions, in turn, are forged on foundations laid by inclusive political institutions which make power broadly distributed in society and constrain its arbitrary exercise. Such political institutions also make it harder for others to usurp power and undermine the foundations of inclusive institutions. Those controlling political power cannot easily use it to set up extractive economic institutions for their own benefit. Inclusive economic institutions, in turn, create a more equitable distribution of resources, facilitating the persistence of inclusive political institutions. It was not a coincidence that when, in 1618, the Virginia Company gave land and freedom from their draconian contracts to the colonists it had previously tried to coerce, the General Assembly in the following year allowed the colonists to begin governing themselves. Economic rights without political rights would not have been trusted by the colonists, who had seen the persistent efforts of the Virginia Company to coerce them. 
neither would these economies have been stable and durable. In fact, combinations of extractive and inclusive institutions are generally unstable. Extractive economic institutions under inclusive political institutions are unlikely to survive for long, as our discussion of Barbados suggests. Similarly, inclusive economic institutions will neither support nor be supported by extractive political ones. Either they will be transformed into extractive economic institutions to the benefit of the narrow interests that hold power, or the economic dynamism they create will destabilize the extractive political institutions, opening the way for the emergence of inclusive political institutions. Inclusive economic institutions also tend to reduce the benefits the elites can enjoy by ruling over extractive political institutions, since those institutions face competition in the marketplace and are constrained by the contracts and property rights of the rest of society. Why not always choose prosperity? Political and economic institutions, which are ultimately the choice of society can be inclusive and encourage economic growth. Or they can be extractive and become impediments to economic growth. Nations fail when they have extractive economic institutions, supported by extractive political institutions that impede and even block economic growth. But this means that the choice of institutions, that is, the politics of institutions, is central to our quest for understanding the reasons for the success and failure of nations. We have to understand why the politics of some societies lead to inclusive institutions that foster economic growth, while the politics of the vast majority of societies throughout history has led, and still leads today, to extractive institutions that hamper economic growth. It might seem obvious that everyone should have an interest in creating the type of economic institutions that will bring prosperity. Wouldn't every citizen, every politician, and even a predatory dictator want to make his country as wealthy as possible? Let's return to the Kingdom of Congo we discussed earlier. Though this kingdom collapsed in the 17th century, it provided the name for the modern country that became independent from Belgian colonial rule in 1960. As an independent polity, Congo experienced almost unbroken economic decline and mounting poverty under the rule of Joseph Mobutu, between 1965 and 1997. This decline continued after Mobutu was overthrown by Laurent Kabila. Mobutu created a highly extractive set of economic institutions. The citizens were impoverished, but Mobutu and the elite surrounding him, known as Les Grosses Legumes, the big vegetables, became fabulously wealthy. Mobutu built himself a palace at his birthplace, Batalite, in the north of the country, with an airport large enough to land a supersonic Concorde jet a plane he frequently rented from Air France for travel to Europe. In Europe he bought castles and owned large tracts of the Belgian capital of Brussels. Wouldn't it have been better for Mobutu to set up economic institutions that increased the wealth of the Congolese, rather than deepening their poverty? If Mobutu had managed to increase the prosperity of his nation, would he not have been able to appropriate even more money? buy a concord instead of renting one, have more castles and mansions, possibly a bigger and more powerful army? Unfortunately for the citizens of many countries in the world, the answer is no. Economic institutions that create incentives for economic progress may simultaneously redistribute income and power in such a way that a predatory dictator and others with political power may become worse off. The fundamental problem is that there will necessarily be disputes and conflict over economic institutions. Different institutions have different consequences for the prosperity of a nation, how that prosperity is distributed, and who has power. The economic growth which can be induced by institutions creates both winners and losers. 
This was clear during the Industrial Revolution in England, which laid the foundations of the prosperity we see in the rich countries of the world today. It centered on a series of path-breaking technological changes in steam power, transportation, and textile production. Even though mechanization led to enormous increases in total incomes, and ultimately became the foundation of modern industrial society, it was bitterly opposed by many. Not because of ignorance or short-sightedness, quite the opposite. Rather, such opposition to economic growth has its own, unfortunately coherent, logic. Economic growth and technological change are accompanied by what the great economist Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. They replace the old with the new. New sectors attract resources away from old ones. New firms take business away from established ones. New technologies make existing skills and machines obsolete. The process of economic growth and the inclusive institutions upon which it is based create losers as well as winners, in the political arena and in the economic marketplace. Fear of creative destruction is often at the root of the opposition to inclusive economic and political institutions. European history provides a vivid example of the consequences of creative destruction. On the eve of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, the governments of most European countries were controlled by aristocracies and traditional elites, whose major source of income was from landholdings or from trading privileges they enjoyed thanks to monopolies granted and entry barriers, imposed by monarchs. Consistent with the idea of creative destruction, the spread of industries, factories, and towns took resources away from the land, reduced land rents, and increased the wages that landowners had to pay their workers. These elites also saw the emergence of new businessmen and merchants eroding their trading privileges. All in all, they were the clear economic losers from industrialization. Urbanization and the emergence of a socially conscious middle and working class also challenged the political monopoly of landed aristocracies. So with the spread of the Industrial Revolution the aristocracies weren't just the economic losers, they also risked becoming political losers, losing their hold on political power. With their economic and political power under threat, these elites often formed a formidable opposition against industrialization. The aristocracy was not the only loser from industrialization. Artisans whose manual skills were being replaced by mechanization likewise opposed the spread of industry. Many organized against it, rioting and destroying the machines they saw as responsible for the decline of their livelihood. They were the Luddites, a word that has today become synonymous with resistance to technological change. John Kay, English inventor of the flying shuttle, in 1733, one of the first significant improvements in the mechanization of weaving, had his house burned down by Luddites in 1753. James Hargreaves, inventor of the spinning jenny, a complementary revolutionary improvement in spinning, got similar treatment. In reality, the artisans were much less effective than the landowners and elites in opposing industrialization. The Luddites did not possess the political power, the ability to affect political outcomes against the wishes of other groups, of the landed aristocracy. In England, industrialization marched on, despite the Luddites' opposition, because aristocratic opposition, though real, was muted. In the Austro-Hungarian and the Russian empires, where the absolutist monarchs and aristocrats had far more to lose, industrialization was blocked. In consequence, the economies of Austria-Hungary and Russia stalled. They fell behind other European nations, where economic growth took off during the 19th century. The success and failure of specific groups notwithstanding, one lesson is clear. 
powerful groups often stand against economic progress and against the engines of prosperity. Economic growth is not just a process of more and better machines, and more and better educated people, but also a transformative and destabilizing process associated with widespread creative destruction. Growth thus moves forward only if not blocked by the economic losers who anticipate that their economic privileges will be lost and by the political losers who fear that their political power will be eroded. Conflict over scarce resources, income and power, translates into conflict over the rules of the game, the economic institutions, which will determine the economic activities and who will benefit from them. When there is a conflict, the wishes of all parties cannot be simultaneously met. Some will be defeated and frustrated, while others will succeed in securing outcomes they like. Who the winners of this conflict are has fundamental implications for a nation's economic trajectory. If the groups standing against growth are the winners, they can successfully block economic growth, and the economy will stagnate. The logic of why the powerful would not necessarily want to set up the economic institutions that promote economic success, extends easily to the choice of political institutions. In an absolutist regime, some elites can wield power to set up economic institutions they prefer. Would they be interested in changing political institutions to make them more pluralistic? In general not, since this would only dilute their political power, making it more difficult, maybe impossible, for them to structure economic institutions to further their own interests. Here again we see a ready source of conflict. The people who suffer from the extractive economic institutions cannot hope for absolutist rulers to voluntarily change political institutions and redistribute power in society. The only way to change these political institutions is to force the elite to create more pluralistic institutions. In the same way that there is no reason why political institutions should automatically become pluralistic, there is no natural tendency toward political centralization. There would certainly be incentives to create more centralized state institutions in any society, particularly in those with no such centralization whatsoever. For example, in Somalia, if one clan created a centralized state capable of imposing order on the country, this could lead to economic benefits and make this clan richer. What stops this? The main barrier to political centralization is again a form of fear from change, any clan, group, or politician attempting to centralize power in the state will also be centralizing power in their own hands, and this is likely to meet the ire of other clans, groups, and individuals, who would be the political losers of this process. Lack of political centralization means not only lack of law and order in much of a territory, but also there being many actors with sufficient powers to block or disrupt things, and the fear of their opposition and violent reaction will often deter many would-be centralizers. Political centralization is likely only when one group of people is sufficiently more powerful than others to build a state. In Somalia, power is evenly balanced, and no one clan can impose its will on any other. Therefore, the lack of political centralization persists. The Long Agony of the Congo There are few better, or more depressing, examples of the forces that explain the logic of why economic prosperity is so persistently rare under extractive institutions, or that illustrate the synergy between extractive economic and political institutions than the Congo. Portuguese and Dutch visitors to Congo in the 15th and 16th centuries remarked on the miserable poverty there. Technology was rudimentary by European standards, with the Congolese having neither writing, the wheel, nor the plough. The reason for this poverty, and the reluctance of Congolese farmers to adopt better technologies when they learned of them, 
is clear from existing historical accounts. It was due to the extractive nature of the country's economic institutions. As we have seen, the Kingdom of Congo was governed by the king in Banza, subsequently São Salvador. Areas away from the capital were ruled by an elite who played the roles of governors of different parts of the kingdom. The wealth of this elite was based on slave plantations around São Salvador and the extraction of taxes from the rest of the country. Slavery was central to the economy, used by the elite to supply their own plantations and by Europeans on the coast. Taxes were arbitrary, one tax was even collected every time the king's beret fell off. To become more prosperous, the Congolese people would have had to save and invest, for example, by buying plows. But it would not have been worthwhile, since any extra output that they produced using better technology would have been subject to expropriation by the king and his elite. Instead of investing to increase their productivity and selling their products in markets, the Congolese moved their villages away from the market, they were trying to be as far away from the roads as possible. In order to reduce the incidence of plunder and to escape the reach of slave traders, the poverty of the Congo was therefore the result of extractive economic institutions that blocked all the engines of prosperity, or even made them work in reverse. The Congo's government provided very few public services to its citizens, not even basic ones, such as secure property rights or law and order. On the contrary, the government was itself the biggest threat to its subjects' property and human rights. The institution of slavery meant that the most fundamental market of all, an inclusive labor market where people can choose their occupation or jobs in ways that are so crucial for a prosperous economy, did not exist. Moreover, Long-distance trade and mercantile activities were controlled by the king and were open only to those associated with him. Though the elite quickly became literate after the Portuguese introduced writing, the king made no attempt to spread literacy to the great mass of the population. Nevertheless, though miserable poverty was widespread, the Congolese extractive institutions had their own impeccable logic. They made a few people those with political power, very rich. In the 16th century, the King of Congo and the aristocracy were able to import European luxury goods and were surrounded by servants and slaves. The roots of the economic institutions of Congolese society flowed from the distribution of political power in society, and thus from the nature of political institutions. There was nothing to stop the king from taking people's possessions or bodies, other than the threat of revolt. Though this threat was real, it was not enough to make people or their wealth secure. The political institutions of Congo were truly absolutist, making the king and the elite subject to essentially no constraints, and it gave no say to the citizens in the way their society was organized. Of course, it is not difficult to see that the political institutions of Congo contrast sharply with inclusive political institutions, where power is constrained and broadly distributed. The absolutist institutions of Congo were kept in place by the army. The king had a standing army of 5,000 troops in the mid-17th century, with a corps of 500 musketeers, a formidable force for its time. Why the king and the aristocracy so eagerly adopted European firearms is thus easy to understand. There was no chance of sustained economic growth under this set of economic institutions, and even incentives for generating temporary growth were highly limited. Reforming economic institutions to improve individual property rights would have made the Congolese society at large more prosperous but it is unlikely that the elite would have benefited from this wider prosperity. First, such reforms would have made the elite economic. Losers, by undermining the wealth that the slave trade and slave plantations brought them. Second, 
Such reforms would have been possible only if the political power of the king and the elite were curtailed. For instance, if the king continued to command his 500 musketeers, who would have believed an announcement that slavery had been abolished? What would have stopped the king from changing his mind later on? The only real guarantee would have been a change in political institutions so that citizens gained some countervailing political power, giving them some say over taxation or what the musketeers did. But in this case it is dubious that sustaining the consumption and lifestyle of the king and the elite would have been high on their list of priorities. In this scenario, Changes that would have created better economic institutions in society would have made the king and aristocracy political, as well as economic losers. The interaction of economic and political institutions 500 years ago is still relevant, for understanding why the modern state of Congo is still miserably poor today. The advent of European rule in this area and deeper into the basin of the River Congo at the time of the scramble for Africa, in the late 19th century, led to an insecurity of human and property rights even more egregious than that which characterized the pre-colonial Congo. In addition, it reproduced the pattern of extractive institutions and political absolutism that empowered and enriched a few at the expense of the masses, though the few now were Belgian colonialists, most notably King Leopold II. When Congo became independent in 1960, the same pattern of economic institutions, incentives, and performance reproduced itself. These Congolese extractive economic institutions were again supported by highly extractive political institutions. The situation was worsened because European colonialism created a polity, Congo, made up of many different pre-colonial states and societies that the national state, run from Kinshasa, had little control over. Though President Mobutu used the state to enrich himself and his cronies, for example, through the Zairianization program of 1973, which involved the mass expropriation of foreign economic interests, he presided over a non-centralized state with little authority over much of the country, and had to appeal to foreign assistance to stop the provinces of Katanga and Kasai from seceding in the 1960s. This lack of political centralization, almost to the point of total collapse of the state, is a feature that Congo shares with much of sub-Saharan Africa. The modern Democratic Republic of Congo remains poor because its citizens still lack the economic institutions that create the basic incentives that make a society prosperous. It is not geography, culture, or the ignorance of its citizens or politicians that keep the Congo poor, but its extractive economic institutions. These are still in place after all these centuries because political power continues to be narrowly concentrated in the hands of an elite who have little incentive to enforce secure property rights for the people, to provide the basic public services that would improve the quality of life, or to encourage economic progress. Rather, their interests are to extract income and sustain their power. They have not used this power to build a centralized state, for to do so would create the same problems of opposition and political challenges that promoting economic growth would. Moreover, as in much of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa, infighting triggered by rival groups attempting to take control of extractive institutions destroyed any tendency for state centralization that might have existed. The history of the Kingdom of Congo, and the more recent history of the Congo, vividly illustrates how political institutions determine economic institutions and, through these, the economic incentives and the scope for economic growth. It also illustrates the symbiotic relationship between political absolutism and economic institutions that empower and enrich a few at the expense of many. Growth under extractive political institutions. 
Congo today is an extreme example, with lawlessness and highly insecure property rights. However, in most cases such extremism would not serve the interest of the elite since it would destroy all economic incentives and generate few resources to be extracted. The central thesis of this book is that economic growth and prosperity are associated with inclusive economic and political institutions, while extractive institutions typically lead to stagnation and poverty. But this implies neither that extractive institutions can never generate growth nor that all extractive institutions are created equal. There are two distinct but complementary ways in which growth under extractive political institutions can emerge. First, even if economic institutions are extractive, growth is possible when elites can directly allocate resources to high productivity activities that they themselves control a prominent example of this type of growth under extractive institutions was the caribbean islands between the 16th and 18th centuries most people were slaves working under gruesome conditions in plantations living barely above subsistence level Many died from malnutrition and exhaustion. In Barbados, Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica in the 17th and 18th centuries, a small minority, the planter elite, controlled all political power and owned all the assets, including all the slaves. While the majority had no rights, the planter elite's property and assets were well protected. Despite the extractive economic institutions that savagely exploited the majority of the population, these islands were among the richest places in the world, because they could produce sugar and sell it. In world markets, the economy of the islands stagnated only when there was a need to shift to new economic activities, which threatened both the incomes and the political power of the planter elite. Another example is the economic growth and industrialization of the Soviet Union from the first five-year plan, in 1928 until the 1970s. Political and economic institutions were highly extractive, and markets were heavily constrained. Nevertheless, the Soviet Union was able to achieve rapid economic growth because it could use the power of the state to move resources from agriculture where they were very inefficiently used, into industry. The second type of growth under extractive political institutions arises when the institutions permit the development of somewhat, even if not completely, inclusive economic institutions. Many societies with extractive political institutions will shy away from inclusive economic institutions because of fear of creative destruction. But the degree to which the elite manage to monopolize power varies across societies. In some, the position of the elite could be sufficiently secure that they may permit some moves toward inclusive economic institutions, when they are fairly certain that this will not threaten their political power. Alternatively, the historical situation could be such as to endow an extractive political regime with rather inclusive economic institutions, which they decide not to block. These provide the second way in which growth can take place under extractive political institutions. The rapid industrialization of South Korea under General Park is an example. Park came to power via a military coup in 1961 but he did so in a society heavily supported by the United States and with an economy where economic institutions were essentially inclusive. Though Park's regime was authoritarian, it felt secure enough to promote economic growth, and in fact did so very actively, perhaps partly because the regime was not directly supported by extractive economic institutions. Differently from the Soviet Union and most other cases of growth under extractive institutions, South Korea transitioned from extractive political institutions toward inclusive political institutions in the 1980s. This successful transition was due to a confluence of factors. 
by the 1970s, economic institutions in South Korea had become sufficiently inclusive that they reduced one of the strong rationales. For extractive political institutions, the economic elite had little to gain from their own or the military's dominance of politics. The relative equality of income in South Korea also meant that the elite had less to fear from pluralism and democracy. The key influence of the United States, particularly given the threat from North Korea, also meant that the strong democracy movement that challenged the military dictatorship could not be repressed for long. Though General Park's assassination in 1979 was followed by another military coup, led by Chun Du Hwan, Chun's chosen successor, Ro Tae Wu, initiated a process of political reforms that led to the consolidation of a pluralistic democracy after 1992. Of course, no transition of this sort took place in the Soviet Union. In consequence, Soviet growth ran out of steam and the economy began to collapse in the 1980s and then totally fell apart in the 1990s. Chinese economic growth today also has several commonalities with both the Soviet and South Korean experiences. While the early stages of Chinese growth were spearheaded by radical market reforms in the agricultural sector, reforms in the industrial sector have been more muted. Even today, the state and the Communist Party play a central role in deciding which sectors and which companies will receive additional capital and will expand, in the process, making and breaking fortunes. As in the Soviet Union in its heyday, China is growing rapidly, but this is still growth under extractive institutions, under the control of the state, with little sign of a transition to inclusive political institutions. The fact that Chinese economic institutions are still far from fully inclusive also suggests that a South Korean style transition is less likely, though of course not impossible. It is worth noting that political centralization is key to both ways in which growth under extractive political institutions can occur. Without some degree of political centralization, the planter elite in Barbados, Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica would not have been able to keep law and order and defend their own assets and property. Without significant political centralization and a firm grip on political power, neither the South Korean military elites nor the Chinese Communist Party would have felt secure enough to manufacture significant economic reforms and still manage to cling to power. And without such centralization, the state in the Soviet Union or China could not have been able to coordinate economic activity to channel resources toward high productivity areas. A major dividing line between extractive political institutions is therefore their degree of political centralization. Those without it, such as many in sub-Saharan Africa, will find it difficult to achieve even limited growth. Even though extractive institutions can generate some growth, they will usually not generate sustained economic growth, and certainly not the type of growth that is accompanied by creative destruction. When both political and economic institutions are extractive, the incentives will not be there for creative destruction and technological change. For a while the state may be able to create rapid economic growth by allocating resources and people by fiat, but this process is intrinsically limited. When the limits are hit, growth stops, as it did in the Soviet Union in the 1970s. Even when the Soviets achieved rapid economic growth, there was little technological change in most of the economy though by pouring massive resources into the military they were able to develop military technologies and even pull ahead of the United States in the space and nuclear race for a short while. But this growth without creative destruction and without broad-based technological innovation was not sustainable and came to an abrupt end. In addition, 
the arrangements that support economic growth under extractive political institutions are, by their nature, fragile, they can collapse or can be easily destroyed by the infighting that the extractive institutions themselves generate. In fact, extractive political and economic institutions create a general tendency for infighting, because they lead to the concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a narrow elite. If another group can overwhelm and outmaneuver this elite and take control of the state, they will be the ones enjoying this wealth and power. Consequently, as our discussion of the collapse of the later Roman Empire and the Maya cities will illustrate, pages 166 to 172 and 143 to 149, fighting to control the all-powerful state is always latent, and it will periodically intensify and bring the undoing of these regimes as it turns into civil war and sometimes into total breakdown and collapse of the state. One implication of this is that even if a society under extractive institutions initially achieves some degree of state centralization, it will not last. In fact, the infighting to take control of extractive institutions often leads to civil wars and widespread lawlessness enshrining a persistent absence of state centralization as in many nations in sub-Saharan Africa and some in Latin America and South Asia. Finally, when growth comes under extractive political institutions but where economic institutions have inclusive aspects, as they did in South Korea, there is always the danger that economic institutions become more extractive and growth stops. Those controlling political power will eventually find it more beneficial to use their power to limit competition, to increase their share of the pie, or even to steal and loot from others rather than support economic progress. The distribution and ability to exercise power will ultimately undermine the very foundations of economic prosperity, unless political institutions are transformed from extractive to inclusive. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 4. Small Differences and Critical Junctures, The Weight of History How Institutions Change Through Political Conflict and How the Past Shapes the Present 4. Small Differences and Critical Junctures, The Weight of History The World the Plague Created In 1346 the bubonic plague, the Black Death, reached the port city of Tana at the mouth of the River Don on the Black Sea. Transmitted by fleas living on rats, the plague was brought from China by traders traveling along the Silk Road, the great Transasian commercial artery. Thanks to Genoese traders, the rats were soon spreading the fleas and the plague from Tana to the entire Mediterranean. By early 1347, the plague had reached Constantinople. In the spring of 1348, it was spreading through France and North Africa and up the boot of Italy. The plague wiped out about half of the population of any area it hit. Its arrival in the Italian city of Florence was witnessed firsthand by the Italian writer Giovanni Boccaccio. He later recalled, In the face of its onrush, all the wisdom and ingenuity of man were unavailing, the plague began, in a terrifying and extraordinary manner, to make its disastrous effects apparent. It did not take the form it had assumed in the East, where if anyone bled from the nose it was an obvious portent of certain death. On the contrary, its earliest symptom was the appearance of certain swellings in the groin or armpit, some of which were egg-shaped whilst others were roughly the size of a common apple. Later on the symptoms of the disease changed, and many people began to find dark blotches and bruises on their arms, thighs and other parts of their bodies against these maladies. All the advice of physicians and all the power of medicine were profitless and unavailing. 
and in most cases death occurred within three days from the appearance of the symptoms we have described. People in England knew the plague was coming their way and were well aware of impending doom. In mid-August 1348, King Edward III asked the Archbishop of Canterbury to organize prayers, and many bishops wrote letters for priests to read out in church to help people cope with what was about to hit them. Ralph of Shrewsbury, Bishop of Bath, wrote to his priests. Almighty God uses thunder, lightning, sick, and other blows which issue from his throne to scourge the sons whom he wishes to redeem. Accordingly, since a catastrophic pestilence from the east has arrived in a neighboring kingdom, it is to be very much feared that, unless we pray devoutly and incessantly, a similar pestilence will stretch its poisonous branches into this realm, and strike down and consume the inhabitants. Therefore we must all come before the presence of the Lord in confession, reciting psalms. It didn't do any good. The plague hit and quickly wiped out about half the English population. Such catastrophes can have a huge effect on the institutions of society. Perhaps understandably, scores of people went mad. Boccaccio noted that as some maintained that an infallible way of warding off this appalling evil was to drink heavily, enjoy life to the full, go round singing and merrymaking, gratify all one's cravings whenever the opportunity offered, and shrug the thing off as an enormous joke, and this explains why those women who recovered were possibly less chased in. The period that followed. Yet the plague also had a socially, economically, and politically transformative impact on medieval European societies. At the turn of the 14th century, Europe had a feudal order, an organization of society that first emerged in Western Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire. It was based on a hierarchical relationship between the king and the lords beneath him, with the peasants at the bottom. The king owned the land and he granted it to the lords in exchange for military services. The lords then allocated land to peasants, in exchange for which peasants had to perform extensive unpaid labor and were subject to many fines and taxes. Peasants, who because of their servile status were thus called serfs, were tied to the land, unable to move elsewhere without the permission of their lord, who was not just the landlord but also the judge, jury, and police force. It was a highly extractive system, with wealth flowing upward from the many peasants to the few lords. The massive scarcity of labor created by the plague shook the foundations of the feudal order. It encouraged peasants to demand that things change. At Einsham Abbey, for example, the peasants demanded that many of the fines and unpaid labor be reduced. They got what they wanted, and their new contract began with the assertion at the time of the mortality or pestilence, which occurred in 1349, scarcely two tenants remained in the manor, and they expressed their intention of leaving unless Brother Nicholas of Upton, then abbot and lord of the manor, made a new agreement with them. He did. What happened at Einsham happened everywhere. Peasants started to free themselves from compulsory labor services and many obligations to their lords. Wages started to rise. The government tried to put a stop to this and, in 1351, passed the Statute of Laborers, which commenced. Because a great part of the people and especially of the workmen and servants has now died in that pestilence, some, seeing the straits of the masters and the scarcity of servants, are not willing to serve unless they receive excessive wages. We, considering the grave inconveniences which might come from the lack especially of pluffmen and such laborers, have seen fit to ordain that every man and woman of our kingdom of England shall be bound to serve him who has seen fit so to seek after him and he shall take only the wages liveries, mead or salary which, in the places where he sought to serve, were accustomed to be paid in the twentieth year of our reign of England, 
King Edward III came to the throne on January 25, 1327, so the reference here is to 1347, or the five or six common years next preceding. The statute in effect tried to fix wages at the levels paid before the Black Death. Particularly concerning for the English elite was the enticement, the attempt by one lord to attract the scarce peasants of another. The solution was to make prison the punishment for leaving employment without permission of the employer. And if a reaper or mower, or other workman or servant, of whatever standing or condition he be, who is retained in the service of any one, do depart from the said service before the end of the term agreed, without permission or reasonable cause, he shall undergo the penalty of imprisonment, and let no one, moreover, pay or permit to be paid to any one more wages, livery, mead or salary than was customary as has been said. The attempt by the English state to stop the changes of institutions and wages that came in the wake of the Black Death didn't work. In 1381 the peasants' revolt broke out, and the rebels, under the leadership of what Tyler, even captured most of London. Though they were ultimately defeated, and Tyler was executed, there were no more attempts to enforce the statute of laborers. Feudal labor services dwindled away, an inclusive labor market began to emerge in England, and wages rose. The plague seems to have hit most of the world, and everywhere a similar fraction of the population perished. Thus the demographic impact in Eastern Europe was the same as in England and Western Europe. The social and economic forces at play were also the same. Labor was scarce and people demanded greater freedoms. But in the East, a more powerful contradictory logic was at work. Fewer people meant higher wages in an inclusive labor market. But this gave lords a greater incentive to keep the labor market extractive and the peasants servile. In England this motivation had been in play, too, as reflected in the statute of laborers. But workers had sufficient power that they got their way. Not so in Eastern Europe. After the plague, Eastern landlords started to take over large tracts of land and expand their holdings which were already larger than those in Western Europe. Towns were weaker and less populous, and rather than becoming freer, workers began to see their already existing freedoms encroached on. The effects became especially clear after 1500, when Western Europe began to demand the agricultural goods, such as wheat, rye, and livestock, produced in the East. 80% of the imports of rye into Amsterdam came from the Elba, Vistula, and Oder River valleys. Soon half of the Netherlands' booming trade was with Eastern Europe. As Western demand expanded, Eastern landlords ratcheted up their control over the labor force to expand their supply. It was to be called the second serfdom, distinct and more intense than its original form of the early Middle Ages. Lords increased the taxes they levied on their tenants' own plots and took half of the gross output. In Corkson, Poland, all work for the Lord in 1533 was paid. But by 1600 nearly half was unpaid forced labor. In 1500, workers in Mecklenburg, in eastern Germany, owed only a few days unpaid labor services a year. By 1550 it was one day a week, and by 1600, three days per week. Workers' children had to work for the Lord for free for several years. In Hungary, landlords took complete control of the land in 1514, legislating one day a week of unpaid labor services for each worker. In 1550 this was raised to two days per week. By the end of the century, it was three days. Serfs subject to these rules made up 90% of the rural population by this time. Though in 1346 there were few differences between Western and Eastern Europe in terms of political and economic institutions, 
by 1600 they were worlds apart. In the West, workers were free of feudal dues, fines, and regulations and were becoming a key part of a booming market economy. In the East, they were also involved in such an economy, but as coerced serfs growing the food and agricultural goods demanded in the West. It was a market economy, but not an inclusive one. This institutional divergence was the result of a situation where the differences between these areas initially seemed very small. In the East, lords were a little better organized, they had slightly more rights and more consolidated landholdings. Towns were weaker and smaller, peasants less organized. In the grand scheme of history, these were small differences. Yet these small differences between the East and the West became very consequential for the lives of their populations, and for the future path of institutional development when the feudal order was shaken up by the Black Death. The Black Death is a vivid example of a critical juncture, a major event or confluence of factors disrupting the existing economic or political balance in society. A critical juncture is a double-edged sword that can cause a sharp turn in the trajectory of a nation. On the one hand it can open the way for breaking the cycle of extractive institutions and enable more inclusive ones to emerge, as in England. Or it can intensify the emergence of extractive institutions, as was the case with the second serfdom in Eastern Europe. Understanding how history and critical junctures shape the path of economic and political institutions enables us to have a more complete theory of the origins of differences in poverty and prosperity. In addition, it enables us to account for the lay of the land today and why some nations make the transition to inclusive economic and political institutions while others do not. The Making of Inclusive Institutions England was unique among nations when it made the breakthrough to sustained economic growth in the 17th century. Major economic changes were preceded by a political revolution that brought a distinct set of economic and political institutions, much more inclusive than those of any previous society. These institutions would have profound implications not only for economic incentives and prosperity, but also for who would reap the benefits of prosperity. They were based not on consensus but, rather, were the result of intense conflict as different groups competed for power, contesting the authority of others and attempting to structure institutions in their own favor. The culmination of the institutional struggles of the 16th and 17th centuries were two landmark events. The English Civil War between 1642 and 1651, and particularly the Glorious Revolution of 1688. The Glorious Revolution limited the power of the king and the executive, and relocated to Parliament the power to determine economic institutions. At the same time, it opened up the political system to a broad cross-section of society who were able to exert considerable influence over the way the state functioned. The Glorious Revolution was the foundation for creating a pluralistic society, and it built on and accelerated a process of political centralization. It created the world's first set of inclusive political institutions. As a consequence, economic institutions also started becoming more inclusive. Neither slavery nor the severe economic restrictions of the feudal medieval period, such as serfdom, existed in England at the beginning of the 17th century. Nevertheless, there were many restrictions on economic activities people could engage in. Both the domestic and international economy were choked by monopolies. The state engaged in arbitrary taxation and manipulated the legal system. Most land was caught in archaic forms of property rights that made it impossible to sell and risky to invest in. This changed after the Glorious Revolution. The government adopted a set of economic institutions that provided incentives for investment, trade, 
and innovation. It steadfastly enforced property rights, including patents granting property rights for ideas, thereby providing a major stimulus to innovation. It protected law and order. Historically unprecedented was the application of English law to all citizens. Arbitrary taxation ceased, and monopolies were abolished almost completely. The English state aggressively promoted mercantile activities and worked to promote domestic industry, not only by removing barriers to the expansion of industrial activity but also by lending the full power of the English navy to defend mercantile interests. By rationalizing property rights, it facilitated the construction of infrastructure, particularly roads, canals, and later railways, that would prove to be crucial for industrial growth. These foundations decisively changed incentives for people and impelled the engines of prosperity, paving the way for the Industrial Revolution. First and foremost, the Industrial Revolution depended on major technological advances exploiting the knowledge base that had accumulated in Europe during the past centuries. It was a radical break from the past, made possible by scientific inquiry and the talents of a number of unique individuals. The full force of this revolution came from the market that created profitable opportunities for technologies to be developed and applied. It was the inclusive nature of markets that allowed people to allocate their talents to the right lines of business. It also relied on education and skills, for it was the relatively high levels of education, at least by the standards of the time, that enabled the emergence of entrepreneurs with the vision to employ new technologies for their businesses and to find workers with the skills to use them. It is not a coincidence that the Industrial Revolution started in England a few decades following the Glorious Revolution. The great inventors such as James Watt, perfecter of the steam engine, Richard Trevithick, the builder of the first steam locomotive, Richard Arkwright, the inventor of the spinning frame, and Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the creator of several revolutionary steamships were able to take up the economic opportunities generated by their ideas, were confident that their property rights would be respected, and had access to markets where their innovations could be profitably sold and used. In 1775, just after he had the patent renewed on his steam engine, which he called his a fire engine, James Watt wrote to his father. Dear father, after a series of various and violent oppositions I have at last got an act of Parliament, vesting the property of my new fire engines in me and my assigns, throughout Great Britain and the plantations for twenty-five years to come, which I hope will be very beneficial to me, as there is already considerable demand for them. This letter reveals two things. First, what was motivated by the market opportunities he anticipated, by the considerable demand, in Great Britain and its plantations, the English overseas colonies. Second, it shows how he was able to influence Parliament to get what he wanted since it was responsive to the appeals of individuals and innovators. The technological advances, the drive of businesses to expand and invest, and the efficient use of skills and talent were all made possible by the inclusive economic institutions that England developed. These in turn were founded on her inclusive political institutions. England developed these inclusive political institutions because of two factors. First were political institutions, including a centralized state, that enabled her to take the next radical, in fact unprecedented, step toward inclusive institutions with the onset of the Glorious Revolution. While this factor distinguished England from much of the world, it did not significantly differentiate it from Western European countries such as France and Spain. More important was the second factor. 
The events leading up to the Glorious Revolution forged a broad and powerful coalition able to place durable constraints on the power of the monarchy and the executive, which were forced to be open to the demands of this coalition. This laid the foundations for pluralistic political institutions, which then enabled the development of economic institutions that would underpin the first industrial revolution. Small differences that matter. World inequality dramatically increased with the British, or English, industrial revolution because only some parts of the world adopted the innovations and new technologies that men such as Arkwright and Watt, and the many who followed, developed. The response of different nations to this wave of technologies, which determined whether they would languish in poverty or achieve sustained economic growth, was largely shaped by the different historical paths of their institutions. By the middle of the 18th century, there were already notable differences in political and economic institutions around the world. But where did these differences come from? English political institutions were on their way to much greater pluralism by 1688, compared with those in France and Spain, but if we go back in time 100 years, to 1588, the differences shrink to almost nothing. All three countries were ruled by relatively absolutist monarchs, Elizabeth I in England, Philip II in Spain, and Henry II in France. All were battling with assemblies of citizens, such as the Parliament in England, the Cortes in Spain, and the Estates General in France, that were demanding more rights and control over the monarchy. These assemblies all had somewhat different powers and scopes. For instance, the English Parliament and the Spanish Cortes had power over taxation, while the Estates General did not. In Spain this mattered little, because after 1492 the Spanish crown had a vast American empire and benefited massively from the gold and silver found there. In England the situation was different. Elizabeth I was far less financially independent so she had to beg Parliament for more taxes. In exchange, Parliament demanded concessions, in particular restrictions on the right of Elizabeth to create monopolies. It was a conflict Parliament gradually won. In Spain the Cortes lost a similar conflict. Trade wasn't just monopolized, it was monopolized by the Spanish monarchy. These distinctions, which initially appeared small, started to matter a great deal in the 17th century. Though the Americas had been discovered by 1492 and Vasco da Gama had reached India by rounding the Cape of Good Hope, at the southern tip of Africa, in 1498, it was only after 1600 that a huge expansion of world trade, particularly in the Atlantic, started to take place. In 1585 the first English colonization of North America began at Roanoke, in what is now North Carolina. In 1600 the English East India Company was formed. In 1602 it was followed by the Dutch equivalent. In 1607 the colony of Jamestown was founded by the Virginia Company. By the 1620s the Caribbean was being colonized, with Barbados occupied in 1627. France was also expanding in the Atlantic, founding Quebec City in 1608 as the capital of New France in what is now Canada. The consequences of this economic expansion for institutions were very different for England than for Spain and France, because of small initial differences. Elizabeth I and her successors could not monopolize the trade with the Americas. Other European monarchs could. So while in England, Atlantic trade and colonization started creating a large group of wealthy traders with few links to the crown, this was not the case in Spain or France. The English traders resented royal control and demanded changes in political institutions and the restriction of royal prerogatives, 
they played a critical role in the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Similar conflicts took place everywhere. French kings, for example, faced the Fronde Rebellion between 1648 and 1652. The difference was that in England it was far more likely that the opponents to absolutism would prevail because they were relatively wealthy and more numerous than the opponents to absolutism in Spain and France. The divergent paths of English, French, and Spanish societies in the 17th century illustrate the importance of the interplay of small institutional differences, with critical junctures. During critical junctures, a major event or confluence of factors disrupts the existing balance of political or economic power in a nation. These can affect only a single country, such as the death of Chairman Mao Zedong in 1976 which at first created a critical juncture only for communist China. Often, however, critical junctures affect a whole set of societies, in the way that, for example, colonization and then decolonization affected most of the globe. Such critical junctures are important because there are formidable barriers against gradual improvements resulting from the synergy between extractive political and economic institutions and the support they give each other. The persistence of this feedback loop creates a vicious circle. Those who benefit from the status quo are wealthy and well-organized, and can effectively fight major changes that will take away their economic privileges and political power. Once a critical juncture happens, the small differences that matter are the initial institutional differences that put in motion very different responses. This is the reason why the relatively small institutional differences in England, France, and Spain led to fundamentally different development paths. The paths resulted from the critical juncture created by the economic opportunities presented to Europeans by Atlantic trade. Even if small institutional differences matter greatly during critical junctures, not all institutional differences are small, and naturally, larger institutional differences lead to even more divergent patterns during such junctures. While the institutional differences between England and France were small in 1588, the differences between Western and Eastern Europe were much greater. In the West, Strong centralized states such as England, France, and Spain had latent constitutional institutions, Parliament, the Estates General, and the Cortes. There were also underlying similarities in economic institutions, such as the lack of serfdom. Eastern Europe was a different matter. The Kingdom of Poland, Lithuania, for example, was ruled by an elite class called the Slakta who were so powerful they had even introduced elections for kings. This was not absolute rule as in France under Louis XIV, the Sun King, but absolutism of an elite, extractive political institutions all the same. The Slakta ruled over a mostly rural society dominated by serfs, who had no freedom of movement or economic opportunities. Farther east, the Russian Emperor Peter the Great was also consolidating an absolutism far more intense and extractive than even Louis XIV could manage. Map 8, page 109, provides one simple way of seeing the extent of the divergence between Western and Eastern Europe at the beginning of the 19th century. It plots whether or not a country still had serfdom in 1800. Countries that appear dark did those that are light did not. Eastern Europe is dark, Western Europe is light. Yet the institutions of Western Europe had not always been so different from those in the East. They began, as we saw earlier, to diverge in the 14th century when the Black Death hit in 1346. There were small differences between political and economic institutions in Western and Eastern Europe. England and Hungary were even ruled by members of the same family, the Angevins. 
the more important institutional differences that emerged after the Black Death then created the background, upon which the more significant divergence between the East and the West would play out during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. But where do the small institutional differences that start this process of divergence arise in the first place? Why did Eastern Europe have different political and economic institutions than the West in the 14th century? Why was the balance of power between Crown and Parliament different in England than in France and Spain? As we will see in the next chapter, even societies that are far less complex than our modern society create political and economic institutions that have powerful effects on the lives of their members. This is true even for hunter-gatherers, as we know from surviving societies such as the San people of modern Botswana, who do not farm or even live in permanent settlements. No two societies create the same institutions, they will have distinct customs, different systems of property rights, and different ways of dividing a killed animal or loot stolen from another group. Some will recognize the authority of elders, others will not. Some will achieve some degree of political centralization early on, but not others. Societies are constantly subject to economic and political conflict that is resolved in different ways. Because of specific historical differences, the role of individuals, or just random factors. These differences are often small to start with, but they accumulate, creating a process of institutional drift. Just as two isolated populations of organisms will drift apart slowly in a process of genetic drift, because random genetic mutations accumulate, two otherwise similar societies will also slowly drift apart institutionally. Though, just like genetic drift, institutional drift has no predetermined path and does not even need to be cumulative, over centuries it can lead to perceptible, sometimes important differences. The differences created by institutional drift become especially consequential because they influence how society reacts to changes in economic or political circumstances during critical junctures. The richly divergent patterns of economic development around the world hinge on the interplay of critical junctures and institutional drift. Existing political and economic institutions, sometimes shaped by a long process of institutional drift and sometimes resulting from divergent responses to prior critical junctures, create the anvil upon which future change will be forged. The Black Death and the expansion of world trade after 1600 were both major critical junctures for European powers and interacted with different initial institutions to create a major divergence. Because in 1346 in Western Europe peasants had more power and autonomy than they did in Eastern Europe, the Black Death led to the dissolution of feudalism in the West and the second serfdom in the East. Because Eastern and Western Europe had started to diverge in the 14th century, the new economic opportunities of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries would also have fundamentally different implications for these different parts of Europe. Because in 1600 the grip of the crown was weaker in England than in France and Spain, Atlantic trade opened the way to the creation of new institutions with greater pluralism in England, while strengthening the French and Spanish monarchs. The Contingent Path of History the outcomes of the events during critical junctures are shaped by the weight of history, as existing economic and political institutions shape the balance of power and delineate what is politically feasible. The outcome, however, is not historically predetermined but contingent. The exact path of institutional development during these periods depends on which one of the opposing forces will succeed which groups will be able to form effective coalitions, and which leaders will be able to structure events to their advantage. The role of contingency can be illustrated by the origins of inclusive political institutions in England. 
Not only was there nothing preordained in the victory of the groups vying for limiting the power of the crown, and for more pluralistic institutions in the glorious revolution of 1688, but the entire path leading up to this political revolution was at the mercy of contingent events. The victory of the winning groups was inexorably linked to the critical juncture created by the rise of Atlantic trade that enriched and emboldened merchants opposing the crown. But a century earlier it was far from obvious that England would have any ability to dominate the seas, colonize many parts of the Caribbean and North America, or capture so much of the lucrative trade with the Americas and the East. Neither Elizabeth I nor other Tudor monarchs before her had built a powerful, unified navy. The English navy relied on privateers and independent merchant ships and was much less powerful than the Spanish fleet. The profits of the Atlantic nonetheless attracted these privateers, challenging the Spanish monopoly of the ocean. In 1588 the Spanish decided to put an end to these challenges to their monopoly, as well as to English meddling in the Spanish Netherlands, at the time fighting against Spain for independence. The Spanish monarch Philip II sent a powerful fleet, the Armada, commanded by the Duke of Medina Sidonia. It appeared a foregone conclusion to many that the Spanish would conclusively defeat the English solidify their monopoly of the Atlantic, and probably overthrow Elizabeth I, perhaps ultimately gaining control of the British Isles. Yet something very different transpired. Bad weather and strategic mistakes by Sidonia, who had been put in charge at the last minute after a more experienced commander died, made the Spanish Armada lose their advantage. Against all odds, the English destroyed much of the fleet of their more powerful opponents. The Atlantic seas were now open to the English on more equal terms. Without this unlikely victory for the English, the events that would create the transformative critical juncture, and spawn the distinctively pluralistic political institutions of post-1688 England would never have got moving. Of course, Nobody in 1588 could foresee the consequences of the fortunate English victory. Few probably understood at the time that this would create a critical juncture leading up to a major political revolution, a century later. There should be no presumption that any critical juncture will lead to a successful political revolution or to change for the better. History is full of examples of revolutions and radical movements replacing one tyranny with another, in a pattern that the German sociologist Robert Michaels dubbed the Iron Law of Oligarchy, a particularly pernicious form of the vicious circle. The end of colonialism in the decades following the Second World War created critical junctures for many former colonies. However, in most cases in sub-Saharan Africa and many in Asia. The post-independence governments simply took a page out of Robert Michaels's book and repeated and intensified the abuses of their predecessors, often severely narrowing the distribution of political power, dismantling constraints, and undermining the already meager incentives that economic institutions provided for investment and economic progress. It was only in a few cases, societies such as Botswana, that critical junctures were used to launch a process of political and economic change that paved the way for economic growth. Critical junctures can also result in major change toward rather than away from extractive institutions. Inclusive institutions, even though they have their own feedback loop, the virtuous circle, can also reverse course and become gradually more extractive because of challenges during critical junctures, and whether this happens is, again, contingent. The Venetian Republic, as we will see in Chapter 6, made major strides toward inclusive political and economic institutions in the medieval period. But while such institutions became gradually stronger in England after the Glorious Revolution of 1688, 
in Venice they ultimately transformed themselves into extractive institutions under the control of a narrow elite that monopolized both economic opportunities and political power. Understanding the lay of the land The emergence of a market economy based on inclusive institutions and sustained economic growth in 18th century England sent ripples all around the world, not least because it allowed England to colonize a large part of it. But if the influence of English economic growth certainly spread around the globe, the economic and political institutions that created it did not automatically do so. The diffusion of the Industrial Revolution had different effects on the world in the same way that the Black Death had different effects on Western and Eastern Europe, and in the same way that the expansion of Atlantic trade had different effects in England and Spain. It was the institutions in place in different parts of the world that determined the impact, and these institutions were indeed different, small differences had been amplified over time by prior critical junctures. These institutional differences and their implications have tended to persist to the present due to the vicious and virtuous circles, albeit imperfectly and are the key to understanding both how world inequality emerged and the nature of the lay of the land around us. Some parts of the world developed institutions that were very close to those in England, though by a very different route. This was particularly true of some European settler colonies such as Australia, Canada, and the United States though their institutions were just forming as the Industrial Revolution was getting underway. As we saw in Chapter 1, a process starting with the foundation of the Jamestown Colony in 1607 and culminating in the War of Independence, and the enactment of the U.S. Constitution shares many of the same characteristics as the long struggle in England of Parliament against the monarchy, for it also led to a centralized state with pluralistic political institutions. The Industrial Revolution then spread rapidly to such countries. Western Europe, experiencing many of the same historical processes, had institutions similar to England at the time of the Industrial Revolution. There were small but consequential differences between England and the rest which is why the Industrial Revolution happened in England and not France. This revolution then created an entirely new situation and considerably different sets of challenges to European regimes, which in turn spawned a new set of conflicts culminating in the French Revolution. The French Revolution was another critical juncture that led the institutions of Western Europe to converge with those of England while Eastern Europe diverged further. The rest of the world followed different institutional trajectories. European colonization set the stage for institutional divergence in the Americas, where in contrast to the inclusive institutions developed in the United States and Canada extractive ones emerged in Latin America, which explains the patterns of inequality we see in the Americas. The extractive political and economic institutions of the Spanish conquistadors in Latin America have endured, condemning much of the region to poverty. Argentina and Chile have, however, fared better than most other countries in the region. They had few indigenous people or mineral riches and were neglected, while the Spanish focused on the lands occupied by the Aztec, Maya, and Incan civilizations. Not coincidentally, the poorest part of Argentina is the northwest, the only section of the country integrated into the Spanish colonial economy. Its persistent poverty, the legacy of extractive institutions, is similar to that created by the Potosí Mita in Bolivia and Peru, pages 16 to 18. Africa was the part of the world with the institutions least able to take advantage of the opportunities made available by the Industrial Revolution. For at least the last 1,000 years, outside of small pockets and during limited periods of time, 
Africa has lagged behind the rest of the world in terms of technology, political development, and prosperity. It is the part of the world where centralized states formed very late and very tenuously. Where they did form, they were likely as highly absolutist as the Congo and often short-lived, usually collapsing. Africa shares this trajectory of lack of state centralization with countries such as Afghanistan, Haiti, and Nepal, which have also failed to impose order over their territories and create anything resembling stability to achieve even a modicum of economic progress. Though located in very different parts of the world, Afghanistan, Haiti, and Nepal have much in common institutionally with most nations in sub-Saharan Africa, and are thus some of the poorest countries in the world today. How African institutions evolved into their present-day extractive form again illustrates the process of institutional drift, punctuated by critical junctures, but this time often with highly perverse outcomes, particularly during the expansion of the Atlantic slave trade. There were new economic opportunities for the Kingdom of Congo when European traders arrived. The long-distance trade that transformed Europe also transformed the Kingdom of Congo, but again, initial institutional differences mattered. Congolese absolutism transmogrified from completely dominating society, with extractive economic institutions that merely captured all the agricultural output of its citizens to enslaving people en masse and selling them to the Portuguese in exchange for guns and luxury goods for the Congolese elite. The initial differences between England and Congo meant that while new long-distance trade opportunities created a critical juncture toward pluralistic political institutions in the former, they also extinguished any hope of absolutism being defeated in the Congo. In much of Africa the substantial profits to be had from slaving led not only to its intensification, and even more insecure property rights for the people but also to intense warfare and the destruction of many existing institutions. Within a few centuries, any process of state centralization was totally reversed, and many of the African states had largely collapsed. Though some new, and sometimes powerful, states did form to exploit the slave trade, they were based on warfare and plunder. The critical juncture of the discovery of the Americas may have helped England develop inclusive institutions, but it made institutions, in Africa, even more extractive. Though the slave trade mostly ended after 1807, subsequent European colonialism not only threw into reverse nascent economic modernization in parts of southern and western Africa but also cut off any possibility of indigenous institutional reform. This meant that even outside of areas such as Congo, Madagascar, Namibia, and Tanzania, the areas where plunder, mass disruption, and even whole-scale murder were the rule, there was little chance for Africa to change its institutional path. Even worse, the structures of colonial rule left Africa with a more complex and pernicious institutional legacy in the 1960s than at the start of the colonial period. The development of the political and economic institutions in many African colonies meant that rather than creating a critical juncture for improvements in their institutions, Independence created an opening for unscrupulous leaders to take over and intensify the extraction that European colonialists presided over. The political incentives these structures created led to a style of politics that reproduced the historical patterns of insecure and inefficient property rights under states with strong absolutist tendencies but nonetheless lacking any centralized authority over their territories. The Industrial Revolution has still not spread to Africa because that continent has experienced a long vicious circle of the persistence and re-creation of extractive political and economic institutions. Botswana is the exception. As we will see, pages 404 to 414, 
in the 19th century, King Kama, the grandfather of Botswana's first prime minister at independence, Suretz Kama, initiated institutional changes to modernize the political and economic institutions of his tribe. Quite uniquely, these changes were not destroyed in the colonial period, partly as a consequence of Kama's and other chiefs' clever challenges to colonial authority. Their interplay with the critical juncture that independence from colonial rule created laid the foundations for Botswana's economic and political success. It was another case of small historical differences mattering. There is a tendency to see historical events as the inevitable consequences of deep-rooted forces. While we place great emphasis on how the history of economic and political institutions creates vicious and virtuous circles, contingency, as we have emphasized in the context of the development of English institutions, can always be a factor. Suretz Kama, studying in England in the 1940s, fell in love with Ruth Williams, a white woman. As a result, the racist apartheid regime in South Africa persuaded the English government to ban him from the protectorate, then called Bechuanaland, whose administration was under the High Commissioner of South Africa, and he resigned his kingship. When he returned to lead the anti-colonial struggle, he did so with the intention not of entrenching the traditional institutions but of adapting them to the modern world. Kama was an extraordinary man, uninterested in personal wealth and dedicated to building his country. Most other African countries have not been so fortunate. Both things mattered. The historical development of institutions in Botswana and contingent factors that led these to be built on rather than overthrown, or distorted as they were elsewhere in Africa. In the 19th century, absolutism not so different from that in Africa or Eastern Europe was blocking the path of industrialization in much of Asia. In China, the state was strongly absolutist, and independent cities, merchants, and industrialists were either non-existent or much weaker politically. China was a major naval power and heavily involved in long-distance trade centuries before the Europeans. But it had turned away from the oceans just at the wrong time, when Ming emperors decided in the late 14th and early 15th centuries that increased long-distance trade and the creative destruction that it might bring would be likely to threaten their rule. In India, institutional drift worked differently and led to the development of a uniquely rigid hereditary caste system that limited the functioning of markets and the allocation of labor across occupations much more severely than the feudal order. In medieval Europe, it also underpinned another strong form of absolutism under the Mughal rulers. Most European countries had similar systems in the Middle Ages. Modern Anglo-Saxon surnames such as Baker, Cooper, and Smith are direct descendants of hereditary occupational categories. Bakers baked, Coopers made barrels, and Smiths forged metals. But these categories were never as rigid as Indian caste distinctions and gradually became meaningless as predictors of a person's occupation. Though Indian merchants did trade throughout the Indian Ocean, and a major textile industry developed. The caste system and Mughal absolutism were serious impediments to the development of inclusive economic institutions in India. By the 19th century, things were even less hospitable for industrialization as India became an extractive colony of the English. China was never formally colonized by a European power, but after the English successfully defeated the Chinese in the Opium Wars between 1839 and 1842, and then again between 1856 and 1860, China had to sign a series of humiliating treaties and allow European exports to enter. As China, India, and others failed to take advantage of commercial and industrial opportunities, Asia, except for Japan, 
lagged behind as Western Europe was forging ahead. The course of institutional development that Japan charted in the 19th century again illustrates the interaction between critical junctures and small differences created by institutional drift. Japan, like China, was under absolutist rule. The Tokugawa family took over in 1600 and ruled over a feudal system that also banned international trade. Japan, too, faced a critical juncture created by Western intervention as four U.S. warships, commanded by Matthew C. Perry, entered Edo Bay in July 1853, demanding trade concessions similar to those England obtained from the Chinese in the Opium Wars. But this critical juncture played out very differently in Japan. Despite their proximity and frequent interactions, by the 19th century China and Japan had already drifted apart institutionally. While Tokugawa rule in Japan was absolutist and extractive, it had only a tenuous hold on the leaders of the other major feudal domains and was susceptible to challenge. Even though there were peasant rebellions and civil strife, absolutism in China was stronger, and the opposition less organized and autonomous. There were no equivalents of the leaders of the other domains in China who could challenge the absolutist rule of the emperor, and trace an alternative institutional path. This institutional difference, in many ways small relative to the differences separating China and Japan from Western Europe, had decisive consequences during the critical juncture created by the forceful arrival of the English and Americans. China continued in its absolutist path after the Opium Wars, while the U.S. threat cemented the opposition to Tokugawa rule in Japan and led to a political revolution, the Meiji Restoration, as we will see in Chapter 10. This Japanese political revolution enabled more inclusive political institutions and much more inclusive economic institutions to develop and laid the foundations for subsequent rapid Japanese growth, while China languished under absolutism. How Japan reacted to the threat posed by U.S. warships by starting a process of fundamental institutional transformation helps us understand another aspect of the lay of the land around us, transitions from stagnation to rapid growth. South Korea, Taiwan, and finally China achieved breakneck rates of economic growth since the Second World War through a path similar to the one that Japan took. In each of these cases, growth was preceded by historic changes in the country's economic institutions, though not always in their political institutions, as the Chinese case highlights. The logic of how episodes of rapid growth come to an abrupt end and are reversed is also related. In the same way that decisive steps toward inclusive economic institutions can ignite rapid economic growth, a sharp turn away from inclusive institutions can lead to economic stagnation. But more often, collapses of rapid growth such as in Argentina or the Soviet Union, are a consequence of growth under extractive institutions coming to an end. As we have seen, this can happen either because of infighting over the spoils of extraction, leading to the collapse of the regime, or because the inherent lack of innovation and creative destruction under extractive institutions puts a limit on sustained growth. How the Soviets ran hard into these limits will be discussed in greater detail in the next chapter. If the political and economic institutions of Latin America over the past 500 years were shaped by Spanish colonialism, those of the Middle East were shaped by Ottoman colonialism. In 1453 the Ottomans under Sultan Mehmet II captured Constantinople, making it their capital. During the rest of the century, the Ottomans conquered large parts of the Balkans and most of the rest of Turkey. In the first half of the 16th century, Ottoman rule spread throughout the Middle East and North Africa. By 1566, at the death of Sultan Suleiman I, known as the Magnificent, 
Their empire stretched from Tunisia in the east, through Egypt, all the way to Mecca in the Arabian Peninsula, and on to what is now modern Iraq. The Ottoman state was absolutist, with the sultan accountable to few and sharing power with none. The economic institutions the Ottomans imposed were highly extractive. There was no private property in land, which all formally belonged to the state. Taxation of land and agricultural output, together with loot from war, was the main source of government revenues. However, the Ottoman state did not dominate the Middle East in the same way that it could dominate its heartland in Anatolia, or even to the extent that the Spanish state dominated Latin American society. The Ottoman state was continuously challenged by Bedouins and other tribal powers in the Arabian Peninsula. It lacked not only the ability to impose a stable order in much of the Middle East but also the administrative capacity to collect taxes. So it farmed them out to individuals, selling off the right to others to collect taxes in whatever way they could. These tax farmers became autonomous and powerful. Rates of taxation in the Middle Eastern territories were very high, varying between one-half or two-thirds of what farmers produced. Much of this revenue was kept by the tax farmers. Because the Ottoman state failed to establish a stable order in these areas, property rights were far from secure and there was a great deal of lawlessness and banditry as armed groups vied for local control. In Palestine, for example, the situation was so dire that starting in the late 16th century, peasants left the most fertile land and moved up to mountainous areas, which gave them greater protection against banditry. Extractive economic institutions in the urban areas of the Ottoman Empire were no less stifling. Commerce was under state control, and occupations were strictly regulated by guilds and monopolies. The consequence was that at the time of the Industrial Revolution the economic institutions of the Middle East were extractive, the region stagnated economically. By the 1840s, the Ottomans were trying to reform institutions, for example, by reversing tax farming and getting locally autonomous groups under control. But absolutism persisted until the First World War, and reform efforts were thwarted by the usual fear of creative destruction and the anxiety among elite groups that they would lose economically, or politically. While Ottoman reformers talked of introducing private property rights to land in order to increase agricultural productivity, the status quo persisted because of the desire for political control and taxation. Ottoman colonization was followed by European colonization after 1918. When European control ended, the same dynamics we have seen in sub-Saharan Africa took hold, with extractive colonial institutions taken over by independent elites. In some cases, such as the monarchy of Jordan, these elites were direct creations of the colonial powers, but this, too, happened frequently in Africa, as we will see. Middle Eastern countries without oil today have income levels similar to poor Latin American nations. They did not suffer from such a miserizing forces as the slave trade, and they benefited for a longer period from flows of technology from Europe. In the Middle Ages, the Middle East itself was also a relatively advanced part of the world economically. So today it is not as poor as Africa, but the majority of its people still live in poverty. We have seen that neither geographic, nor cultural, nor ignorance, based theories are helpful for explaining the lay of the land around us. They do not provide a satisfactory account for the prominent patterns of world inequality, the fact that the process of economic divergence started with the Industrial Revolution in England during the 18th and 19th centuries and then spread to Western Europe and to European settler colonies, the persistent divergence between different parts of the Americas, 
the poverty of Africa or the Middle East, the divergence between Eastern and Western Europe, and the transitions from stagnation to growth and the sometimes abrupt end to growth spurts. Our institutional theory does. In the remaining chapters, we will discuss in greater detail how this institutional theory works and illustrate the wide range of phenomena it can account for. These range from the origins of the Neolithic Revolution to the collapse of several civilizations, either because of the intrinsic limits to growth under extractive institutions or because of limited steps toward inclusiveness, being reversed. We will see how and why decisive steps toward inclusive political institutions were taken during the Glorious Revolution in England. We will look more specifically at the following. How inclusive institutions emerged from the interplay of the critical juncture created by Atlantic trade, and the nature of pre-existing English institutions. How these institutions persisted and became strengthened to lay the foundations for the Industrial Revolution, thanks in part to the virtuous circle and in part to fortunate turns of contingency. How many regimes reigning over absolutist and extractive institutions steadfastly resisted the spread of new technologies, unleashed by the Industrial Revolution? How Europeans themselves stamped out the possibility of economic growth in many parts of the world that they conquered. How the vicious circle and the iron law of oligarchy have created a powerful tendency for extractive institutions to persist, and thus the lands where the Industrial Revolution originally did not spread remain relatively poor. Why the Industrial Revolution and other new technologies have not spread and are unlikely to spread to places around the world today, where a minimum degree of centralization of the state hasn't been achieved. Our discussion will also show that certain areas that managed to transform institutions in a more inclusive direction, such as France or Japan, or that prevented the establishment of extractive institutions, such as the United States or Australia, were more receptive to the spread of the Industrial Revolution and pulled ahead of the rest. As in England, this was not always a smooth process, and along the way, many challenges to inclusive institutions were overcome, sometimes because of the dynamics of the virtuous circle, sometimes thanks to the contingent path of history. Finally, we will also discuss how the failure of nations today is heavily influenced by their institutional histories, how much policy advice is informed by incorrect hypotheses and is potentially misleading, and how nations are still able to seize critical junctures and break the mold to reform their institutions and embark upon a path to greater prosperity. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power Prosperity, and Poverty. By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. 5. I've seen the future, and it works. Growth under extractive institutions. What Stalin, King Shyam, the Neolithic Revolution, and the Maya city-states all had in common and how this explains why China's current economic growth cannot last. 5. I've seen the future, and it works, growth. Under extractive institutions. I've seen the future. Institutional differences play the critical role in explaining economic growth throughout the ages. But if most societies in history are based on extractive political and economic institutions, does this imply that growth never takes place? Obviously not. Extractive institutions, by their very logic, must create wealth so that it can be extracted. A ruler monopolizing political power and in control of a centralized state can introduce some degree of law and order, and a system of rules, and stimulate economic activity. But growth under extractive institutions differs in nature from growth brought forth by inclusive institutions. Most important, it will be not sustained growth that requires technological change, but rather growth based on existing technologies. 
The economic trajectory of the Soviet Union provides a vivid illustration of how the authority and incentives provided by the state can spearhead rapid economic growth under extractive institutions and how this type of growth ultimately comes to an end and collapses. The First World War had ended and the victorious and the vanquished powers met in the Great Palace of Versailles, outside Paris, to decide on the parameters of the peace. Prominent among the attendees was Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States. Noticeable by its absence was any representation from Russia. The old Tsarist regime had been overthrown by the Bolsheviks in October 1917. A civil war then raged between the Reds, the Bolsheviks, and the Whites. The English, French, and Americans sent an expeditionary force to fight against the Bolsheviks. A mission led by a young diplomat, William Bullitt, and the veteran intellectual and journalist Lincoln Steffens was sent to Moscow to meet with Lenin, to try to understand the intentions of the Bolsheviks and how to come to terms with them. Steffens had made his name as an iconoclast, a muckraker journalist who had persistently denounced the evils of capitalism in the United States. He had been in Russia at the time of the revolution. His presence was intended to make the mission look credible and not too hostile. The mission returned with the outlines of an offer from Lenin about what it would take for peace with the newly created Soviet Union. Steffens was bowled over by what he saw as the great potential of the Soviet regime. Soviet Russia, he recalled in his 1931 autobiography, was a revolutionary government with an evolutionary plan. Their plan was not to end evils such as poverty and riches, graft, privilege, tyranny, and war by direct action, but to seek out and remove their causes. They had set up a dictatorship, supported by a small, trained minority, to make and maintain for a few generations a scientific rearrangement of economic forces which would result in economic democracy, first and political democracy last. When Steffens returned from his diplomatic mission he went to see his old friend the sculptor Joe Davidson, and found him making a portrait bust of the wealthy financier Bernard Baruch. So you've been over in Russia, Baruch remarked. Steffens answered, I have been over into the future, and it works. He would perfect this adage into a form that went down in history, I've seen the future, and it works. Right up until the early 1980s, many Westerners were still seeing the future in the Soviet Union, and they kept on believing that it was working. In a sense it was, or at least it did for a time. Lenin had died in 1924, and by 1927 Joseph Stalin had consolidated his grip on the country. He purged his opponents and launched a drive to rapidly industrialize the country. He did it via energizing the state planning committee, Gosplan, which had been founded in 1921. Gosplan wrote the first five-year plan, which ran between 1928 and 1933. Economic growth Stalin style was simple, develop industry by government command and obtain the necessary resources for this by taxing agriculture at very high rates. The communist state did not have an effective tax system, so instead Stalin collectivized agriculture. This process entailed the abolition of private property rights to land and the herding of all people in the countryside, into giant collective farms run by the Communist Party. This made it much easier for Stalin to grab agricultural output and use it to feed all the people who were building, and manning the new factories. The consequences of this for the rural folk were calamitous. The collective farms completely lacked incentives for people to work hard, so production fell sharply. So much of what was produced was extracted that there was not enough to eat. People began to starve to death. In the end, probably six million people died of famine, 
while hundreds of thousands of others were murdered or banished to Siberia during the forcible collectivization. Neither the newly created industry nor the collectivized farms were economically efficient in the sense that they made the best use of what resources the Soviet Union possessed. It sounds like a recipe for economic disaster and stagnation, if not outright collapse. But the Soviet Union grew rapidly. The reason for this is not difficult to understand. Allowing people to make their own decisions via markets is the best way for a society to efficiently use its resources. When the state or a narrow elite controls all these resources instead, neither the right incentives will be created nor will there be an efficient allocation of the skills and talents of people. But in some instances the productivity of labor and capital may be so much higher in one sector or activity, such as heavy industry in the Soviet Union, that even a top-down process under extractive institutions that allocates resources toward that sector can generate growth. As we saw in Chapter 3, extractive institutions in Caribbean islands such as Barbados, Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica could generate relatively high levels of incomes because they allocated resources to the production of sugar, a commodity coveted worldwide. The production of sugar based on gangs of slaves was certainly not efficient, and there was no technological change or creative destruction in these societies, but this did not prevent them from achieving some amount of growth under extractive institutions. The situation was similar in the Soviet Union, with industry playing the role of sugar in the Caribbean. Industrial growth in the Soviet Union was further facilitated, because its technology was so backward relative to what was available in Europe and the United States, so large gains could be reaped by reallocating resources to the industrial sector, even if all this was done inefficiently and by force. Before 1928 most Russians lived in the countryside. The technology used by peasants was primitive, and there were few incentives to be productive. Indeed, the last vestiges of Russian feudalism were eradicated only shortly before the First World War. There was thus huge unrealized economic potential from reallocating this labor from agriculture to industry. Stalinist industrialization was one brutal way of unlocking this potential. By fiat, Stalin moved these very poorly used resources into industry, where they could be employed more productively, even if industry itself was very inefficiently organized relative to what could have been achieved. In fact, between 1928 and 1960 national income grew at 6% a year probably the most rapid spurt of economic growth in history up until then. This quick economic growth was not created by technological change, but by reallocating labor and by capital accumulation through the creation of new tools and factories. Growth was so rapid that it took in generations of Westerners, not just Lincoln Steffens. It took in the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States. It even took in the Soviet Union's own leaders, such as Nikita Khrushchev, who famously boasted in a speech to Western diplomats in 1956 that, we will bury you, the West. As late as 1977, a leading academic textbook by an English economist argued that Soviet-style economies were superior to capitalist ones in terms of economic growth providing full employment and price stability and even in producing people with altruistic motivation. Poor old Western capitalism did better only at providing political freedom. Indeed, the most widely used university textbook in economics, written by Nobel Prize winner Paul Samuelson, repeatedly predicted the coming economic dominance of the Soviet Union. In the 1961 edition, Samuelson predicted that Soviet national income would overtake that of the United States possibly by 1984, but probably by 1997. 
in the 1980 edition there was little change in the analysis, though the two dates were delayed to 2002 and 2012. Though the policies of Stalin and subsequent Soviet leaders could produce rapid economic growth, they could not do so in a sustained way. By the 1970s, economic growth had all but stopped. The most important lesson is that extractive institutions cannot generate sustained technological change for two reasons, the lack of economic incentives and resistance by the elites. In addition, once all the very inefficiently used resources had been reallocated to industry, there were few economic gains to be had by fiat. Then the Soviet system hit a roadblock, with lack of innovation and poor economic incentives preventing any further progress. The only area in which the Soviets did manage to sustain some innovation was through enormous efforts in military and aerospace technology. As a result they managed to put the first dog, Laika, and the first man, Yuri Gagarin, in space. They also left the world the AK-47 as one of their legacies. Gosplan was the supposedly all-powerful planning agency in charge of the central planning of the Soviet economy. One of the benefits of the sequence of five-year plans written and administered by Gosplan was supposed to have been the long-time horizon necessary for rational investment and innovation. In reality, what got implemented in Soviet industry had little to do with the five-year plans which were frequently revised and rewritten or simply ignored. The development of industry took place on the basis of commands by Stalin and the Politburo, who changed their minds frequently and often completely revised their previous decisions. All plans were labeled a draft or a preliminary. Only one copy of a plan labeled a final, that for light industry in 1939, has ever come to light. Stalin himself said in 1937 that, only bureaucrats can think that planning work ends with the creation of the plan. The creation of the plan is just the beginning. The real direction of the plan develops only after the putting together of the plan. Stalin wanted to maximize his discretion to reward people or groups who were politically loyal, and punish those who were not. As for Gosplan, its main role was to provide Stalin with information so he could better monitor his friends and enemies. It actually tried to avoid making decisions. If you made a decision that turned out badly, you might get shot. Better to avoid all responsibility. An example of what could happen if you took your job too seriously, rather than successfully second-guessing what the Communist Party wanted is provided by the Soviet census of 1937. As the returns came in, it became clear that they would show a population of about 162 million, far less than the 180 million Stalin had anticipated, and indeed below the figure of 168 million that Stalin himself announced in 1934. The 1937 census was the first conducted since 1926, and therefore the first one that followed the mass famines and purges of the early 1930s. The accurate population numbers reflected this. Stalin's response was to have those who organized the census arrested and sent to Siberia or shot. He ordered another census, which took place in 1939. This time the organizers got it right they found that the population was actually 171 million. Stalin understood that in the Soviet economy, people had few incentives to work hard. A natural response would have been to introduce such incentives, and sometimes he did, for example, by directing food supplies to areas where productivity had fallen, to reward improvements. Moreover, as early as 1931 he gave up on the idea of creating socialist men and women who would work without monetary incentives. In a famous speech he criticized equality-mongering 
and thereafter not only did different jobs get paid different wages but also a bonus system was introduced. It is instructive to understand how this worked. Typically a firm under central planning had to meet an output target set under the plan, though such plans were often renegotiated and changed. From the 1930s, workers were paid bonuses if the output levels were attained. These could be quite high, for instance, as much as 37% of the wage for management or senior engineers. But paying such bonuses created all sorts of disincentives to technological change. For one thing, innovation, which took resources away from current production, risked the output targets not being met and the bonuses not being paid. For another, output targets were usually based on previous production levels. This created a huge incentive never to expand output, since this only meant having to produce more in the future, since future targets would be ratcheted up. Underachievement was always the best way to meet targets and get the bonus. The fact that bonuses were paid monthly also kept everyone focused on the present, while innovation is about making sacrifices today in order to have more tomorrow. Even when bonuses and incentives were effective in changing behavior, they often created other problems. Central planning was just not good at replacing what the great 18th century economist Adam Smith called the invisible hand of the market. When the plan was formulated in tons of steel sheet, the sheet was made too heavy. When it was formulated in terms of area of steel sheet, the sheet was made too thin. When the plan for chandeliers was made in tons, they were so heavy, they could hardly hang from ceilings. By the 1940s, the leaders of the Soviet Union, even if not their admirers in the West, were well aware of these perverse incentives. The Soviet leaders acted as if they were due to technical problems, which could be fixed. For example, they moved away from paying bonuses based on output targets to allowing firms to set aside portions of profits to pay bonuses. But a profit motive was no more encouraging to innovation than one based on output targets. The system of prices used to calculate profits was almost completely unconnected to the value of new innovations or technology. Unlike in a market economy, prices in the Soviet Union were set by the government, and thus bore little relation to value. To more specifically create incentives for innovation, the Soviet Union introduced explicit innovation bonuses in 1946. As early as 1918, the principle had been recognized that an innovator should receive monetary rewards for his innovation but the rewards set were small and unrelated to the value of the new technology. This changed only in 1956, when it was stipulated that the bonus should be proportional to the productivity of the innovation. However, since productivity was calculated in terms of economic benefits measured using the existing system of prices, this was again not much of an incentive to innovate. One could fill many pages with examples of the perverse incentives these schemes generated. For example, because the size of the innovation bonus fund was limited by the wage bill of a firm, this immediately reduced the incentive to produce or adopt any innovation that might have economized on labor. Focusing on the different rules and bonus schemes tends to mask the inherent problems of the system. As long as political authority and power rested with the Communist Party, it was impossible to fundamentally change the basic incentives that people faced, bonuses or no bonuses. Since its inception, the Communist Party had used not just carrots but also sticks, big sticks, to get its way. Productivity in the economy was no different. A whole set of laws created criminal offenses for workers who were perceived to be shirking. In June 1940, for example, a law made absenteeism, 
defined as any 20 minutes unauthorized absence or even idling on the job, a criminal offense that could be punished by six months hard labor and a 25% cut in pay. All sorts of similar punishments were introduced, and were implemented with astonishing frequency. Between 1940 and 1955, 36 million people, about one-third of the adult population, were found guilty of such offenses. Of these, 15 million were sent to prison and 250,000 were shot. In any year, there would be 1 million adults in prison for labor violations. This is not to mention the 2.5 million people Stalin exiled to the gulags of Siberia. Still, it didn't work. Though you can move someone to a factory, you cannot force people to think and have good ideas by threatening to shoot them. Coercion like this might have generated a high output of sugar in Barbados or Jamaica, but it could not compensate for the lack of incentives in a modern industrial economy. The fact that truly effective incentives could not be introduced in the centrally planned economy was not due to technical mistakes in the design of the bonus schemes. It was intrinsic to the whole method by which extractive growth had been achieved. It had been done by government command, which could solve some basic economic problems. But stimulating sustained economic growth required that individuals use their talent and ideas, and this could never be done with a Soviet-style economic system. The rulers of the Soviet Union would have had to abandon extractive economic institutions, but such a move would have jeopardized their political power. Indeed, when Mikhail Gorbachev started to move away from extractive economic institutions after 1987, the power of the Communist Party crumbled, and with it, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was able to generate rapid growth even under extractive institutions because the Bolsheviks built a powerful centralized state and used it to allocate resources toward industry. But as in all instances of growth under extractive institutions, this experience did not feature technological change and was not sustained. Growth first slowed down and then totally collapsed. Though ephemeral, this type of growth still illustrates how extractive institutions can stimulate economic activity. Throughout history most societies have been ruled by extractive institutions, and those that have managed to impose some extent of order over the countries have been able to generate some limited growth, even if none of these extractive societies have managed to achieve sustained growth. In fact, some of the major turning points in history are characterized by institutional innovations that cemented extractive institutions, and increased the authority of one group to impose law and order and benefit from extraction. In the rest of this chapter, we will first discuss the nature of institutional innovations that establish some degree of state centralization and enable growth under extractive institutions. We shall then show how these ideas help us understand the Neolithic Revolution, the momentous transition to agriculture, which underpins many aspects of our current civilization. We will conclude by illustrating, with the example of the Maya city-states, how growth under extractive institutions is limited not only because of lack of technological progress but also because it will encourage infighting from rival groups wishing to take control of the state and the extraction it generates. On the banks of the Kasai One of the great tributaries of the river Congo is the Kasai. Rising in Angola, it heads north and merges with the Congo northeast of Kinshasa, the capital of the modern Democratic Republic of Congo. Though the Democratic Republic of Congo is poor compared with the rest of the world, there have always been significant differences in the prosperity of various groups within Congo. The Kasai is the boundary between two of these. Soon after passing into Congo along the western bank, you'll find the Lele people, on the eastern bank are the Bushang, 
map 6, page 59. On the face of it there ought to be few differences between these two groups with regard to their prosperity. They are separated only by a river, which either can cross by boat. The two different tribes have a common origin and related languages. In addition, many of the things they build are similar in style, including their houses, clothes, and crafts. Yet when the anthropologist Mary Douglas and the historian Jan Van Zyna studied these groups in the 1950s, they discovered some startling differences between them. As Douglas put it, the Lele are poor, while the Bushong are rich. Everything that the Lele have or can do, the Bushong have more and can do better. Simple explanations for this inequality are easy to come by. One difference, reminiscent of that between places in Peru that were or were not subject to the Potosi Mita, is that the Lele produced for subsistence while the Bushong produced for exchange in the market. Douglas and Van Zyna also noted that the Lele used inferior technology. For instance, they did not use nets for hunting, even though these greatly improve productivity. Douglas argued, t. The absence of nets is consistent with a general lele tendency not to invest time and labor in long-term equipment. There were also important distinctions in agricultural technologies and organization. The Bushong practiced a sophisticated form of mixed farming where five crops were planted in succession in a two-year system of rotation. They grew yams, sweet potatoes, manioc, cassava, and beans and gathered two and sometimes three maize harvests a year. The Lele had no such system and managed to reap only one annual harvest of maize. There were also striking differences in law and order. The Lele were dispersed into fortified villages, which were constantly in conflict. Anyone traveling between two or even venturing into the forest to collect food was liable to be attacked or kidnapped. In the Bushong country, this rarely, if ever, happened. What lay behind these differences in the patterns of production, agricultural technology, and prevalence of order? Obviously it was not geography that induced the Lele to use inferior hunting and agricultural technology. It was certainly not ignorance, because they knew about the tools used by the Bushong. An alternative explanation might be culture. Could it be that the Lele had a culture that did not encourage them to invest in hunting nets and sturdier and better built houses? But this does not seem to have been true, either. As with the people of Congo, the Lele were very interested in purchasing guns, and Douglas even remarked that, their eager purchase of firearms shows their culture does not restrict them to inferior techniques when these do not require long-term collaboration and effort. So neither a cultural aversion to technology nor ignorance nor geography does a good job of explaining the greater prosperity of the Bushong relative to the Lele. The reason for differences between these two peoples lies in the different political institutions that emerged in the lands of the Bushong and the Lele. We noted earlier that the Lele lived in fortified villages that were not part of a unified political structure. It was different on the other side of the Kasai. Around 1620 a political revolution took place led by a man called Shyam, who forged the Kuba Kingdom which we saw on map 6, page 59, with the Bushong at its heart and with himself as king. Prior to this period, there were probably few differences between the Bushong and the Lele. The differences emerged as a consequence of the way Xiam reorganized society to the east of the river. He built a state and a pyramid of political institutions. These were not just significantly more centralized than what came before but also involved highly elaborate structures. Xiam and his successors created a bureaucracy to raise taxes and a legal system and police force to administer the law. Leaders were checked by councils, 
which they had to consult with before making decisions. There was even trial by jury, an apparently unique event in sub-Saharan Africa prior to European colonialism. Nevertheless, the centralized state that Xiang constructed was a tool of extraction and highly absolutist. Nobody voted for him, and state policy was dictated from the top, not by popular participation. This political revolution introducing state centralization and law and order in the Cuba country in turn, led to an economic revolution. Agriculture was reorganized and new technologies were adopted to increase productivity. The crops that had previously been the staples were replaced by new, higher-yield ones from the Americas, in particular, maize, cassava, and chili peppers. The intense mixed farming cycle was introduced at this time, and the amount of food produced per capita doubled. To adopt these crops and reorganize the agricultural cycle, more hands were needed in the fields. So the age of marriage was lowered to 20, which brought men into the agricultural labor force at a younger age. The contrast with the lele is stark. Their men tended to marry at 35 and only then worked in the fields. Until then, they dedicated their lives to fighting and raiding. The connection between the political and economic revolution was simple. King Xiam and those who supported him wanted to extract taxes and wealth from the Cuba, who had to produce a surplus above what they consumed themselves. While Xiam and his men did not introduce inclusive institutions to the eastern bank of the Kasai, some amount of economic prosperity is intrinsic to extractive institutions that achieve some degree of state centralization and impose law and order. Encouraging economic activity was of course in the interest of Xiam and his men, as otherwise there would have been nothing to extract. Just like Stalin, Xiang created by command a set of institutions that would generate the wealth necessary to support this system. Compared to the utter absence of law and order that reigned on the other bank of the Kasai, this generated significant economic prosperity, even if much of it was likely extracted by Xiang and his elites. But it was necessarily limited. Just as in the Soviet Union, there was no creative destruction in the Cuba Kingdom and no technological innovation after this initial change. This situation was more or less unaltered by the time the kingdom was first encountered by Belgian colonial officials, in the late 19th century. King Xiang's achievement illustrates how some limited degree of economic success can be achieved through extractive institutions. Creating such growth requires a centralized state. To centralize the state, a political revolution is often necessary. Once Xiang created this state, he could use its power to reorganize the economy and boost agricultural productivity, which he could then tax. Why was it that the Bushang, and not the Lele, had a political revolution? Couldn't the Lele have had their own King Xiam? What Xiam accomplished was an institutional innovation not tied in any deterministic way to geography, culture, or ignorance. The Lele could have had such a revolution and similarly transformed their institutions, but they didn't. Perhaps this is for reasons that we do not understand, because of our limited knowledge of their society today. Most likely it is because of the contingent nature of history. The same contingency was probably at work when some of the societies in the Middle East 12,000 years ago embarked, upon an even more radical set of institutional innovations leading to settled societies and then to the domestication of plants and animals, as we discuss next. The Long Summer About 15,000 BC the Ice Age came to an end as the Earth's climate warmed up. Evidence from the Greenland ice cores suggests that average temperatures rose by as much as 15 degrees Celsius, in a short span of time. 
This warming seems to have coincided with rapid increases in human populations, as the global warming led to expanding animal populations and much greater availability of wild plants and foods. This process was put into rapid reverse at about 14,000 BC, by a period of cooling known as the Younger Dryas, but after 9600 BC, global temperatures rose again, by 7 degrees Celsius in less than a decade, and have since stayed high. Archaeologist Brian Fagan calls it the long summer. The warming up of the climate was a huge critical juncture that formed the background to the Neolithic Revolution, where human societies made the transition to sedentary life, farming, and herding. This and the rest of subsequent human history have played out basking in this long summer. There is a fundamental difference between farming and herding and hunting gathering. The former is based on the domestication of plant and animal species, with active intervention in their life cycles to change genetics to make those species more useful to humans. Domestication is a technological change that enables humans to produce a lot more food from the available plants and animals. The domestication of maize, for example, began when humans gathered teosinti, the wild crop that was maize's ancestor. Teosinti cobs are very small, barely a few centimeters long. They are dwarfed by a cob of modern maize. Yet gradually, by selecting the larger ears of Tiasinti, and plants whose ears did not break but stayed on the stock to be harvested, humans created modern maize, a crop that provides far more nourishment from the same piece of land. The earliest evidence of farming, herding, and the domestication of plants and animals comes from the Middle East, in particular from the area known as the Hilly Flanks, which stretches from the south of modern-day Israel up through Palestine and the west bank of the River Jordan, via Syria and into southeastern Turkey, northern Iraq, and western Iran. Around 9500 BC the first domestic plants, emmer and turo barley, were found in Jericho on the west bank of the River Jordan in Palestine, and emmer, peas, and lentils, at Tel Aswad, farther north in Syria. Both were sites of the so-called Natufian culture and both supported large villages. The village of Jericho had a population of possibly 500 people by this time. Why did the first farming villages happen here and not elsewhere? Why was it the Natufians, and not other peoples, who domesticated peas and lentils? Were they lucky and just happened to be living where there were? many potential candidates for domestication? While this is true, many other people were living among these species, but they did not domesticate them. As we saw in Chapter 2, research by geneticists and archaeologists to pin down the distribution of the wild ancestors of modern domesticated animals and plants reveals that many of these ancestors were spread over very large areas, millions of square kilometers. The wild ancestors of domesticated animal species were spread throughout Eurasia. Though the hilly flanks were particularly well endowed in terms of wild crop species, even they were very far from unique. It was not that the Natufians lived in an area uniquely endowed with wild species that made them special. It was that they were sedentary before they started domesticating plants or animals. One piece of evidence comes from gazelle teeth, which are composed of cementum, a bony connective tissue that grows in layers. During the spring and summer, when cementum's growth is most rapid, the layers are a different color from the layers that form in the winter. By taking a slice through a tooth you can see the color of the last layer created before the gazelle died. Using this technique, you can determine if the gazelle was killed in summer or winter. At Natufian sites, one finds gazelles killed in all seasons, suggesting year-round residence. The village of Abu Huraira, on the river Euphrates, is one of the most intensively researched Natufian settlements. 
For almost 40 years archaeologists have examined the layers of the village, which provides one of the best documented examples of sedentary life before and after the transition to farming. The settlement probably began around 9500 BC, and the inhabitants continued their hunter-gatherer lifestyle for another 500 years before switching to agriculture. Archaeologists estimate that the population of the village prior to farming was between 100 and 300. You can think of all sorts of reasons why a society might find it advantageous to become sedentary. Moving about is costly, children and old people have to be carried, and it is impossible to store food for lean times when you are on the move. Moreover, Tools such as grinding stones and sickles were useful for processing wild foods, but are heavy to carry. There is evidence that even mobile hunter-gatherers stored food in select locations such as caves. One attraction of maize is that it stores very well, and this is a key reason why it became so intensively cultivated throughout the Americas. The ability to deal more effectively with storage and accumulate food stocks must have been a key incentive for adopting a sedentary way of life. While it might be collectively desirable to become sedentary, this doesn't mean that it will necessarily happen. A mobile group of hunter-gatherers would have to agree to do this, or someone would have to force them. Some archaeologists have suggested that increasing population density and declining living standards were key factors in the emergence of sedentary life, forcing mobile people to stay in one place. Yet the density of Natufian sites is no greater than that of previous groups, so there does not appear to be evidence of increasing population density. Skeletal and dental evidence does not suggest deteriorating health, either. For instance, food shortage tends to create thin lines in people's tooth enamel, a condition called hypoplasia. These lines are in fact less prevalent in Natufian people than in later farming people. More important is that while sedentary life had pluses, it also had minuses. Conflict resolution was probably much harder for sedentary groups, since disagreements could be resolved less easily by people or groups merely moving away. Once people had built permanent buildings and had more assets than they could carry, moving away was a much less attractive option. So villages needed more effective ways of resolving conflict and more elaborate notions of property. Decisions would have to be made about who had access to which piece of land close to the village, or who got to pick fruit from which stand of trees and fish in which part of the stream. Rules had to be developed, and the institutions that made and enforced rules had to be elaborated. In order for sedentary life to emerge, it therefore seems plausible that hunter-gatherers would have had to be forced to settle down and this would have to have been preceded by an institutional innovation concentrating power in the hands of a group that would become the political elite, enforce property rights, maintain order, and also benefit from their status by extracting resources from the rest of society. In fact, a political revolution similar to that initiated by King Xiam, even if on a smaller scale, is likely to have been the breakthrough that led to sedentary life. The archaeological evidence indeed suggests that the Natufians developed a complex society characterized by hierarchy, order, and inequality, beginnings of what we would recognize as extractive institutions, a long time before they became farmers. One compelling piece of evidence for such hierarchy and inequality comes from Natufian graves. Some people were buried with large amounts of obsidian and dentalium shells, which came from the Mediterranean coast near Mount Carmel. Other types of ornamentation include necklaces, garters, and bracelets, which were made out of canine teeth and deer phalanges as well as shells. Other people were buried without any of these things. Shells and also obsidian were traded 
and control of this trade was quite likely a source of power accumulation and inequality. Further evidence of economic and political inequality comes from the Natufian site of Ain Malaha, just north of the Sea of Galilee, amid a group of about 50 round huts and many pits. Clearly used for storage, there is a large, intensively plastered building close to a cleared central place. This building was almost certainly the house of a chief. Among the burials at the site, some are much more elaborate, and there is also evidence of a skull cult, possibly indicating ancestor worship. Such cults are widespread in Natufian sites, particularly Jericho. The preponderance of evidence from Natufian sites suggests that these were probably already societies with elaborate institutions, determining inheritance of elite status. They engaged in trade with distant places and had nascent forms of religion and political hierarchies. The emergence of political elites most likely created the transition first to sedentary life and then to farming. As the Natufian sites show, sedentary life did not necessarily mean farming and herding. People could settle down but still make their living by hunting and gathering. After all, the long summer made wild crops more bountiful, and hunting and gathering was likely to have been more attractive. Most people may have been quite satisfied with a subsistence life based on hunting and gathering that did not require a lot of effort. Even technological innovation doesn't necessarily lead to increased agricultural production. In fact, it is known that a major technological innovation, the introduction of the steel axe among the group of Australian Aboriginal peoples known as Yurjurant, led not to more intense production but to more sleeping, because it allowed subsistence requirements to be met more easily, with little incentive to work for more. The traditional, geography-based explanation for the Neolithic Revolution, the centerpiece of Jared Diamond's argument, which we discussed in Chapter 2, is that it was driven by the fortuitous availability of many plant and animal species that could easily be domesticated. This made farming and herding attractive and induced sedentary life. After societies became sedentary and started farming, they began to develop political hierarchy, religion, and significantly more complex institutions. Though widely accepted, the evidence from the Natufians suggests that this traditional explanation puts the cart before the horse. Institutional changes occurred in societies quite a while before they made the transition to farming and were probably the cause, both of the move to sedentarism, which reinforced the institutional changes, and subsequently of the Neolithic Revolution. This pattern is suggested not only by the evidence from the hilly flanks, which is the area most intensively studied, but also by the preponderance of evidence from the Americas, Sub-Saharan Africa, and East Asia. Certainly the transition to farming led to greater agricultural productivity and enabled a significant expansion of population. For instance, in sites such as Jericho and Abu Huraira, one sees that the early farming village was much larger than the pre-farming one. In general, villages grew by between two and six times when the transition took place. Moreover, Many of the consequences that people have traditionally argued as having flowed from this transition undoubtedly happened. There was greater occupational specialization and more rapid technological progress, and probably the development of more complex and possibly less egalitarian political institutions. But whether this happened in a particular place was not determined by the availability of plant and animal species. Instead, it was a consequence of the societies having experienced the types of institutional, social, and political innovations that would have allowed sedentary life and then farming to emerge. Though the long summer and the presence of crop and animal species allowed this to happen, it did not determine where or when exactly, 
After the climate had warmed up, it would happen. Rather, this was determined by the interaction of a critical juncture, the long summer, with small but important institutional differences that mattered. As the climate warmed up, some societies, such as the Natufians, developed elements of centralized institutions and hierarchy, though these were on a very small scale relative to those of modern nation-states. Like the Bushang under Xiang, societies reorganized to take advantage of the greater opportunities created by the glut of wild plants and animals, and it was no doubt the political elites who were the main beneficiaries of these new opportunities, and of the political centralization process. Other places that had only slightly different institutions did not permit their political elites to take similar advantage of this juncture and lagged behind the process of political centralization and the creation of settled, agricultural, and more complex societies. This paved the way to a subsequent divergence of exactly the type we have seen before. Once these differences emerged, they spread to some places but not to others. For example, farming spread into Europe from the Middle East starting around 6500 BC, mostly as a consequence of the migration of farmers. In Europe, institutions drifted away from parts of the world, such as Africa where initial institutions had been different and where the innovations set in motion by the long summer in the Middle East happened only much later, and even then in a different form. The institutional innovations of the Natufians, though they did most likely underpin the Neolithic Revolution, did not leave a simple legacy in world history and did not lead inexorably to the long-run prosperity of their homelands. In modern Israel, Palestine, and Syria. Syria and Palestine are relatively poor parts of the modern world, and the prosperity of Israel was largely imported by the settlement of Jewish people after the Second World War, and their high levels of education and easy access to advanced technologies. The early growth of the Natufians did not become sustained for the same reason that Soviet growth fizzled out. Though highly significant, even revolutionary for its time, this was growth under extractive institutions. For the Natufian society it was also likely that this type of growth created deep conflicts over who would control institutions, and the extraction they enabled. For every elite benefiting from extraction there is a non-elite who would love to replace him. Sometimes infighting simply replaces one elite with another. Sometimes it destroys the whole extractive society, unleashing a process of state and societal collapse, as the spectacular civilization that Maya city-states built more than 1,000 years ago experienced. The Unstable Extraction Farming emerged independently in several places around the world. In what is now modern Mexico, societies formed that established states and settlements, and transitioned to agriculture. As with the Natufians in the Middle East, they also achieved some degree of economic growth. The Maya city-states in the area of southern Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, and western Honduras in fact built a fairly sophisticated civilization under their own brand of extractive institutions. The Maya experience illustrates not only the possibility of growth under extractive institutions, but also another fundamental limit to this type of growth, the political instability that emerges and ultimately leads to collapse of both society and state as different groups, and people fight to become the extractors. Maya cities first began to develop around 500 BC. These early cities eventually failed, sometime in the first century AD. A new political model then emerged, creating the foundation for the Classic Era, between AD 250 and 900. This period marked the full flowering of Maya culture and civilization. But this more sophisticated civilization would also collapse in the course of the next 600 years. 
By the time the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the early 16th century, the great temples and palaces of such Maya sites as Tikal, Palenque, and Calakmal had receded into the forest, not to be rediscovered until the 19th century. The Maya cities never unified into an empire, though some cities were subservient to others, and they often appear to have cooperated, particularly in warfare. The main connection between the region's city-states, 50 of which we can recognize by their own glyphs, is that their people spoke around 31 different but closely related Mayan languages. The Mayas developed a writing system and there are at least 15,000 remaining inscriptions describing many aspects of elite life, culture, and religion. They also had a sophisticated calendar for recording dates known as the Long Count. It was very much like our own calendar in that it counted the unfolding of years from a fixed date and was used by all Maya cities. The Long Count began in 3114 BC, though we do not know what significance the Mayas attached to this date, which long precedes the emergence of anything resembling Maya society. The Mayas were skilled builders who independently invented cement. Their buildings and their inscriptions provide vital information on the trajectories of the Maya cities, as they often recorded events dated according to the long count. Looking across all the Maya cities, Archaeologists can thus count how many buildings were finished in particular years. Around AD 500 there are few dated monuments. For example, the long count date corresponding to AD 514 recorded just 10. There was then a steady increase, reaching 20 by AD 672 and 40 by the middle of the 8th century. After this the number of dated monuments collapses. By the 9th century, it is down to 10 per year, and by the 10th century, to zero. These dated inscriptions give us a clear picture of the expansion of Maya cities and their subsequent contraction from the late 8th century. This analysis of dates can be complemented by examining the lists of kings the Mayas recorded. At the Maya city of Copan, now in western Honduras, there is a famous monument known as Altar Q. Altar Q records the names of all the kings, starting from the founder of the dynasty Kinich Yaks Kuk Mo, or King Greenson I Quetzalmaca, named after not just the sun but also two of the exotic birds of the Central American forest whose feathers were greatly valued by the Mayas. Kinich Yaks Kuk Mo came to power in Copan in AD 426, which we know from the long count date on Altar Q. He founded a dynasty that would reign for 400 years. Some of Kinich Yax's successors had equally graphic names. The 13th ruler's glyph translates as 18 Rabbit, who was followed by a smoke monkey, and then a smoke shell, who died in AD 763. The last name on the altar is King Yax Passage Chanyot, or First Dawn Sky Lightning God who was the 16th ruler of this line and assumed the throne at the death of Smoke Shell. After him we know of only one more king, Yukit Tuk, patron of Flint, from a fragment of an altar. After Yak's passage, the buildings and inscriptions stopped, and it seems that the dynasty was shortly overthrown. Yukit Tuk was probably not even the real claimant to the throne but a pretender. There is a final way of looking at this evidence at Copan, one developed by the archaeologists Ankarin Frieder, Nancy Gonlin, and David Webster. These researchers mapped the rise and fall of Copan by examining the spread of the settlement in the Copan Valley over a period of 850 years, from AD 400 to AD 1250, using a technique called obsidian hydration which calculates the water content of obsidian on the date it was mined. Once mined, the water content falls at a known rate, allowing archaeologists to calculate the date a piece of obsidian was mined. Frieder, Gonlin, and Webster were then able to map where pieces of dated obsidian 
were found in the Copan Valley and trace how the city expanded and then contracted. Since it is possible to make a reasonable guess about the number of houses and buildings in a particular area, the total population of the city can be estimated. In the period AD 400 to 449, the population was negligible, estimated at about 600 people. It rose steadily to a peak of 28,000 in AD 750 to 799. Though this does not appear large by contemporary urban standards, it was massive for that period. These numbers imply that in this period, Copen had a larger population than London or Paris. Other Maya cities, such as Tikal and Kalakmal, were undoubtedly much larger. In line with the evidence from the long count dates, AD 800 was the population peak for Copen. After this it began to decline, and by AD 900 it had fallen to around 15,000 people. From there the fall continued, and by AD 1200 the population had returned to what it was 800 years previously. The basis for the economic development of the Maya classical era was the same as that for the Bushang and the Natufians. The creation of extractive institutions with some degree of state centralization. These institutions had several key elements. Around AD 100, in the city of Tikal in Guatemala, there emerged a new type of dynastic kingdom. A ruling class based on the Ajaw, lord or ruler, took root with a king called the Keohol Ajaw, divine lord, and, underneath him, a hierarchy of aristocrats. The divine lord organized the society with the cooperation of these elites and also communicated with the gods. As far as we know, this new set of political institutions did not allow for any sort of popular participation, but it did bring stability. The Keohola Jaw raised tribute from farmers and organized labor to build the great monuments, and the coalescence of these institutions created the basis for an impressive economic expansion. The Maya's economy was based on extensive occupational specialization, with skilled potters, weavers, woodworkers, and tool and ornament makers. They also traded obsidian, jaguar pelts, marine shells, cacao, salt, and feathers among themselves and other polities over long distances in Mexico. They probably had money, too, and like the Aztecs, used cacao beans for currency. The way in which the Maya classical era was founded on the creation of extractive political institutions was very similar to the situation among the Bushang, with Yaks Eb Zuk at Tikal playing a role similar to that of King Xiam. The new political institutions led to a significant increase in economic prosperity, much of which was then extracted by the new elite based around the Keohola Jaw. Once this system had consolidated, by around AD 300, there was little further technological change, however. Though there is some evidence of improved irrigation and water management techniques, agricultural technology was rudimentary and appears not to have changed. Building and artistic techniques became much more sophisticated over time, but in total there was little innovation. There was no creative destruction. But there were other forms of destruction as the wealth that the extractive institutions created for the Keohola Jaw, and the Maya elite led to constant warfare, which worsened over time. The sequence of conflicts is recorded in the Maya inscriptions, with special glyphs indicating that a war took place at a particular date in the long count. The planet Venus was the celestial patron of war, and the Mayas regarded some phases of the planet's orbit as particularly auspicious for waging war. The glyph that indicated warfare, known as a Star Wars by archaeologists, shows a star showering the Earth with a liquid that could be water or blood. The inscriptions also reveal patterns of alliance and competition. There were long contests for power between the larger states, such as Tikal, 
Calakmul, Copan, and Palenque, and these subjugated smaller states into a vassal status. Evidence for this comes from glyphs. Marking royal accessions. During this period, they start indicating that the smaller states were now being dominated by another, outside ruler. Map 10, page 148, shows the main Maya cities and the various patterns of contact between them as reconstructed by the archaeologists Nikolai Grube and Simon Martin. These patterns indicate that though the large cities such as Calakmul, Dos Pilas, Piedras Negras, and Yaxcalan had extensive diplomatic contacts, some were often dominated by others and they also fought each other. The overwhelming fact about the Maya collapse is that it coincides with the overthrow of the political model, based on the Keohol Ajah. We saw in Copan that after Yak's passage's death in AD 810 there were no more kings. At around this time the royal palaces were abandoned. Twenty miles to the north of Copan, in the city of Quirigua, the last king, Jade Sky, ascended to the throne between AD 795 and 800. The last dated monument is from AD 810 by the Long Count, the same year that Yak's passage died. The city was abandoned soon after. Throughout the Maya area the story is the same. The political institutions that had provided the context for the expansion of trade, agriculture, and population vanished. Royal courts did not function, monuments and temples were not carved, and palaces were emptied. As political and social institutions unraveled, reversing the process of state centralization, the economy contracted and the population fell. In some cases the major centers collapsed from widespread violence. The Patexbatan region of Guatemala, where the great temples were subsequently pulled down and the stone used to build extensive defensive walls, provides one vivid example. As we'll see in the next chapter, it was very similar to what happened in the later Roman Empire. Later, even in places such as Copan, where there are fewer signs of violence at the time of the collapse, many monuments were defaced or destroyed. In some places the elite remained even after the initial overthrow of the Keohol Ajah. In Copan there is evidence of the elite continuing to erect new buildings for at least another 200 years before they also disappeared. Elsewhere elites seem to have gone at the same time as the Divine Lord. Existing archaeological evidence does not allow us to reach a definitive conclusion about why the Keohol Ajah and elites surrounding him were overthrown and the institutions that had created the Maya classical era collapsed. We know this took place in the context of intensified intercity warfare and it seems likely that opposition and rebellion within the cities, perhaps led by different factions of the elite, overthrew the institution. Though the extractive institutions that the Mayas created produced sufficient wealth for the cities to flourish and the elite to become wealthy and generate great art and monumental buildings, the system was not stable. The extractive institutions upon which this narrow elite ruled created extensive inequality, and thus the potential for infighting between those who could benefit from the wealth extracted from the people. This conflict ultimately led to the undoing of the Maya civilization. What goes wrong? Extractive institutions are so common in history because they have a powerful logic. They can generate some limited prosperity while at the same time distributing it into the hands of a small elite. For this growth to happen, there must be political centralization. Once this is in place, the state, or the elite controlling the state, typically has incentives to invest and generate wealth, encourage others to invest so that the state can extract resources from them and even mimic some of the processes that would normally be set in motion by inclusive economic institutions and markets. In the Caribbean plantation economies, 
Extractive institutions took the form of the elite using coercion to force slaves to produce sugar. In the Soviet Union, they took the form of the Communist Party reallocating resources from agriculture to industry and structuring some sort of incentives for managers and workers. As we have seen, such incentives were undermined by the nature of the system. The potential for creating extractive growth gives an impetus to political centralization and is the reason why King Xiong wished to create the Kuba Kingdom, and likely accounts for why the Natufians in the Middle East set up a primitive form of law and order, hierarchy, and extractive institutions that would ultimately lead to the Neolithic Revolution. Similar processes also likely underpinned the emergence of settled societies and the transition to agriculture in the Americas, and can be seen in the sophisticated civilization that the Mayas built on foundations laid by highly extractive institutions, coercing many for the benefit of their narrow elites. The growth generated by extractive institutions is very different in nature from growth created under inclusive institutions, however. Most important, it is not sustainable. By their very nature, extractive institutions do not foster creative destruction and generate at best only a limited amount of technological progress. The growth they engender thus lasts for only so long. The Soviet experience gives a vivid illustration of this limit. Soviet Russia generated rapid growth as it caught up rapidly with some of the advanced technologies in the world, and resources were allocated out of the highly inefficient agricultural sector and into industry. But ultimately the incentives faced in every sector, from agriculture to industry, could not stimulate technological progress. This took place in only a few pockets where resources were being poured and where innovation was strongly rewarded, because of its role in the competition with the West. Soviet growth, however rapid it was, was bound to be relatively short-lived, and it was already running out of steam by the 1970s. Lack of creative destruction and innovation is not the only reason why there are severe limits to growth under extractive institutions. The history of the Maya city-states illustrates a more ominous and, alas, more common end, again implied by the internal logic of extractive institutions. As these institutions create significant gains for the elite, there will be strong incentives for others to fight to replace the current elite. Infighting and instability are thus inherent features of extractive institutions, and they not only create further inefficiencies but also often reverse any political centralization, sometimes even leading to the total breakdown of law and order and descent into chaos, as the Maya city-states experienced following their relative success during their classical era. Though inherently limited, Growth under extractive institutions may nonetheless appear spectacular when it's in motion. Many in the Soviet Union and many more in the Western world were awestruck by Soviet growth in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even as late as the 70s, in the same way that they are mesmerized by the breakneck pace of economic growth in China today. But as we will discuss in greater detail in Chapter 15, China under the rule of the Communist Party is another example of society experiencing growth under extractive institutions, and is similarly unlikely to generate sustained growth unless it undergoes a fundamental political transformation toward inclusive political institutions.